Okay, I see the live stream. Okay, live stream is up. Will uh, Sergeant Kowalski begin, begin with the opening? Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Zoning and Franchises. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video. Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Okay, uh, let's start again. And uh, here we go. Good morning. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya. I'm the chair of the subcommittee on zoning and franchises. Uh, I'm joined remotely today by Council Members uh, Ayala, uh, Rivera, uh, Borelli. Uh, today, we will also hold public hearings on the redevelopment proposal for the 175 Park Avenue uh, A rezoning for the Starlet Highlight uh, and Terminal Warehouse buildings and the Soho Noho neighborhood plan all in Manhattan, as well as a rezoning proposal for the 506 Third Avenue in Brooklyn. In conjunction with the Soho Noho neighborhood plan, we will also uh, hold a hearing on the proposed local law in relation to the increase in penalties relating to occupancy of the joint living quarters, uh, the joint living work quarters for artists uh, contrary uh, to zoning. Uh, but first, we will vote on a number of items heard by the subcommittee on our October 12th, 20th, and 25th meetings. Uh, I note now that the Gowanus Neighborhood Plan and its related uh, CSO facility uh, uh, actions, uh, sorry, faculty actions, along with the New York Blood Center and the 343 Madison Avenue proposals shown on today's agenda, are being laid over. Uh, we will vote to approve with modifications the pre-considered LU items for the 1045 Atlantic Avenue rezoning proposal under ULURPS number uh, C210276ZMK uh, and N210277ZRK uh, relating to property in Councilmember Cornegie's district in Brooklyn. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to change an M11 district to a C63A district and a related zoning text amendment to establish an MIH program area utilizing MIH option two and the workforce option and to establish uh, special street wall regulations for sites in C63A districts in Brooklyn Community District 3 with the frontage on Atlantic Avenue. Uh, together, these actions would facilitate the development of a new 17-story mixed-use building with ground floor retail and office use on the second floor. And approximately 426 dwelling units. Uh, our modification uh, will, will be to strike the MIH program, uh, the MIH workforce option. Uh, Council Member Cornegie is in support of uh, of this proposal as modified. We will also vote to approve with modification uh, LU's number 882 uh, uh, and 883 for the one 
uh, 85-17 Hillside Avenue rezoning related to property in Council Member Gennaro's district in Queens. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to uh, rezone portions of existing R3X and R6A districts to an R7A district and to extend an existing C24 commercial overlay and the special downtown Jamaica district over the rezoning area along Hillside Avenue and a, relating, and a related zoning text amendment establishing an MIH program area utilizing options one and two as well as a special bulk and parking regulations for R7A districts within an MIH area within the special downtown Jamaica district. A modification will be to strike MIH option two. Council Member Gennaro is in support of the proposal as um, modified. And we will also vote to approve with modification, uh, modifications LUs uh, 894 and 895 for the 824 Metropolitan Avenue rezoning relating to, prop, uh, to property in Council Member Reynoso's district in Brooklyn. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to rezone portions of the existing uh, R6B and CA2 district to an R7A district and to extend an existing C24 commercial overlay over the rezoning area along Metropolitan and Bushwick Avenues uh, and a related zoning text amendment establishing an MIH area uh, utilizing options one and two. A modification will be to strike MIH option two and to add the deep afford uh, affordability option. Uh, Council Member Reynoso is in support of the proposal as modified. We will also vote to approve LU896 uh, uh, for the 624 Morris Avenue rezoning relating to property in uh, Chair Salamanca's district in the Bronx. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to establish a C14 commercial overlay district uh, within an existing R71 uh, district to legalize and permit the um, modest expansion of existing commercial uses on Morris Avenue between East 153rd and East 151st Street. Chair Salamanca is in support of the proposal. Um, and uh, I want to also recognize that uh, we have Council Members uh, Reynoso and Council Member uh, Barry G that has joined us uh, today. Um, and now I would like to call for a vote to approve LU. 896 and to approve with modifications that I have described, uh, LUs 882, 883, 894, 895 on the previously considered LUs relating to uh, 1045 Atlantic Avenue under uh, ULERPS number C210276ZMK and N210277ZRK. Council, if uh, you can, please call the roll. Chair Moya. I vote aye on all. Council Member Reynoso. Uh, permission to explain my vote. Permission granted. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to thank Chair Riley as well for the work that he did on his committee uh, to get us to this point. Very happy uh, for this rezoning in the district that's going to bring uh, seven hundreds of units, of which uh, two hundred would be for homeless and about two hundred that would be for formerly homeless. So I'm really excited for this project. I want to thank everyone for voting aye. Um, or encourage everyone to vote aye. Um, and thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Gordenchik. Aye. Council Member Ayala. I vote aye. Council Member Rivera. I vote aye. Council Member Borelli. Council Member Borelli. Chair, the vote will remain open uh, for Council Member Borelli and Council Member Levin. It is currently at five in the affirmative and zero in the negative I, with no abstentions. I'm here. Can you not hear me? Yes, Council Member Borelli, continuing vote on the land use items. I vote aye, please. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, didn't hear you. Uh, Chair, the vote will still remain open for Council Member Levin and currently stands at six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Okay, uh, thank you. so uh, before we turn to our hearing, uh, I will first recognize the subcommittee council to review the remote meeting procedures. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Arthur Ha, counsel to the subcommittee. Members of the public wishing to testify were asked to register for today's hearings. As part of the registration process for today's hearing, council staff have made efforts to facilitate language translation services for those who request such services. 
We ask that all speakers bear with us today as we work to ensure that everyone has their opportunity to testify. If you wish to testify and have not already registered, we ask that you please do so now by visiting the New York City Council website at www.council.nyc.gov to sign up. Members of the public may also view a live stream broadcast of this meeting at the Council's website. For those members of the public viewing this meeting specifically for the Soho NoHo Neighborhood Plan, the Council is providing multilingual live stream viewing options available through the Council's website at council.nyc.gov with audio translation in Cantonese and Mandarin. Once again, these options can be found at the Council's main website at www.council.nyc.gov. As a technical note, for anyone uh, requesting an accessible version of any of the presentations shown today, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. Applicant teams will be recognized as a group and called first, followed by members of the public. When the chair recognizes you, your microphone will be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that the microphone is on before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you wish to submit instead of appearing before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of your primary uh, viewing window. Council members with questions will be announced in order as they raise their hands and Chair Moya will recognize members to speak. Witnesses are requested to remain in the meeting until excused by the chair as council members may have questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this meeting for various technical reasons. And we ask that you please be patient as we work through any issues. Chair Moya will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you, Arthur. Um, <clears throat> I now open the public hearing on the pre-considered LU items for the 506 Third Avenue rezoning proposal under ULIP number uh, C210119ZMK and N210120ZRK requesting a zoning map and zoning text amendment relating to property in Council Member Landers District in Brooklyn. Uh, anyone wishing to testify on this item, if you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the Council's website. Uh, once again, at council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Um, and council, uh, please call the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Eric Palatnik and Paul Basile. Hello, can you hear me now? We can hear yes. you. That's great. Good morning, everybody. My name is Eric Palatnik. Thank you for having us. Uh, may I proceed, Chair Moya? You may. Mr. Palatnik, we need to swear you and Mr. Basile yeah. in. Please, please raise your right hand. State your name for the record. Eric Palatnik. Paul Basile. Do you, Paul affirm Basile. To tell, do you both affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you, Arthur. And thank you everybody for making time on a beautiful day and a beautiful time in New York City and congratulations to everybody. I hope your candidates won last week. Uh, I wanted to, to introduce a great development for you. I know you have a busy day, so I'll speak with a little bit of New York speed and go through it. It's a rezoning proposal I'm bringing to you today that is well supported. It's been supported by Community Board 6 in Brooklyn. We're in the Gowanus area of Brooklyn, of course, where Community Board 6 is located. You just acted on the Gowanus rezoning there. And it is also, I believe, and I'll let him speak for himself, uh, supported by the councilman, um, uh, Brad Lander, uh, who we've met with numerous times. But as time goes on, I'll let him speak for himself. Uh, the application is on behalf of Brooklyn Dream Maker Studios, Mr. Paul Bazile. And if I may ask your uh, uh, team to pull up the screen of the presentation. Uh, we could show you what it's all about. Next slide, please. Well, he had some problems earlier and I have a feeling he's having the same exact problem now that he's not able to move the screen. So if, oh, there he goes, good. 
this was a technical problem that was going on earlier. So this is this, there are two sites proposed in this rezoning. We're asking your permission to rezone the sites that you see as site one and site two, which is located at 506 and 530 3rd Avenue, which is between 11th and 13th streets in the Gowanus section of Brooklyn. You can see it's situated there right between the trains and you can see the expressway heading into the Brooklyn Battery or Hugh Carey Tunnel, as they call it nowadays. Uh, the two buildings or the two sites are located are located in a currently an M21 zoning district. If the action we're asking for is approved, we would be allowed to uh, have a C44A zoning district, which is an R7A equivalent. Next slide, please. This is a view of the existing sites. Uh, you'll see site one here is Scarlino Brothers Fuel Oil Company. That's what it used to be. Right now, it's got a maker space in it, which is cups to crop, which is a coffee bean uh, use. Paul Bazile, who's on the call right now, and the buildings we're proposing are all proposed to be used by maker spaces, which are end makers of manufacturing and light industrial uses that we use locally. Uh, but there are things that are made and then shipped off to the use of UPS and Federal Express, and they're located uh, behind the roll-down doors there is a coffee uh, roastery. They would be located within the new building. Uh, next slide, please. This is what the new building at 506 Third Avenue that I'm talking about, where you just saw, would look like if it was approved and it would include the maker spaces. It would be five stories and approximately 70 feet tall. Uh, next slide, please. This is the other site. This is 506 3rd, 530 3rd Avenue, which is an existing building you're seeing there labeled as Site 2. That's in the middle. And it's flanked in the rear by two other smaller lots, which are also included in the rezoning, also included, as you can see there, by Paul Bazil, uh, right up top there. The building you're seeing that's built right now has been built utilizing air rights and development rights in the area. And it has all maker spaces within it, similar to what we're proposing here. I'll go through it in a second. All three of these buildings, when constructed, would be connected through an interior courtyard that would create almost an incubator kind of ecosystem uh, for all of the maker spaces to share and utilize an outdoor area and common areas. Uh, and I'll show you that as I go through the plans. Also, I'd like to just simply call out for you is the very lack of manufacturing in the surrounding community. As you could see here in the images, you never know you're in an M12 zoning district, but rather you see a lot of residential. And this proposal includes no displacement of residential whatsoever. Next slide, please. This is, shows you what the second site would look like in the lower right-hand corner. You can see what I was describing before, how those buildings would be connected. Really a great thing for New York and a great thing for Brooklyn. It's the advent of the new economy, what we're all seeing, which is that people are creating products in Brooklyn. They don't need gigantic warehouses to do so. They could do so in a small space. And not only that, they could co-produce with other people and share knowledge and resources. And that's what this is. You can see the three building development all the buildings would be connected through this common space. Next slide, please. This shows you the nuts and bolts of the zoning district. Uh, what we're asking you for is uh, shown on the right-hand side of the screen. And what is existing is shown on the left-hand side. Uh, the left-hand side shows you site one and two that I just explained. Uh, and it, the right-hand side shows you the proposal. And the proposal is, as I mentioned a moment ago, for a C44A zoning district, which I should add is, is consistent with what the Gowanus neighborhood plan uh, did in your recent action on the Gowanus neighborhood rezoning. It created this middle ground for manufacturing uses. Uh, it's not available here in this area because that was special to Gowanus. But what we're proposing here at the C44A allows for the four FAR, which is, a, a, of course, a lower FAR than a five, uh, which doesn't exist for light manufacturing uses. By proposing it here, we're leaving the door open for some residential and legalizing all the residential on the block, as well as opening up the door for these maker spaces. It's really a great combination, uh, I think. Next slide, please. And I'll cruise through the rest of the slides because I think I gave them the nuts and bolts of everything. If you could just keep clicking to the plans and I'll show everybody uh, the suggestion of the plans and then I'll go back into any questions anybody may have. <laughs> Next slide, please. Here, if we just stop right here, perfect. This gives you a good idea for the five-story building. And uh, this is the building that's located at 506 3rd Avenue. And uh, next slide, please. One more slide, please. Just give you an idea for the floor plan. Next slide. Gives you an idea for the floor plans. Uh, as you can see, I've been talking about maker spaces. They're divided up just like you would imagine. 
that's 700 square feet, uh, 715, some are a little smaller, uh, but uh, pretty much just square areas for people to do some work, uh, make coffee, make lunch for themselves and get stuff done. Uh, I won't bore you with the rest of the plans because it's all pretty much the same kind of stuff. We would be happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Uh, and I thank you very much for your time. I know you have a busy agenda. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for your presentations. Uh, no questions here um, for me. Council, do we have sure, any not, not seeing any oh. members with questions at this time either. Okay. Um, thank you. There being no uh, further questions, the applicant panel uh, is excused. Uh, thank Council. You. Are there any members of the public uh, who wish to testify on the 506 Third Avenue rezoning application? Stand by, Chair. Just confirm. Okay, if there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the 506 Third Avenue rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. Uh, Chair, we will just very briefly stand at ease so we can check to see if there are any newly registered members. Uh, Chair Moya, I see no other, no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay. Um, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU items for the uh, 506 uh, 3rd Avenue rezoning proposal on the uh, ULIP number C2101119ZMK and N210. 120ZRK. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, I now open the public hearing on the pre considered LUs for the uh, Starrett uh, Lehigh and Terminal Warehouse rezoning proposal seeking a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment under ULIP numbers uh, C210408ZMM and N210409ZRM relating to property and speaker. Uh, Johnson's District in Manhattan. Once again, if you wish to testify on this item, please visit the Council's website uh, to register. That link is at www.council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Uh, you may also submit written testimony by emailing it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, uh, Council, can you please call the first panel for this item? The applicant panel for this item will include Elise Wagner and Carrie Harris as land use counsel for the applicant. And also available for question and answer uh, will be David Orowitz, Jeff Nelson, Eric Schleimus, Melima Panoli, and Alex Moskowitz. Uh, again, all available for question and answer. Okay. Uh, Council, can you please uh, administer the affirmation? Analysts, please raise your right hands and state your name for the record. Elise Wagner. Caroline Harris. Eric Schlemmer. Jeffrey Nelson. Moskowitz. Nalima Pinelli. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions. I do. Yes, yes. yes. I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, Chair Moya, Council members. Uh, can we put up our uh, presentation, please? I'll get started to save some time while the presentation is going up. My name is Elise Wagner. I'm a partner at Kramer Levin. I'm counsel to terminal owner LP, the owner of the terminal warehouse. I am joined by Caroline Harris of Goldman Harris. She is counsel to RXR SL owner LLC, the owner of the Starrett Lehigh building. Um, next slide. And uh, next slide. I'm going to give a brief introduction, then Carrie will summarize the rezoning and will describe the ways in which it will enhance the neighborhood. Next slide. 
The rezoning covers two buildings, which each occupy a full block. On the left, you see the Starrett Lehigh building, and on the right, you see the terminal warehouse. Both buildings are undergoing as of right renovations that have been approved by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Next slide. Next slide. The rezoning affects the two blocks between 11th and 12th Avenues and West 26th and 28th Street. And it's the area that's just right in the middle of the circle that you see on the map. The current zoning is M23. These two blocks are not currently within the special West Chelsea district, which is the gray area directly east of those blocks. Next slide. This slide shows the existing uses in the area. The red is commercial and office buildings, the yellow is residential, the orange is mixed residential and commercial, and the purple is industrial and transportation. As you can see, the area is primarily commercial with a substantial amount of residential use. Next slide. The two buildings shown in purple and turquoise um, on, the, on this slide are strategically located between West Chelsea to the east, Hudson Yards to the north, the High Line to the north and east, and Hudson River Park to the west. Next slide. Both buildings are located within the West Chelsea Historic District, which is outlined in brown. The Starrett Lehigh Building is also an individual landmark. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie. Thank you, Elise. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm Caroline Harris, as Elise mentioned. Uh, people call me Carrie. I'm with Goldman Harris, and we represent RXR in this proposal. Uh, this slide explains the objective of our rezoning and text amendment proposal. Uh, the objective is to rezone the area, these two blocks, to facilitate a broader range of uses in the buildings and prepare them for the next generation of New York City's economy, enabling flexibility to support the future of manufacturing and retailing and the changing office workplace. Uh, if you could move to the next slide. The applicants are proposing to amend the zoning map. Uh, you can see on the left outlined in red is the area proposed for the rezoning, which currently um, is the M23, and we're proposing to rezone it to M24. And on the right, you'll see the extension of the Special West Chelsea District to include these two blocks, and we're calling it sub area K. Next slide, please. The proposed zoning text amendments um, will expand the uses that are permitted in the buildings without eliminating the uses allowed in the M2 district. We're going to allow the conversion of only 25% of the building to these special expanded uses and limit the use group 10A uses to 15% of each building's zoning floor area. We're proposing that sidewalk cafes be allowed on West 27th Street, and they will be subject to whatever rules and regulations are adopted by DOT in connection with city planning's recent proposed change uh, to allow sidewalk cafes more universally in New York, assuming that that amendment passes. The corner signage regulations are being proposed uh, to change slightly to accommodate the Chamford Corner on the Stair at Lehigh building, although these changes would apply also to the Terminal Warehouse building. And they will allow indirectly illuminated signs up to 75 feet without a restriction on the angle of the sign. And we're proposing very significantly that there be no required loading in the connection with a change of use. Next up, slide, please. Uh, this group of zoning text amendments and map changes intended to enhance West Chelsea. Next slide. Um, what we're proposing to do is uh, make improvements in the loading. This is not strictly a zoning change. This is work that each applicant has been doing for several years now in contemplation of the repositioning of the terminal warehouse. They've removed all exterior loading and are consolidating the loading berths in a single location inside the building, removing all of the loading 
from the exterior of the building. In the case of Stair at Lehigh, we are reducing the number of active loading berths on West 26th Street from 14 to 10, and we'll designate those spaces, spaces as appropriate for smaller trucks, while directing large trucks to the three new loading berths on 12th Avenue and uh, that will enter into the building and not be straddling the sidewalk and uh, another loading berth inside the building on West 27th Street. These four loading berths will be uh, utilized by larger trucks. Um, Star at Lehigh Building is also creating a comprehensive freight and logistics management plan with DOT and they are discussing a mid-block crossing on West 26th Street with DOT. Turn slide, please. This is a 3D image showing the compartmentalization of the terminal warehouse space on the first floor. Originally designed as 28 separate storage spaces, the brick loading partitions in the uh, terminal warehouse building will be retained. These images show a diagram and photos of the new positioning of the ground floor of the terminal warehouse building called the tunnel. Uh, there is a tunnel, in fact, that extends from 11th Avenue through to 12th Avenue, and it's flanked on either side by areas that are proposed to be used for retail with innovative uh, studios and product showcase, retail opportunities, a marketplace, and an assembly area with an auditorium and flexible con convening spaces. Those images on the bottom show these proposed uses. And there is uniquely, if you can turn the, um, there is a unique bike concierge area that you'll see in another slide. Could you uh, move forward, please? Um, West 27th Street will be improved by eliminating the, the, the loading areas on West 27th Street from the Terminal Warehouse building. It will make this street much more appropriate for pedestrians and for bicycling and will be the connecting street between Terminal Warehouse and the Stair at Lehigh building. As you see, there are windows that will encourage engagement between the street and the building and doors and lobby entrance will, entrance will be inviting. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows a unique feature of the terminal warehouse, a bike, bicycle concierge. Terminal warehouse will have 500 spaces for bicycles and turning now to stare at Lehigh, it will have spaces for over 300 bikes showing both applicants commitment to alternative transportation. You could turn the slide, please. This is a, a image of the ground floor plan for the Stair at Lehigh building, which will enable flexible, flexible and customizable space. The ground floor will be wholly dedicated to an entirely new retail enterprise with an incredible range of artisanal dining, shopping, art, and entertainment offerings. A large portion of the ground floor is used under a long-term lease by Verizon, and so is not part of the repositioning of these of this building. The images on the bottom of the slide illustrate the type of uses that are being proposed for the building as well as for the ground floor. Next slide, please. This is an image of the 11th Avenue facade of the Stair at Lehigh building. And again, with transparency to engage people on the sidewalk and driving by with what's going on inside of the building in encouraging the, the activity in the transformation of these two landmark buildings. Next slide, please. This is an image of an event space that would be in the Stair at Lehigh building. Both applicants are committed to reaching out to local businesses, incorporating the arts in their programming and to create a really unique and exciting small area in the, on the west side that will connect the north, east, west, and south of Manhattan together, uh, knitting them together both for planning purposes and uh, for economic development. Next slide, please. So we thank, 
uh, we look forward to having a discussion with you and on the next slide, please. Thank you for the opportunity to share this very exciting proposal with you and uh, that will enable this location to serve as a connector from planning perspective with all of the neighborhoods around and inside the buildings to be responsive to the changing economy in the 21st century. Thank you very much. And if we can answer any questions, we'd be happy to do so. Thank you. Uh, but uh, before we go into questions, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by council member uh, Powers uh, and Levin. And I'm just going to go back to our council to uh, reopen the vote. Thank you, Chair Moya. Uh, on a continuing vote of the land use items, council member Levin. Council member Levin, can you hear me? Uh, we have temporarily yeah. lost council member Levin, sorry. Um, Okay. Sorry, can, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm back. Can you, can you repeat? Oh, yes, uh, continuing vote of the land use items on the agenda today, Council Member Levin. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair, the vote uh, is complete and now stands at seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative. With no abstentions, all items are adopted and referred to the full land use committee. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so. I, I want to go back in the beginning, you were talking about the 15% uh, of the total floor area. You propose capping uh, large scale retail on the site at 15%. Correct. Um, right. The community board, they advocated to uh, for a reduction uh, that the cap be at 10% to limit the neighborhood impact of large scale retail. Uh, can you explain uh, the rationale for the 15% threshold and why it can't be lowered to 10%? Chair Moy, I can take that question. Um, I, I think really part of the impetus of the rezoning was to allow flexibility for changes over time, you know, as the neighborhood is evolving, as these buildings evolve. Obviously, we've seen a lot of changes over the last number of years. And with respect to retail in particular, you know, no one really knows what retail will look like next year, five years from now, 10 years from now. So we think that flexibility is important. I mean, that said, you know, as you noted, this is a concern that was raised by the community board. It's something we've discussed uh, with council member Johnson's team. Uh, we're looking at ways to respond and, and do believe that we can reach a satisfactory outcome with respect to that threshold that you know all parties will find satisfactory. Great, so like, uh, let's go to that because you were, as you talk about uh, the uncertain future of the retail market, uh, isn't that the exact scenario that the community board was weary of? Uh, and would the large scale retail uh, in the future somehow be less than impactful than today? Sorry, can you clarify the last part of the question in terms would of large the... scale retail in the future somehow be less impactful than it is today? Well, I think it's important to note, you know, again, this is about flexibility. I mean, if you look at the, the plans for our building and for terminal, which we've already started to implement. Remember, this is an existing building today. We're looking at small retailers. We're looking at different food uses. We think that's what's important to activate um, the building today. That flexibility longer term is also important. And I think having some degree of those uses between that 10, 15% range is important for us and important for the building and the neighborhood. Okay. Uh, so, is, is your argument that the site's natural constraints will limit the likelihood of large-scale retail tenants wanting to lease the space here? I, I think there's a degree of that, and I could ask Eric Schlemus, who's on our team, if he's available to talk a little bit about um, the layout of the floors and stuff. You know, as we said, at Starrett in particular, there's a long-term lease with Verizon. We're already programming different components of the, of the building with smaller retail and food functions, but maybe Eric can opine a little bit on the, the other constraints. Yeah, I think, and, you know, David from LNL can jump in, you know, as soon as I kind of talk a bit about Starrett. Um, Starrett Lehigh is, you know, constrained, as, you know, Carrie mentioned that and Jeff now, uh, mentioned. Um, the ground floor, the eastern portion of the building has already been programmed with kind of a breakdown of uses there. 
um, that's kind of kind of articulated an ecosystem of restaurants, food, a food hall, an event space. Um, our building lobby is in the middle of the, the block there, um, and then the Verizon space is locked up for you know another ten years or so. Um, so you know, based on those kind of physical constraints and some of the other um, articulations that we've already put into place, um, it seems unlikely that there would be a super, a super large block of space available um, that would be, you know, kind of um, key for one of the uses that the community board has, you know, expressed um, concerns about. Um, so, you know, those kinds of things lead us towards the feeling that, you know, while, you know, the, you know, as Jeff mentioned, you know, our desires for flexibility, there will be some natural um, criteria that will start to break down those blocks of spaces into smaller chunks that will, you know, cater to a different type of, of user. Okay. Um, and, and what is the most recent dialogue with the, the community board on this issue? So we received um, recommendations from the community board, you know, as part of their positive recommendation on the project that guided us, as you noted, to that 10 to 15, I guess, a, a, a one option or path to go to 10% overall 10A use. Um, so that's what we've been considering and also been talking to the council member's office about. Great. Okay, thank you. That's uh, it for me. Uh, do we have any council members uh, that have any questions? No, Chair. I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay. Um, there being uh, no questions uh, for this panel, uh, my colleagues, uh, this panel is now excused. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council, uh, do we have uh, any uh, members of the public who wish to testify on this? Yes. Item? I believe we have two uh, public witnesses there to testify. We will now hear from the first panel, which will include Paul Devlin and Betty McIntosh. Paul Devlin first, followed by Betty McIntosh. Time starts now. Hello, um, my name is Paul Devlin. I think Chair Nemoya just stole some of my thunder. Um, I'm co-chair of the Chelsea Land Use Committee of Community Board 4, and I'm here to speak in favor of this rezoning, but with conditions. We've enjoyed working with the development team over the years and, and appreciate their consideration of our many issues and look forward to the repurposing of these buildings. And the goals of the West Chelsea District are to facilitate an appropriate integration of uses in the area surrounding the reuse of the High Line. And these two blocks between the High Line and the Hudson River do play an integral role in linking these uses in our community. However, on the use group 10A issue, we think 15% is too high, given that with the total square footage of these buildings, this would result in over 440,000 square feet of destination retail. This proposed rezoning would allow approximately five large destination retailers on two blocks. As noted by Chair Moya, we are requesting a 10% cap. We've had many conversations with the applicants requesting they offer solutions to address our concerns. We've discussed ideas such as restricting individual square footage per retailer or restricting retail only to manufacturers within the building. They have yet to offer up a specific alternative to be included in this amendment. 10% would still allow over 300,000 square feet of destination retail, providing the developer with adequate flexibility. Large destination retail uses will alter the unique character of the West Chelsea District and is not, considered, not consistent with the goals of the special district. The developer has stated it's not their intent to market these buildings as destination retail centers, and the current configuration wouldn't allow for any of these large retailers. This argument might be true today, but we're concerned about the future owners of these buildings not honoring the current owner's commitments. And without the restrictions put into place today in the zoning, which will extend beyond the Verizon lease, we have no future protections. In conclusion, we are requesting that the rezoning limit use group 10 to 10% to reduce the negative impact on the historic fabric of the site linking Time the expired. River, as well as eliminating any establishment of perceived precedence to a large large scale retailers within the special district. I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you all for your time. Thank you for your testimony. 
Next speaker will be Betty McIntosh. Time starts now. Betty McIntosh. Hi. Um, good, good morning. Um, I'm a co-chair of the Chelsea Land Use Committee of Community Board 4, and the board has recommended approval with conditions of the proposed rezoning. The proposed inclusion of these two sites in the West Chelsea District is a much welcomed, long-awaited measure that Community Board 4 enthusiastically supports. Uh, we have major concerns. We ask that the applicant implement a solution to the dangerous pedestrian conditions on 20, West 26th Street. Park trucks extend into West 26th Street blocking the sidewalk. Pedestrians are forced to cross the street mid block without seeing the oncoming traffic. A mid block pedestrian crossing could provide a safe path for pedestrians. Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer agrees with us. We are pleased that the city council staff has been discussing this solution with the applicant and with DOT and it made, made it to a slide today by the applicants uh, show. We are hopeful that this pedestrian safety measure will be implemented. Community board four looks forward to joining with Hudson River Park friends and the applicant to add streetscape improvements that would connect Hudson River Park, the applicant sites and the High Line. LPC has discouraged three trees on the sidewalks adjacent to Starrett Lehigh Building. We urge the applicant to revisit this issue with LPC. Um, we look forward to the opportunity to facilitate the transformation of these two sites and to address several local needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel, and I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay, um, seeing no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Uh, we are, Chair, sorry, we are going to just, uh, ap after you dismiss this panel, we'll check to make sure and then move on. Okay, uh, this panel is uh, now excused. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. There are any other members of the public who wish to testify on the Starrett Lehigh Terminal Warehouse proposal, please press the raise hand button now. Chair, the meeting will briefly stand at ease. Just to confirm. Chair Moya, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on these items. Okay. And, um... There being no members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU items for the uh, Starrett, Lehigh, and Terminal Warehouse rezoning proposal under ULURPS number C2104080ZMM and N210409ZRM, the public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LUs number 899 uh, through uh, 9. Uh, 04 for the 175 Park Avenue redevelopment proposal, which seeks approval of four separate uh, zoning special permits, a zoning text amendment, and the disposition of the city owned property, all related in property in, property in council member uh, Paris's district in Manhattan. I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. Uh, if you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that. Uh, now by visiting the council's website at council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Uh, council, if you can, please call the first panel uh, for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Jeff Nelson and Rami Abukuli. Uh, also available for question and answer will be David Karnowski, Penny King, John McMillan, Amir Stein, and Adam Green. Panelists, please raise your right hands and state your name for the record. Jeffrey Nelson. I'm here with Khalil. John Thank McMillan. You. David Karnowski. Okay. I'm your Stein. 
David Velez. Do you affirm, swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee in an answer to all council member questions? Yes. 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 Thank you. You may begin. Chair Moya, thank you. It's good to see you again. <laughs> um, we can put up the presentation, please. I'll kick it off as that's coming up. So I'm Jeff Nelson with RxR Realty. Uh, next slide, please. We're partnered with TF Cornerstone on the development of 175 Park, which is the site of the Grand Hyatt Hotel. And I'm very happy to be at this point in our UR process, having received positive recommendations at the community board from the borough president and obviously at CPC as well. Next slide, please. One more, thank you. So 170 Park is ideally situated directly adjacent to Grand Central Terminal uh, at the center of really an unparalleled transit network. You have Metro North, the Lexington Avenue and Flushing subway lines, the shuttle and east side access, which will come in shortly uh, to serve uh, the east side as well. I wanna highlight in particular on the right side of this slide, the Lexington Avenue line and the Metro North loop track that bisect our site. Those are our infrastructure challenges that present both challenges and opportunities for the design team and have really informed the building we'll show you. Next slide. So the current building, which we probably all know is, um, has a facade that's very dark and imposing and, and it's generally uninviting, particularly at the street level. It's built to the lot line and in a lot of ways actually goes beyond that. On 42nd Street, there's actually a cantilever that serves to block additional light in there for the general public and commuters coming out of the terminal. Next slide. The, the sidewalks, as you can see here, are narrow and congested. And above grade, the Park Avenue viaduct uh, is uh, an exclusively cars only zone. Next slide. That's a relationship that really extends to the interior as well. The building poses severe challenges for the commuting public. What you see on this slide is that very congested entrance down into the 42nd Street Passage and into the subway system. That's actually an entrance that sits on the Grand Hyatt property and a number of our transit improvements will help that condition, we think immensely. Next slide. So the proposed project is the demolition of the existing hotel, which is functionally obsolete, and then the construction of a new mixed use office building uh, and hotel. The overall program is 2.2 million zoning square feet, and that's comprised of just under 2 million square feet of office space, and then a 500 key hotel at the top of the building. There's a small amount of retail that's controlled by the MTA. Uh, and then there are extensive public realm and transit improvements that leverage the greater East Midtown zoning framework. Next slide. Those uh, improvements are really the foundation of our project. Um, and as Romney will go through, that's really both a literal and figurative uh, expression. You can see on the left side, the current condition and how intricately linked and connected we are to Grand Central Terminal. Uh, and what we've proposed, which you can see on the right side, are a series of public improvements and plan that Romney will go through. The highlight at grade is a new transit hall we'll be constructing, and then below grade, new mezzanine access and a connection into east side access. Above uh, the street level, the building will be surrounded by three really world-class public terraces. And with respect to those terraces, we want to thank two people in particular, Borough President uh, Gail Brewer for providing the suggestion and inspiration for elevating those terraces. And then we'd also like to thank Council Member Powers for identifying the need for cultural programming and tasking us with thinking creatively about how cultural and art programming could further enliven the project. I'll turn it over to Rami and he can go through the building in greater detail. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next, please. So I'm going to walk you through uh, the transit and open space improvements, and they really unfold on three different levels, starting here uh, with below grade. One of the major improvements will affect how passengers connect between the train tracks and the subway. Currently, as you can see in this image, passengers have to go uh, from the Long Island Railroad or the Metro North tracks up into the main terminal just to descend back onto the subway mezzanine. Next. And by reusing a dormant train tunnel, we can create a pedestrian shortcut 
uh, uh, that will decongest the terminal above and allow passengers to go directly from LIRR and Metro North tracks into the subway mezzanine. Next. Now that subway mezzanine, most, most New Yorkers are familiar with how confusing of an experience it is currently. This diagram shows uh, that it's congested mainly by the turnstile configuration that you see here on the lower left-hand side of the page and by the presence uh, of these very deep girders that you see here in green. These visually break up the space, but also prevent efficient distribution of passengers across the platforms. Next. Because we're taking down the Grand Hyatt Hotel, where we can remove these girders in order to visually open up the mezzanine from one side to the other, making it safer and more efficient. And the turnstiles will be moved up to grade in order to further open up the mezzanine. We're also adding a new diagonal stair that you see here that will serve to distribute passengers in a much more even way to avoid crowding at the extremities of these platforms. Next. And now let's go up to grade uh, and you'll see that the diagonal stair that I just showed you, as well as those turnstiles that we just relocated, uh, are now arriving in an expanded and new subway entrance. That new subway entrance will have direct access directly from the street, so you no longer have to go into the terminal and the 42nd Street Passage just to enter the subway. Uh, we're also going to be re relocating an existing ADA elevator out of the historic vestibule in the 42nd Street Passage and into this new transit hall. So that will allow us to uh, restore the vestibule to its original condition. Uh, next. <clears throat> and the transit hall that you see here in this image will be connected to the 42nd Street Passage that you see beyond. will feature skylights that will bring natural light uh, uh, into the terminal. Next. Um, and this is the view of that same transit hall, but looking south towards 42nd Street. I want to point out those turnstiles that you see, uh, again, raised uh, to, to the ground floor level, as well as, as direct views out to 42nd Street. Next. The Lexington Passage will be rebuilt more or less in its current condition, uh, but with taller uh, ceiling heights and better finishes. Next. And you can see in this image how it will have a large window out onto Lexington Avenue for better orientation and wayfinding. It's gonna to continue to be lined with retail as it currently is, next. And this, this view shows uh, uh, what it will look like on Lexington Avenue. So you can see on the right, the entrance into the Lexington Passage with this uh, tall glass uh, wall compared to the current very small opening. Uh, just to its left, you see the newly relocated uh, subway entrance that currently sits very close to the congested corner. We're moving it further north and creating a covered area that allow pedestrians to orient themselves as they exit uh, the subway. Next, uh, in order to provide relief for pedestrians on what is one of the busiest intersections in the city, the project expands sidewalks by approximately 4,000 square feet, especially at the entrances of, the, uh, of those subways. Next. And we're surrounding the tower with a necklace of three elevated plazas, each named after an adjacent landmark. That's going to be a total of approximately 24,000 square feet of public, publicly accessible open space. And as Jeff noted, we're working very hard on, on to make sure that they're programmed, animated, publicly accessible. Next. These can be reached uh, via three uh, grand staircases, as well as ADA elevators that bring the public up to the level of the Park Avenue viaduct. Uh, like many buildings on Park Avenue, our lobby is elevated at the level of that viaduct. Uh, next. And so this will create new public spaces from which we can finally appreciate the surrounding context away from the extremely busy sidewalks below. This view is looking east uh, towards Lexington Avenue. You can see the Chrysler building uh, uh, on the left. Uh, next. This view is on the Gray Bar Terrace, so on the north side of our site, looking west towards the terminal. And you can see these new views of the, of the terminal that are going to be revealed. Uh, next. And on the west side, uh, uh, finally, a new public space will, for the first time, allow the public to really appreciate the eastern facade of the terminal in a way that has been uh, uh, essentially inaccessible since, since, the, uh, since the, uh, the terminal was built. Uh, next. <clears throat> Next slide. As you can imagine, building uh, uh, so this is a, a, a in summary, you know, the project really dedicates large areas to public improvements, both below grade with the creation of the short loop, the improvements to the transit mezzanine, 
at grade with this large new transit hall, new subway entrances, and improvements to the Lexington Avenue passage uh, and the, the Lexington Avenue subway entrance. And finally, above grade, this necklace of elevated public spaces that would really create a new destination for Midtown. Next. As you can imagine, designing a building above such uh, an infrastructurally dense site is a unique challenge. This diagram shows how there are only two points along 42nd Street that allow the building to meet uh, uh, terra firma. I'm going to show you how that has impacted uh, the design of the tower. Next. The tower itself has a balanced symmetrical massing that we think is very, very uh, New York. It doesn't teeter over the neighboring landmarks and it sets back at critical datum to reduce its bulk as it rises. This helps us create uh, access to outdoor space and we know how important that is uh, uh, for tenants in the, current, uh, in the current context. The tower is then clad in expressed uh, structural lattice. So it has some texture and materiality. It's not just a glass box. And of course, then that structure is woven, sculpted and rounded at the top in order to address the, the city in the round with a crown. And at the base, as you can see in this diagram, it kind of bundles in order to hit 42nd Street on these two points that we identified earlier. Next slide. So we've really taken this, this uh, uh, extremely uh, difficult structural constraint and turned it into the main design features that allows us to dramatically improve the streetscape for pedestrians. And that creates a new visibility for the terminal itself and the public spaces that now um, are created uh, uh, along 42nd Street. Next. In the skyline, the tower will address the city in the round and creates a new gateway uh, for Midtown East. Next. Th thanks, Rami. So uh, just to, to conclude, obviously a project of this magnitude will generate thousands of jobs and, and billions of economic impact, as we note on the slide. I think even more importantly, and where we wanted to conclude was that we're committed to working with local workforce development partners, including Helmets of Hard Hats, non-traditional employment for women and others that work closely with the construction trades and providing job opportunities. And then also working with the city through their Hire NYC program on overall hiring at the building. Um, obviously, RxR and TF are big believers in New York and the recovery coming out of the pandemic. And we think this project is really a key initiative and undertaking to demonstrate that forward progress. Thank you uh, for your time and happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks, I got, I got two quick questions. Uh, are there, and if, if, you, if you said this during the presentation, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I got it, but are there any other developments, uh, development sites that could theoretically take advantage uh, of the amended special uh, permit text? Uh, I'm gonna ask David Karnofsky, our counsel, to answer that one, Chair. David's available. I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, Chair Moya, the text was designed to facilitate the treatment of the development site and the Grand Central lot as a single qualifying site for purposes of East Midtown regulations, and it applies only to, to that. And uh, we wouldn't anticipate that this would be replicated uh, elsewhere. Okay. Uh, as part of the overall project, the, the, the borough board must separately approve of the amendment uh, of the ground lease on the site. Uh, between the, the city of New York as landlord and the LDC affiliated with the applicant, uh, can you give us a status report on what that process and uh, your expected timing on this? Sure, so um, you're right. The, the site is currently owned by the state of New York. It's leased to Hyatt. The ownership will be transferred to the city the lease will be extended following the borough board um, approval, and we expect to be at the borough board uh, in December. Okay. Um, that's all the questions I have. Uh, council, do we have any council? There we go. Yep. I'm going to now turn it over to council member powers. I just want to remind um, my colleagues that we have a, a five minute time limit uh, that we set up for questions. Uh, so if you can set that up, there we go. Councilman Powers. It starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moya. And I'll try to do even less than five. I know you guys got a long day here. Um, can we just discuss uh, just the transit hall for a very quick second? And can you tell us uh, just about the retail that's on the border of it? 
are, and whether you guys are going to retain the retail spaces in the middle of the transit, all of those are going to be removed. So the answer is um, a portion of the retail will be removed. There is a little bit of the retail that will remain. Um, the, the passageway is something that we've worked uh, both with the MTA and with our architects, Fire Blender Bell. You know, as you know, we retained, they did the original Grand Central renovation a couple of decades ago. We think that passageway, you know, historically it's been important to maintain a degree of retail there. And in working with MTA and BBB, ensuring that there's circulation that meets the needs of commuters is key. And then also maintaining that historic character. Okay. And just on transit still, can you tell us how much, uh, and public realm, can you tell us how much was, uh, how much money has been contributed to the public realm improvement fund for public realm improvements in Midtown? How much uh, additional FAR is being granted based on the transit improvements? And then any ADA accessible improvements that are being made as part of the project? Let's take those, maybe we can do ADA first. Rami, sure. if you wanna just talk about the ADA improvements. That's right. So, um, so all the all the subway entrances off of Lexington and Forty Second Street will come with their own dedicated ADA elevators. Uh, ADA ele uh, uh, another set of ADA elevators will also be serving all of the terraces. So all the terraces will be uh, accessible with uh, with dedicated ADA elevators exclusively for the public realm. Then, with respect to the FAR that. Are being it's being generated by the improvements. Uh, it's approximately 850,000 square feet, I believe, between the public uh, terraces as well as the transit bonuses uh, that will be provided. Uh, with respect to the PRIF, it depends on the amount of uh, air rights that are ultimately transferred, uh, but I believe the number is approximately $30 million would be the anticipated payment. Okay. <clears throat> Um, and uh, do we talk about how much FAR is being granted for the transit improvements? I think that was my first question. Uh, I gave you the aggregate oh, okay. number. So it's about 800 and uh, David can give the yeah. exact number. It's, it's uh, about 870 actually. 870,000. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Just on the hotel standpoint, I'm just going to try to hit a couple questions just so we have these clear answers. How many hotel rooms are planned to be in the building? 500. 500. Is there going to be any event space, conference rooms, or ballrooms, any restaurants or amenities? Yeah, though there's a component of event space as well as a restaurant. And this is all, you know, per severance agreement that's been executed with the Hotel Trades Council. And is that where where is the location of the restaurant and event space? It's all expected to be at the top of the building with the hotel. Okay. On uh, the cultural and arts, which is something we have talked a lot about, ways to kind of revitalize Midtown, bring life to it in the after hours, give something new to the folks that work and live around there. Um, can you just give us a little more uh, understanding of the sort of governing structure or how the, you know, whether there will be community input on those events, how you'll make decisions on which uh, uh, private or public entities might be able to be programmed there and then anything else we might expect in terms of how things will be planned there? Sure. So, you know, as Rami walked through, we have three, we think, distinct terraces in, in terms of their character and obviously location at the building. And each one lends itself to different types of programming. Um, in particular, the Graybar Terrace on the north side, we think presents a real opportunity for events and programming, uh, given its location at the building. And, and what we did is we engaged Lord Cultural Resources, which is a renowned uh, organization that works with nonprofits and cultural organizations, as well as the Public Art Fund, to think through uh, the various forms of programming at the terraces and how we can activate it. So what we've um, contemplated are both uh, events that within the guidelines promulgated by city planning involve full closure of terraces at times and others that are what we call pop-up or um, events uh, that would allow access from the public throughout. Now, informing all of this, the building's not going to be open, you know, until about 2030, based on our timeline. What we uh, expect to put in place is an advisory board, obviously with your input, uh, council member, as well as um, the community board and, and borough president. Okay, I'm going to team my questions, and I, we have a lot to talk about. I'm excited. Apologies about for the long answer. 
<laughs> no worries. I just want to be Chair Moya and others have a long day. So I want to keep it at that and uh, we'll keep talking. So thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Powers. Uh, Council, do we have any other council members with questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no other members with questions for this panel. Okay, uh, seeing no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 140, on the 175 uh, Park Avenue uh, proposal? Yes. The first panel will include Darnell Harper, Gilfredo Valentin, Jessica Walker, and Renzo Ramirez. The first speaker on this first panel will include will be Donna, Darnell Harper, followed by Gilfredo Valentin. Time starts now. Perhaps we'll take Gilfredo Valentin first and then Renzo Ramirez. Gilfredo Valentin first. Time starts now. Oh, sorry. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello? Okay, this is Donna Hopper. Sorry for the delay. Who's going first? My apologies, Mr. Valentin. Uh, Darnell Harper will be the first speaker. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm um thank you for the opportunity to voice my support for this project. My name is Arnold Harper. I'm a New York City resident and a member of Local 79 with almost 10,000 members. And uh, you know, we're the largest laborers in the North America. And I just want to express, you know, how I came from non-union and becoming in the union, working for TF Cornerstone right now them giving me an opportunity to work for them and, you know, make a better living for myself. You know, our industry provides opportunities to uplift those that have been the most impacted by the pandemic, including low-income New Yorkers, people of color, and out of borough residents. Also, RXR and TF Cornerstone Project will create thousands of good construction jobs that provide benefits and families sustaining wages. I got an opportunity for the union career through Pathways to Apprenticeship and then Local 79's Apprenticeship Program. I want other people from my community to have the same opportunity to change their lives and this project can provide those pathways. 175 Park Ave will also bring thousands of permanent jobs once completed, new open space and influx of economic activity. Thank you again for the opportunity to lead our support to this important project. Thank you, Darnell. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, next, next Gilfredo Valentin will be the next speaker, followed by Renzo Ramirez. And starts now. Good morning, members of the board. I am speaking on behalf of Pathway to Apprenticeship and Labor's Local 79. My name is Gafredo Valentin Jr. and I'm a resident of New York City and a member of the Labor's Local 79. With almost 10,000 skilled and experienced members, we are the largest Labor's Locals in North America. I would like to share uh, a story of how I got into the pathway to apprenticeship. I was walking into my mom's lobby and I seen an ad on a, on a wall advertising for this program. And it was something that I needed in my life at that particular moment. I was working non-union. I felt very unsafe. And, and, I, and, and it wasn't enough to uh, take care of my family. There was no health benefits, nothing like that. And when I got into this program, I was shown a different side of the construction business, a side where the members or the workers are put first, their safety are, are put first, the public safety are put first. And that was very important to me. And, and, and once I graduated that program, program, I got accepted into the Labor's Local 79 Apprenticeship. And again, it was nothing but safe talk 
we are trained well. Um, I'm a little nervous, but I just want to, you know, just support this project because it's it's gonna uplift our communities. It's gonna help people with, you know, low low income New Yorkers, people of colors, the out of breath residents, people who are who 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 needs the opportunity to make it ahead in life. People that 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 come from poor judgments and bad neighborhoods. I mix by it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alfredo. You did great. Uh, we appreciate your testimony today. Uh, go with the next speaker. Renzo Ramirez will be the next speaker, followed by Jessica Walker. Time starts now. Hello. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you, Renzo. All right, great. Um, good morning, uh, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Renzo Ramirez, and I am a member of 32BJ SEIU. As you know, 32BJ is the largest property service union, representing 85,000 property service workers across the city. We represent workers who maintain, clean, and provide security services in buildings like the one being discussed at 175 Park Ave. 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. I am happy to report that the developers affiliated with this project, RxR, have a track record as responsible employers. 32BJ has experience working with these developers and know them to be good partners. We estimate that this rezoning, which will allow the construction of over 2 million square feet of commercial office space, will lead to the creation of 66 cleaning jobs. These jobs are typically filled by local members of the community and because of this commitment, will pay family sustaining wages, which help bring working families into the middle class. This commitment to good prevailing wage jobs will give opportunity for upward mobility, security and dignity to working class families. 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. We know that this development will continue to uphold the industry standard and provide opportunities for working families to thrive. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your testimony, Renzo. Um, do we have any other questions? No questions at this time, but Jessica Walker will be the next and last speaker on this panel. Jessica Walker. My apologies. Time starts now. Good morning. I'm sorry I'm having some technical difficulties this morning. Um, I'm Jessica Walker, the president and CEO of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. And of course, we represent and support the business community across the borough of Manhattan. Um, so even though the city is rebounding in the wake of the COVID crisis, we are seeing that foot traffic is still extremely depressed in the city's central business district. It's about half of what it was before the pandemic. And that's why we see the redevelopment as of 175 Park Avenue is so critical. Uh, it's a real vote of confidence in Midtown's continued viability uh, as a bustling center of innovation, transit and economic growth. Um, we think that the, you know, the state of the art office tower is really gonna continue the legacy of leading global companies and talented workforce, uh, the, our talented workforces to, to continue to call this neighborhood home. And of course, we do think it would be very helpful to increasing foot traffic in the long run and really rebuilding that community to support the small businesses and startups and the, the mid-market firms in the area. And finally, we are extremely excited about the future transit improvements to the Grand Central Terminal um, and the surrounding area that are proposed as part of this redevelopment. Um, certainly, it's gonna create a new entry and exit points that's really going to increase the pedestrian flow and accessibility for workers and commuters. So we wholeheartedly support this project and we strongly support its passage. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Uh, do we have uh, any other speakers? That was the last speaker on this panel, Chair, and I see no members with questions for this panel. Uh, this panel is now excused and you can call up the next panel. The next panel will include Rob Burns, Ryan Pucos, Adam Hartke, and Anne Trenkel. The first speaker will be Rob Burns, followed by Ryan Pucos. Time starts now.
I seem to have problems with my video. Oh no, it's going, okay. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Rob Burns and I'm president of the East Midtown Partnership, which is the business improvement district encompassing an area a few blocks north of 175 Park. Uh, the plans for 175 Park deliver on the promise of East Midtown rezoning by bringing an attractive and modern class A building to the area and improving the public realm by adding roughly 25,000 square feet of publicly accessible and ADA compliant open space to a community sorely lacking in that amenity. Transit improvements to Grand Central Terminal and the subway station running beneath will also benefit the area, including new subway and terminal entrances, expanded circulation, ADA accessibility and other improvements at one of the busiest stations in one of the busiest mass transit systems in the world. At a time when the MTA is under severe financial strain, these improvements at no cost to the public are especially welcome. Uh, finally, the redevelopment of 175 Park will add more than 24,000 well-paying construction jobs with an estimated $1.8 billion in earnings. It's also projected to add approximately $3.8 billion annually to the city's economy. And at a time when the city's commercial core is yet to recover from the pandemic, this is especially significant. For these reasons, I urge the support of the 175 Park proposal. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ryan Pukos will be the next speaker, followed by Adam Hartke. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Ryan Pukos, speaking on behalf of the Grand Central Partnership. Uh, the Grand Central Partnership is a business improvement district serving an approximately 70 square block area in Midtown East surrounding Grand Central Terminal. Uh, on behalf of our district management association and its board of directors, we welcome the opportunity to voice our support for 175 Park Avenue. As one of the world's largest bids serving a district with 73 million square feet of commercial, residential, and retail building space, our goal is to keep our Midtown East neighborhood clean, safe, and thriving. We believe that the redevelopment of 175 Park Avenue supports this goal in several important ways. First, 175 Park Avenue will deliver valuable public realm transit improvements to Midtown East. For example, the project adds critically needed open space in the form of a 25,000 square foot elevated public terrace that provides new vantage points to some of our neighborhood's most iconic landmarks. In addition, TF Cornerstone and RxR Realty have partnered with the Public Art Fund and Lord Cultural Resources to develop a cultural program to bring public art installations and programming to the terrace. The project also delivers accessibility and circulation improvements to the M MTA's infrastructure, including new and optimized subway and terminal entrances and a new transit hall with retail and other amenities. Second, 175 Park Avenue addresses a long-term challenge for our district by increasing the neighborhood supply of modern, efficient, and sustain sustainable Class A office space, a key goal of the 2017 Greater East Midtown rezoning. Finally, 175 Park Avenue represents a crucial investment in the economic health of Midtown East and the city at large. In the short term, this investment will support the city's economic recovery by creating more than 24,000 construction jobs and bringing more workers to our district to support our restaurants, retailers, and other businesses in the long term, it will boost tax revenue and help ensure that Midtown East remains a premier Thank central you, business district and vibrant destination for New Yorkers and visitors alike. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Adam Hartke will be the next speaker, followed by Anne Henkel. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Apologies for the baby in the background, if you can hear it. Uh, my name is Adam Harkey, and I'm testifying as a resident of Murray Hill and as a member of Community Board 6, which is adjacent to the proposed development. This project is both the highest and best use for this area due to its proximity to one of the busiest transportation hubs in the hemisphere. As Midtown continues to recover from the ravages of COVID, this project represents the broader commitment to business within our urban core, which will bring much needed upgrades to transit and open space in the surrounding area. With the passage of this project, I urge the various government parties and private actors to continue the reimagination of the area around Grand Central Terminal, such as expanding open space to the Grand Central Viaduct and other, other open space improvements, similar to the new plazas on Vanderbilt Avenue, coupled with street level improvements, including but not limited to expanded sidewalks, improved bus lane, secure bike parking, et cetera. 
If people from all stripes return to Midtown for business, living, or pleasure, we cannot return to the subpar pre-COVID conditions. Today, you can already see the popularity of Vanderbilt Avenue and Pershing Square, and this demand for open space will only increase. I laud the improvements in this project, but much more should be implemented in the coming years. Doing so makes both business and civic sense. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Ann Trinkle. Time starts now. Hi, good morning. Um, we've heard a lot of testimony about the post-construction um, positives of this project. We also heard from some of our brothers in Local 79 and also 32B and J SEIU what these construction uh, jobs mean to different individuals in the city. Helmets to Hard Hats represents our returning military personnel and also our active uh, reservists and our guards, men and women, who are looking to get into a career, not just a job, but a career that will offer them a future. Training, safety, pension, benefits, the full, the full um, whatever we could expect to offer to our uh, returning military folks. Uh, this being Veterans Day coming around the corner, it's very near and dear to our hearts on how many veterans that we have placed into the construction trades. In New York State, we have approximately 838,000 veterans. Approximately 25% of those military veterans live here in the five boroughs. At any given time, New York Helmets to Hard Hats has 20,000 plus military veterans that are looking to get into a construction union. We have placed from the duration of the program, approximately 3,000 vets into the different trades in New York. Uh, from 2013 forward, when we uh, formed New York City Helmets to Hard Hats, we have approximately 900, 925 vets that have started careers. They have families, they can buy homes, they can have a life and it's really uh, the future is much brighter when they have something to look forward to and they know they can come to work in the morning and they're gonna make it home safely to their family at the end of the day. Thank you. Chair, that was the, sorry, that was the last speaker on this panel and I see no members with questions for this panel. Thank you, seeing uh... No questions for this panel. This panel now is excused. If you can, um, please call up the next panel. Next panel will include Santos Rodriguez, George Badame, Munson Park, and Nicole Bertrand. First speaker will be Santos Rodriguez, followed by Jay Badame. Time starts now. No, I was just trying to unmute myself. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I am Santos Rodriguez. I'm here to testify on behalf of Gary LaBarber, President of the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York and Vicinity. We testified in support of this project, Grand Hyatt, the Grand Hyatt Project at 175 Park in June 2021, uh, in September 2021, and we are here to testify in support of this project today. The Building and Construction Trades Council the Building and Construction Trades Council is an organization of local building and construction trades unions that are affiliated with 15 international unions in the North American building trades. Our local union affiliates represent approximately 100,000 union construction workers. The building trades mission is to rise the standards of living, of living for all workers to advocate for safe work condition and collectively advance working conditions for all our affiliates members, as well as all workers in New York City. Time and again, it is demonstrated that construction work is the catalyst for the city's economic recovery. And I believe that this situation we face today is no different. New Yorkers need jobs to make ends meet. The city needs investment to drive recovery. And there are few, be few better ways to catalyze both than by building. Construction is a crucial source of good paying stable jobs. 100, 175 Park Avenue will create the new open space in Midtown and improve the transportation infrastructure, infrastructure around Grand Central Station. RXR and CF Cornerstone proposed redevelopment will create the thousands of construction jobs that provide benefits and steady paychecks. The project will create opportunities for New Yorkers of all walks of all lives through our apprentice readiness, Apprenticeship Readiness Collective. The program within ARP provides entry level to work 
and the construction industry training and preparation for careers and future work in construction. For individuals to participate in these programs, there needs, there needs to be construction work to perform. The development of the Grand High will provide opportunities as such, and we at the Building Trades support this project. Thank you. Jay Badame will be the next speaker, followed by Munson Park. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Moya, for the opportunity to comment on this project. I'm the chairman of the Regional Alliance for Small Contractors, as well as sitting on the board of NEW, the Non-Traditional Employment for Women, and we also support the Helmets to Hard Hats initiative. As such, my constituents care deeply about what happens at 175 Park. This development holds the potential to help New York City begin its long recovery following the COVID-19 crisis in terms of good paying jobs, open space, and transit improvements the city needs. 175 Park Avenue will be a new mixed use tower that will feature approximately 2.1 million square feet of new Class A commercial office space, a 453,000 square foot Hyatt operated hotel with up to 500 rooms, and 10,000 square feet of retail on the cellar and ground floors, including MTA controlled retail locations. As such, the project will deliver a significant number of construction related benefits, including indirect and induced benefits. The project will generate an estimated thousands of construction jobs, $1.8 billion in wages and fringe benefits, and an annual output of $3.8 billion in New York City's economy. What's more, the team will be pursuing an aggressive MWBE campaign by working with a host of local organizations to establish partnerships that ensure New Yorkers of all backgrounds that they can access good paying construction jobs. The Landmarks Committee, Community Board 5, Borough President Gail Brewer, City Planning Commissioner have voted in support of this proposal. I welcome and look forward to your comments and takeaway. Thank you. Munson Park will be the next speaker, followed by Nicole Bertrand. Time starts now. Good morning, council members. Can you hear me? Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this project. My name is Munson Park, and I am a senior real estate manager in the Transit Oriented Development Group of the MTA. As such, we care deeply about what happens at 175 Park, notably as it relates to the host of public transit improvements this development offers. We strongly endorse the 175 Park package of transit improvements that will be delivered, which will undeniably improve the terminal and support the city's long-term mobility goals through significant investments in our mass transit infrastructure. Grand Central Terminal is the second busiest transit hub in New York City. In fact, the terminal and subway station see over 750,000 visitors per day. The 175 Park development is offering improvements that will enhance the commuter experience for every transit user around Grand Central Terminal and the Grand Central 42nd Street subway station. Specifically, the development's public transit improvements include providing New York City Transit, Metro North, and Long Island Railroad customers with direct and efficient intermodal connections to fast track their daily commutes. A brand new transit hall, a new dedicated subway entrance, and a new fare control area relocated at street level that will increase capacity and alleviate density. Intuitive wayfinding at the subway mezzanine level with increases in walkable area and the introduction of natural daylight. New and optimized subway and terminal entrances, expanded circulation and ADA accessibility, along with enhanced amenities. And lastly, an improved subway entrance on Lexington Avenue that aligns I, I. with the flow of fit traffic within the subway mezzanine level. This robust set of improvements is necessary to provide New Yorkers with a world-class transit system. And we recommend that the city council approve the proposed improvements. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 
Nicole Bertrand will be the next and last speaker on this panel. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Moya and esteemed members of the committee. My name is Nicole Bertrand. I serve as the Executive Vice President of the Edward J. Malloy Initiative for Construction Skills. Construction Skills is a nonprofit apprenticeship readiness organization that serves New York City public high school students and adult residents from throughout the five boroughs. I'm pleased to offer testimony this afternoon. For 20 years, since 2001, construction skills has contributed to the development of a skilled and trained workforce by recruiting, training, and placing residents of New York City into apprenticeship programs jointly sponsored by union affiliates of the Building and Construction Trades Council. Our participants live in all five boroughs, 89% are minority, and to date, we've placed more than 2,300 graduates into union apprenticeship careers. 80% of these graduates remain active in the industry today, including 1,000 journey persons. In March, 2020, and there's been mention of this today, um, four apprenticeship readiness programs in New York City formed a first of its kind collective called the Apprenticeship Readiness Collective. And ARC affiliates include construction skills, helmets to hard hats, non-traditional employment for women, and pathway to apprenticeship. From 9-11 to Hurricane Sandy and now the COVID-19 pandemic, ARC programs have always been part of the city's recovery efforts. Workforce development stakeholders have noted the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 during this pandemic, which has had, I'm sorry, the disproportionate impact the COVID-19 pandemic has had on minority communities. And each ARC affiliate stands ready with the skills and expertise to provide direct entry access to family sustaining careers in the unionized construction industry that uh, offers high wages, benefits, and retirement security. We support the 175 project and hope that goes through. Thank you. Thank you. That was the testimony. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, there being no questions for this panel, the panel is now excused. We'll call up the next panel, please. The next panel will include Alicia Park Rogers, Helene Chinque, and Tapadar Surab. First speaker will be Felicia Park Rogers, followed by Time's Helene Chinque. Time starts now. Good morning. Uh, my name is Felicia Park Rogers and I'm the Director of Regional Infrastructure Projects for Tri-State Transportation Campaign, a regional transportation advocacy and policy organization working to reduce congestion, pollution, and to improve commutes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of, um, in support of uh, 175 Park Avenue. I'd like to focus my comments on the transit improvements included in the project scope and have submitted testimony with more detail um, to your email. Uh, as you know, complicated transit connections within the Grand Central Complex, along with serious congestion at the 42nd Street subway entrance have been persistent issues at this important transit hub. Tri-State appreciates the thoughtful approach that RXR and TF Cornerstone have developed in partnership with the MTA to maximize the opportunities that this project provides for addressing structural issues which have previously prevented major upgrades at Grand Central. In the coming years, as ridership returns and eventually exceeds pre-COVID levels, and as Eastside Access brings Long Island Railroad service to Grand Central, it will be critical that we ensure our transit infrastructure is prepared to handle higher passenger volumes while promoting the health, safety, and ease of travel for riders. This project includes a number of investments which will greatly improve riders and pedestrians' experience moving through the area. Improving riders' experience with transit helps reduce car use to the city center, which is vital for combating climate change and bringing economic opportunities back to this critical business and tourist district. The plan's public improvements go far beyond cosmetic upgrades and create a sizable upgrade to the city's and region's public transit infrastructure. The transit improvements that this project will deliver will come at no cost to the MTA as the improvements will be privately funded 
by the developers. This is important for our city's underfunded transit system, even more so during the COVID budget crisis, which has severely impacted the MTA budget, including its ability Time to- expired. I just have two more sentences, if you don't mind, um, which has severely impacted the MTA budget, including its ability to fully fund better ADA accessibility across the system. The ADA and accessibility improvements in this project are especially critical and include two new elevators, um, one which is covered so that people can wait and stay dry in the rain. So in closing, I recommend this proposal and I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Pauline Chinkwe will be the next speaker followed by Tafadar Surat. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Helene Sinclair from the MTA TOD group. Um, I actually wasn't sure I was gonna make it to this meeting. So Moon Sun Park actually read our remarks that represented our feelings, but I just wanna reiterate that the transit improvements proposed by 175 Park are major, major improvement to Grand Central and we support the, the project, we support the transit improvements and um, we're thrilled to have, to be part of, be part of it. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your testimony today. Here, yeah, that was uh, actually the last speaker on this panel that we have available and I see no members with questions. Okay. Um, There being uh, no members, uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the LU number eight nine nine through nine oh four for the one seventy five Park Avenue proposal. The public hearing is now closed and the uh, items are laid over. I now open the public hearing on pre-considered LU items for the Soho NoHo neighborhood plan, which seeks a zoning map and zoning text amendment under ULURPS number C2104220 ZMM and N210423 ZRM and relating to property in council member, Chin, uh, council member Chins and council member Rivera's district in Manhattan. In conjunction with these pre-considered LUs items, uh, we will jointly hold a hearing on proposed local legislation relating to increasing penalties relating to uh, occupancy of the joint living work quarters for artists uh, contrary to zoning. We have a lot of speakers signed up for this hearing, so I would ask that you all be patient and that the council staff wor is working hard to make sure that uh, you all have a chance to speak. If you would prefer to submit written testimony, uh, you can always do so by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. And I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item, if you have not already done so, uh, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website at council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. And council, please call up the first panel. Yes, Chair. Uh, just before I do that, I'm going to make a quick announcement. Uh, again, regarding uh, registrations for everyone who has signed up in advance and successfully logged into this webinar, you are in the right place. We will make sure to get to everyone's testimony. There is no reason uh, for anyone to be raise, using the raise hand function. If you are here, uh, please be patient and we will get to you. And with that, the uh, applicant panel for this item will include Anita Lermont and Sylvia Lee of the Department of City Planning. Also available for a question and answer will be Edith Su Chen and Eric Botsford, uh, also of the Department of City Plan Planning, Ahmed Tigani of HPD, Michael Sandler of HPD, and Gonzalo Casal, PCLA Commissioner. Panelists, please state your name for the record and raise your right hand. Anita Laramont. Ahmed Tigani. Michael Sandler. Edith Suchen. Gonzalo Casals. Do you all swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all councilman questions? I do. I do. Yes, I do. I do. I do. Thank you. You may begin your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Could you please bring up the slides? Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Moya and Salamanca, Council Members Chen, 
and Rivera and members of the subcommittee on zoning and franchises. Next slide, please. Next slide. Well, well, okay, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Department of City Planning's proposal for a comprehensive rezoning of the Soho and NoHo neighborhoods in Manhattan Community District 2. Two highly desirable neighborhoods with excellent transit connectivity, iconic architecture, and a rich cultural history situated between two of the city, the country's largest business districts and adjacent to communities that are dynamic in their own right. Soho and NoHo are also among the city's strongest retail corridors and are home to tens of thousands of jobs and businesses. Next slide, please. The Soho NoHo neighborhood plan is centered around promoting housing affordability and equity, improving access to economic opportunity, furthering the well being of our cultural community, and promoting good urban design and an improved public realm. At a high level, the Soho NoHo neighborhood plan exemplifies the idea that with sensitive and focused planning and robust public dialogue, all neighborhoods across the city can play a part in solving the myriad challenges that we as New Yorkers share. Critically, this initiative affirms that historic preservation and continued growth can be mutually beneficial, especially with sensible urban design controls and continued LPC oversight. With strong tenant protections, protection laws and programs, building housing in Soho and NoHo will relieve market pressure on rents in these two communities and in surrounding communities, including Chinatown. The plan offers meaningful, meaningful support for the arts in a publicly oriented way, recognizing the continued contribution of longtime artists and our cultural sector to the vitality of Soho and NoHo. Next slide, please. This plan is a culmination of years of extensive local and citywide stakeholder engagement, which traces its start to a 2015 joint letter from Borough President Gail Brewer and Council Member Margaret Chen calling on the department to fix the existing unfair and broken zoning. Initial research by our three offices led to the 2019 Envision Soho NoHo community engagement effort, which was jointly sponsored by the Borough President the council member and DCP, and a final report with recommendations that laid out the important foundation of our proposal. Next slide, please. As many noted during our numerous in-person and virtual engagement events, SOHO and NOHO are significantly constrained and hampered by the outdated 50-year-old zoning created in 1971 for a very different SOHO, NOHO, and New York City. Current, current zoning does not allow new housing without special permission, has no affordability requirements for residential development, and severely restricts the use of ground floors to industrial uses. As such, this restrictive regime has resulted in extremely limited housing options that exclude moderate and low-income New Yorkers, increases pressure on surrounding neighborhoods and less protected areas, contributes to storefront vacancies, and disproportionately burden smaller business owners who often lack the resources and capacity to navigate land use and environmental review processes, leaving them therefore at a disadvantage. While current zoning recognizes artists live work as a legal use, known as Joint Living Work Quarters for Artists or JLWQA, it is really important to remember that these homes are not income restricted and also that no provisions exist to ensure the long-term vitality of the local cultural community. Moreover, while this artist-only restriction runs contrary to our fair housing principle as outlined in where we live, it also creates real challenges as there are limited legal options to rent or sell units. Additionally, in an area defined by its iconic cast iron lofts, the existing zoning does not have controls on building form and heights that reflect this important architectural context. The photos on the screen offer several examples of out of character buildings 
that were developed pursuant to the existing M15A and M15B zoning regulations. Our proposal will change that. Next slide. I want to highlight that under the existing zoning, Soho and NoHo have lagged most communities in the city in providing housing for New Yorkers, as this map illustrates. In fact, Soho and NoHo have become among the wealthiest and the least diverse neighborhoods in the city. 40% of Soho and NoHo households earn $200,000 or more a year, compared to the city's annual median income of $64,000 annually for a household. While 73% of people living in Soho and NoHo identify as Y, just 33% of New York City residents so identify. At this moment in history, as we seek to fully recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, and as we work to build a fairer and more inclusive New York City, allowing land use rules that serve as barriers to a diverse, equitable, and economically healthy Soho and NoHo is, to put it bluntly, just unacceptable. We believe it is time to establish a new plan for an evolved local economy that is no longer industrial, but rather defined by office, retail, and creative sectors. In a city that is home to 8.8 .8 million people, one million more than we had in 1970. The proposal will bring an estimated 3,500 homes to Soho and Noho. A quarter of the new housing, or about 900 units, will be permanently affordable enough for some 1,800 New Yorkers of low and moderate income. This is especially meaningful because there is no income restricted affordable housing in Soho and NoHo today. Now, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Sylvia Lee, who has expertly managed this essential proposal and who's going to walk you through the important equity focused details. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, good afternoon. Um, Chairs Moyan Salamanca, Council Members Chen and Rivera, and members of the sub Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. Uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, next slide, please. So to achieve this vision of diverse and resilient Soho and NoHo that Anita Anita laid out, we are proposing a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment. Um, as I'll spell out in greater detail in the following slides, the two actions work together to allow housing, mandate affordability, provide direct support for the arts, remove barriers for businesses while addressing quality of life, and establish urban design controls so that growth can be both equitable and contextual. Next slide. First on uses. Um, so overall, the proposed paired manufacturing and residential districts means that the zoning will finally reflect the fact that Soho NoHo are dynamic mixed-use neighborhoods. Light manufacturing use will continue to be permitted uh, as they are today, including no changes to provisions related to existing joint living workers of artists, JLWQA, if you are a certified artist residing in JLWQA today, you can continue to live and work as you always have. In addition to JLWQA, as Anita pointed out, uh, importantly, the proposal will allow housing for everyone for the first time in Soho and NoHo, and affordable housing would be mandated. I'll spend a little more time on these two components, JLWQA and MIH, after this slide. Um, the full suite of community facility and culture uses would also be permitted as of right. Additionally, a, full, a wider range of job generating uses, such as office and retail, would be permitted in a manner that is consistent with many mixed use communities in our city. This is also a long overdue recognition of Soho NoHo's economic contribution as a major retail district and hub for commerce for the city and the region. Here, I'll highlight that in its approval, the City Planning Commission added scrutiny for larger stores over 25,000 square feet in response to concerns raised by local communities around retail loading activities conflicting with residents and other users of our streets and sidewalks. We think that this added chairperson certification review process with coordinated DOT and uh, city planning review will help balance the quality of life considerations and the need for greater zoning flexibility that supports a dynamic local economy. 
Beyond zoning, I'll just note that we're continuing discussions with other city agencies and local stakeholders about additional long-term strategies. Um, that includes how the departments of sanitation and transportation can leverage broader initiatives to address local concerns. Happy to talk more about that during the Q&A. Thanks. Next slide. Um, a bit more detail on MIH. Um, as Anita noted, paired with allowing housing for the first time, the plan also ushers in one of the city's largest mandatory inclusionary housing area and in the heart of lower Manhattan. We're taking this opportunity to apply the most progressive program of its kind in the nation and leverage the strong market to deliver permanently affordable housing on private sites without the need for public subsidy. MIH options one and two are proposed, requiring 25 to 30 percent of new housing to be set aside for income restricted, permanently affordable homes in new developments, conversions, as well as enlargements. As the council is familiar, 60 and 80 percent AMIs um, are just the average. Both options of the MIH are designed to serve a range of low and moderate income levels, um, as low as 40% AMIs in option one, for example, which means that a qualifying family of three would earn less than $43,000 a year, about a third of the median household income in Soho and NoHo today. I'll note that the proposal also includes two targeted adjustments to the standard MIH provisions so that the program further ensures that we fully capitalize on the affordable housing potential here. Next slide. For those who currently live in rent regulated housing in Soho and NoHo, as Anita said, strong and existing tenant protection laws and programs will continue to govern. As summarized on the slide, the 2019 reforms to relevant laws significantly strengthened tenant protections and restricted the ability of landlords to raise rents on stabilized units or remove them from rent stabilization, stabilization program. Um, here, just a side note, I'll also mention that the vast majority, close to 90% of the buildings with rent regulated units in Soho NoHo, based on HPD's research, sits within historic districts. And since any changes to these buildings will also continue to require LPC approval and oversight, tenants in these buildings also enjoy an additional layer of protection. On top of all that, my colleagues at HPD on the panel can speak more at the Q&A about their ongoing efforts on tenant outreach, education, and legal services the city provides as part of the neighborhood planning process um, later. Next slide. So moving on to the JLWQA um, and the Arts Fund. Um, as mentioned earlier, the plan retains allowance for existing joint living work quarters for artists while introducing a new mechanism to directly support the arts in Soho, Noho, and surrounding neighborhoods. We understand that this is an issue that is important and personal to a lot of people currently living in the neighborhoods today, including the artists who helped transform the neighborhoods decades ago. Drawing from recommendations for, from the Envision Soho engagement effort, um, which are twofold. Um, one, the new zoning should reinforce the arts legacy in Soho NoHo. And two, it also needs to allow occupancies beyond certified artists. Um, so we come up with a proposal that addresses both of these um, facets by providing much needed optionality along with a Soho NoHo Arts Fund. As laid out on this slide, uh, existing JLWQAs can remain as they are. This means artists residing in JLWQAs today can continue to do so, and the space can be sold or rented later to certified artists as well. That doesn't change. Alternatively, on a voluntary basis, these spaces can also be converted from JLWQA to residential use with a contribution to an arts fund. This essentially means that in exchange for lifting the artist's only restriction currently present on the JLWQA, the arts fund would be available for publicly oriented arts and culture programming and spaces. Here, I'll want to emphasize that our proposal does not take away the ability, again, for current residents to continue living in Soho NoHo. It simply expands the range of legal options available to them when they make their plans for the future. Next slide. So what can the Arts Fund accomplish? Um, it will support and strengthen public presence of the arts in Soho, NoHo and around. 
and provide opportunities to invest in historically disadvantaged communities um, near the Soho Noho neighborhood as well. The fund could also provide uh, could provide financial support for artists, arts collectives, cultural nonprofits to pursue projects and partake in preserving, upgrading, expanding, and acquiring cultural spaces, including studio and exhibition spaces for local artists. Again, we are very excited that the rezoning provides an opportunity to build upon what we have in Soho Noho and do more for the arts. In terms of funding allocation and what can be used um, specifically, I'll note that most of the fund's details exist outside of zoning, and we're looking forward to fleshing them out with the City Council. DCLA Commissioner Gonzalo Casal is here to answer questions about opportunities and potential at administration, um, administrative structure of the Arts Fund. Uh, next slide. Last but not least, um, on density and urban design. Um, importantly, as Anita alluded to, unlike the existing zoning, which does not have height limits, the proposed zoning imposes height limits and contextual building envelopes to Soho Noho, limiting the size of new developments and requiring that they reflect the loft-like historic character. The proposal also recognized the fact that Soho Noho are not uniform in terms of their built character, allowing different building heights and sizes in different parts of Soho Noho. As the, part, uh, as the map shows, allowable density in historic cores and corridors shown in pink and blue here um, are lower, consistent with many of the historic buildings found in these areas. Densities in the opportunity areas shown in yellow, which are largely outside of historic districts and framed by major corridors such as Canal Street, Sixth Avenue and Bowery would be increased in a manner that responds to the surrounding context and is commensurate with the area's potential. As you can see on the chart, the density levels are calibrated to provide robust allowance to support a dynamic mix of uses while also putting our thumb on the scale for housing. I'll highlight that the residential allowance in the plan has always been higher than it is for uh, commercial development. Even so, during ULURP, we heard loud and clear that there is a strong desire to favor even more residential. And as a result, the CPC further lowered the permissible uh, commercial density along Bowery and um, Canal Street in the Southeastern um, study area. Lastly, I want to reiterate that the majority, over 80% of the rezoning area, is within and protected by six his city historic districts. The city's LPC's oversight within historic district will not change. Next slide. We believe that the sensible contextual zoning, along with LPC review, strong tenant laws and protection programs will work in unison to ensure that these two historic neighborhoods accommodate growth in a manner that is equitable and responsive to neighborhood character. Um, this is a sketch that shows the pedestrian view of one of the opportunity areas, showing exciting and new buildings coexist in a way that complement um, the historic uh, context of the neighborhood. Next slide. So before I wrap up, I'll note that this is this neighborhood plan is a coordinated uh, interagency effort involving many agencies, and some of them are present on the panel today. Um, thank you again for your consideration and the time for uh, letting us walking you through at a high level our proposal. Um, we're looking forward to hear from you um, and your questions, priorities, and concerns throughout um, the City Council review. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions just before uh, I turn it over to my colleagues here. Uh, dealing specifically with the retail, uh, the proposal allows unlimited uh, retail as of right. Uh, why does the DCP believe that uh, the very large format retail is a good uh, economic strategy for Soho? And shouldn't we be focusing in uh, more on the higher wage economic development strategies? Um, thank you very much for your question. Um, so I, I guess I can address the question in, in two from from two parts. Um, one is, you know, we see Soho Noho um, from an economic development perspective as really critical uh, retail center um, effect global destination um, that 
you know, contributes to our city's economy um, significantly. Um, that involves uh, job opportunities as well as, you know, tax uh, taxes for the city to provide services. Um, you know, I'll note that anecdotally, we've heard that um, the retail sector um, include, especially the larger retail stores, provides opportunities for upward mobility in terms of jobs. Um, and, and those are important economic opportunities that we strengthen and reinforce in Soho NoHo. They're present today. Um, I think our goal is to make sure that retail sector continues to be a major provider of jobs um, in Soho NoHo in the future and for our city. Um, I, I, you know, we, we certainly understand that um, there have been a lot of concerns related to larger retail stores, you know, loading, unloading activities being, you know, a, a source of disru disruption for residents, especially, especially during nighttime. Um, it also um, is maybe, you know, conflicting with pedestrian flows or other users of, of our streets and sidewalks. Um, with that in mind, um, you know, as I mentioned in the presentation, we've introduced um, additional level of review uh, together with DOT to make sure that um, you know, new larger retail establishments incorporate appropriate loading plan and strategies to, to mitigate some of those um, negative impact um, that they may have on the, on the neighborhood. Um, I'll know that you know, one other source of disruption, um, not you know, limited to uh, larger retail stores, but also retail and office uses in general is, you know, kind of the, 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 the issue related to truck traffic, um, you know, that come with a uh, garbage pickup. Uh, we understand that, you know, as part of the rollout for the commercial waste zone that sanitation is, is implementing and looking to implement, you know, it will bring down the, the carting companies going through the neighborhood from um, some 49 to three um, really go a long way to, to reduce impact of commercial activities um, to residents. Okay. Um, commercial versus residential. Uh, how many, uh, many of the housing groups uh, have criticized the proposal because uh, you're uh, only increasing the residential FAR. Um, you're also proposing to increase the commercial FAR. Uh, because this uh, proposal has been largely framed around fair housing, uh, why uh, should we increase the commercial FAR at all? Uh, and shouldn't we stay focused uh, on the affordable housing goal? I I'll take that, um, Chair Moya. You know that the City Planning Commission did approve with modification what we think is a nuanced approach to commercial density. And we think we struck an appropriate balance between expanding housing opportunities, which you are correct was really a primary motivator here, but also reinforcing the healthy balance mix of uses in this dynamic local economy. You know, the residential densities here have always been higher than the commercial. So we believe that we really are favoring housing. Um, and we did make an adjustment though based on calls that ask us to go further to really ensure that the housing goals were achieved. So we did that. But that said, I really do have to note that we as planners have to consider the regional context for our planning work. And in that regard, we feel like we have to reinforce the strength of diversity of office space that we have in New York City for a wider range of jobs. And there are a number of jobs in this area of the city, and we believe it's very important to the city's continued vitality. So we did not want to overlook it. Um, we think this is really important as we recover and for the long term. But that was the balance that we were trying to strike. I understand that just given the fact that we are in the middle of a, of a housing crisis and there is an opportunity for us to expand the housing stock here, uh, why wouldn't we want to focus more on the housing issue? I know what you said. I just think that this is uh, an opportunity uh, that may get missed here. Uh, and sticking with housing, uh, this is the only rezoning that we have looked at that doesn't have a significant affordable housing component beyond the MIH. Um, why have you not uh, been able to advance a 100% 
uh, affordable project uh, in this neighborhood? I'll look to HPD to yep. provide that answer. I can take that question. Uh, thank you for the question, Chair Moya. Um, you know, as as we try to look for in every rezoning, we are always dependent on a mix of things, both our private partners and our and private sites to be able to generate housing, which is why bringing MIH to this neighborhood is so critical to creating more diversity and equity in Soho NoHo. But in places where we can potentially activate public sites to create affordable housing, that's something that we also prioritize as well. Unfortunately, we have not been able to secure or find public sites in this neighborhood that we can uh, that we can leverage for affordable housing. We are doing what we can certainly to talk to the uh, owners of buildings in the neighborhood, making sure that they're aware of our term sheets, that, that we are here to talk to them about what projects can look like uh, to benefit them and the community, but there just simply isn't uh, a, a wealth of public sites. I mean, uh, always good to see you, my friend, but let, 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 me, let me just say something here. Like, Describe then to me, because you just mentioned conversations with, with, with the, the property owners. So describe yeah. with me the conversations that you've had specifically with the property owners in the area to date uh, that go deeper and that will help uh, us understand um, where we can expect uh, affordable housing that is beyond MIH. Are you so saying that I there's been conversations and there's they're saying there's no ability to go beyond what uh, they're saying uh, they can do with MIH? No, I'm not saying that, sir. So we've, at the beginning of this rezoning and then throughout, there've been multiple roundtables uh, and individual conversations with property owners. Most recently, we did another round reaching out to projected, uh, the owners of projected sites and we also have taken recommendations or any, any possible lead. So we've sat down with owners, we've laid out in detail what our ability is to work with them to develop affordable housing. And I think that honestly and fairly, they are looking to know where the rezoning will ultimately go before making for them our critical business decisions. Most of the people in the development world understand that we go out of our way to make sure that when we're building 100% affordable, that our term sheets are, are built for that. So. I, I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, so, but basically you're saying, no, that the conversations you've had with all of the property owners, no one has said that they're willing to go beyond MIH, correct? I think that there's interest, but at this point, they're still waiting for more information. Okay, so no, right? That, I just want to get clear that all the conversations have been is nothing beyond MIH, correct? Currently, we don't have a, a committed project. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, can you explain what the planning rationale is for the rezoning uh, on the north side of Canal Street, but uh, not on the south side of Canal Street? I know you touched upon it a little bit in your presentation, but can you just uh, talk a little bit about that, please? Um, I Thanks for the question. I, if, if I understand correctly, it's about the sort of the boundary um, yep. to focus on north of Canal yep. Street. Um, so the the you know as as mentioned in the presentation, I think the way we've um, looked at the area is you know we the, the primary goal is to update the the significantly outdated manufacturing zoning that is unique to the Soho neighborhoods, the M15A and M15B districts. And, and north of Canal Street is sort of where the boundary ends on the, on the southern um, end of the, the existing zoning district we want to update. Okay. Uh, what investments is the administration proposing to make to ensure that mm -hmm. uh, this is a neighborhood plan and not just uh, a rezoning? This is, uh, I will point out that this is a unique among our neighborhood plans uh, rezoning in that it is a very um, well serviced and regarded community. It has significant access to transit and services and it has very robust property values. Uh, it has not as, as a neighborhood or neighborhoods experienced 
the sort of disinvestment or hardship that many of the communities in upper Manhattan and in our outer boroughs have experienced over the decades. And, and as a consequence, we really did not approach this in the same way that we did our other neighborhood plans. Uh, equity here really means expanding housing access and choice, eliminating the onerous regulations that we have here and making targeted improvements to these two neighborhoods to make them more livable and to serve more New Yorkers. But we did not view this neighborhood as one that required the significant kinds of uh, infrastructure investments that the others for the reasons that I just stated. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just got a couple of more questions, just two more questions, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about uh, how the open restaurants uh, will work in neighborhoods in Manhattan, especially. Um, Soho pre-pandemic has some of the highest pedestrian counts anywhere in New York City. Can you help us understand uh, which streets the administration uh, believes are suitable for open restaurants in Soho? Um, that's a great question. And I, you know, I think that, um, you know, consistent with sort of the, the overall framework uh, proposed under, you know, the open restaurant proposal, I think we believe that, you know, many of our streets, um, as long as they meet, you know, the, the necessary circulation path and clear path requirements, we think they, you know, at Soho Noho are so dynamic um, as a com commercial area um, on, the, on the lower levels of, of buildings, at least on many of the streets. We think that as long as the, the circulation requirements are met, you know, a lot of them can be you know, suitable um, locations for, for restaurants, um, as far as restaurants are, are viable um, businesses in, in Soho Noho. And I think, you know, kind of eliminating zoning barriers for that is, is, is um, you know, what we're doing here. Um, but in terms of, you know, specifically what corridors are, are you know, where we see more of a concentration today. I, I you know, West Broadway is, is an example where you have, you know, wider sidewalks where um, there are, you know, more opportunities that people are already taking advantage today. Okay, thank you. And my, my last question here. Uh, this rezoning will preserve the uh, JLWQAs uh, that have been allowed uh, in the Soho Noho neighborhood to help artists uh, live in their workspace in manufacturing buildings. Uh, however, we have often seen that these units are more often than not uh, luxury penthouses that uh, are owned by the uber wealthy. Uh, a few years ago, uh, John Bon Jovi sold his Soho penthouse for almost $40 million. Uh, clearly, this is not a live workspace. Uh, what is being put in place to make sure that uh, we are not simply granting the uh, uber wealthy an exemption uh, and that we are actually helping working artists utilize uh, the workspaces. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Maria, for that question. Um, so this is, you know, obviously a complex issue. What I will note is that I think the occupancies over the years, you know, since the establishment of, of JLDBQ as illegal use has, you know, really evolved to include a variety of, of you know, um, types of residents. There are still, you know, long-term artists that are aging in place and using their homes as, as live workspace, right? And then there are examples you were mentioning that are sort of you know, operating in, in sort of a gray area. Um, and, and what we are proposing is, you know, kind of addressing those variety in the uh, Soho Noho today, you know, by one, you know, continuing to allow existing artists to continue to occupy their live workspace and utilize that. Um, and, and then at the same time, you know, creating this arts fund mechanism so that folks that actually are not artists or, intend to sell to, to, to people, folks that are not artists um, can, you know, contribute back by paying into the arts fund and, and, and kind of link that with um, ongoing support for the cultural community in Soho Noho. That, that is important. Um, I, I know that I'm aware of the, the legislation that was introduced, that, that was recently introduced by um, the council member, and, and we 
for greater import enforcement around existing JLWQA's rule rules. Um, it's it's fairly recent. It's it's premature for me to speak to the, the legislation directly and specifically, but certainly we understand where the council member is coming from and 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 are actively reviewing. Um, so what I can say at this moment is that the issue of enforcement, you know, really highlights this. Uh, the the problem that I mentioned that we're trying to solve here um, in the proposal. Um, so just really quick. Uh, so so uh, who's responsible for regulating that, and what are the penalties for those that are exploiting the loopholes? Um, in the you know as with any sort of um, zoning regulations, um, Department of Buildings is sort of the enforcer of zoning regulations, right? And so. I don't want to misspeak, but but I think my understanding is is that um, the if the zoning proposal is approved and adopted, um, there will be a coordinated interagency effort, you know, um, facilitated by a chairperson certification. If you're asking about the artist, the the arts fund conversion mechanism, it will be a chairperson certification facilitated by the Department of City Planning, coordinating with DCLA to make sure that you know how much. Um, ours fund is required and then certifying with the buildings department to kind of um, uh, effectuate the conversion. Um, understand that, you know, obviously enforcement and, and legislative pro uh, administrative process, a lot of them exist beyond zoning and, and we're, you know, here to continue so, working. So we don't, we don't have anyone from the Department of Buildings uh, on this? We don't have them on the panel today, um, but we've had extensive conversation with the de de buildings department um, throughout the proposal development, and we'll have we're happy to follow up with any specifics. Um, that would be that would be great. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's it for me. I, I now want to turn it over to my colleagues, and I would uh, like to turn it over to Council Member Chin uh, for questions. Thank you, Chair Moya. Thank you uh, to oh, the committee sorry, member. Yep, just, oh. I, they just set, set the clock, so you can start right now. It's fine. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, follow up on your question uh, because I did introduce re legislation about increasing the fine. Right now, the fine is only $1,250. And that's why we have all these illegal sales going on for multi-million dollars. And they're not contributing anything back to the community. And then that's why we have this art fund. I mean, we're open, you know, to hearing from the community. You know, some of them think the art fund requirement is too high. I mean, it's negotiable. But right now, the way it is, the fine is too little. It's not enough enforcement. And my legislation will increase that fine to start with at least $15,000 and up. And hopefully that will deter some of the sales because the sales are going on for more than $2,000 a square feet, according to the market. And we do want to preserve uh, these JLWQA for artists. And that's really important. Uh, my question is that I, I wanted to uh, ask, uh, you know, DCP, right? Because you're talking about um, the conversion. Why aren't you thinking about expanding uh, the definition of artists? Because right now the definition is very limited. So was there any thought about, you know, increasing uh, and broaden the definition rather than just allowing convert conversion to use group two for residential? Um, thank you, Council Member, for your question. Um, so I, I think for on the kind of the regulation um, and administration sort of note the a change of definition of, of certified artists would require um, uh, changes to the multiple dwelling law, which is a state legislation. So it, it, this is not something that it's, you know, can be done through zoning. So that's just kind of a, um, a regulatory background. Um, but in kind of zooming back a little bit to, to taking a step back to look at, you know, the, the, where the concerns are and, and where they're coming from and, and why there is this call for a broadening, you know, kind of artist certification and definition of that, you know, we, we, if it's about, you know, making sure that the new zoning doesn't harm existing artists um, and continues to accommodate live work, uh, I think the, the proposal that we put in front of you already does that. 
um, you know, exist, as you know, existing artists, JLWQAs may remain. Um, and I think there is the, the definition of certified artists in the existing JLWQA program that will continue to facilitate that uh, into the future. Um, and other units, including those in new buildings and also converted from JLWQA to, to residential units, those have expanded home occupation provi provisions that will continue to accommodate live work, which we know that you know goes beyond just mm -hmm. artists as narrowly defined, right? It is a something is something that people um, in the neighborhood wants, and I think that's what the new zoning also accommodates. Um, oh, okay. Not only in the form of JLWQA, but also in new residential units, even though they're called you know uh, res residential use. But we introduce you know uh, regulations to accommodate you know a wider range of of live work arrangements, make them more accessible too. Um, and and so I, and I I think another you know side consideration that we've we've um, you know kind of um, taken into account is you know our goals for Soho NoHo um, are centered around kind of increasing access to a broad range of people right I, I think further limiting um, a certain type of space to only artists however that's just defined sort of runs contrary to, to that overall goal. And I, I think our okay. we want to focus on more publicly oriented arts and culture programming, which is what the Arts Fund would do. Okay. Um, H, a question for HPD. Can you elaborate more on the outreach that HPD is doing in terms of, you know, around the rezoning to let tenant knows and, and landlord know uh, what's coming up, what programs are in place to protect tenant, what programs are available? to landlords, can you elaborate more on, on the outreach that HPD has been doing? Yes, absolutely. So I'll, I'll start off with the owner outreach, um, just to piggyback on earlier comments. So prior to, um, in the early conversations, there were round tables with both residents and owners about what the rezoning would look like and what HPD would, be, would have as far as tools to be able to develop affordable housing. And since then, uh, either owners have reached out to us or we initiated proactive outreach to owners uh, to sit down with them and talk about our various programs. Most recently, we did uh, another full round throughout uh, the projected development sites, met with uh, owners and their respective real estate teams to lay out what our programs are, how it would uh, be useful for the, a proposed development based on what the projected uh, zoning could look like, and then start to discuss what the next steps would be. As you can imagine, that you know, development projects take years, and these and some of them are still in the early stages of figuring out whether or not this is appropriate for their site. So we we have made it our job to check in with them uh, and continue to engage to get them to a place where they would want to work with us to do more than MIH. On the tenant side, you know, the city has a robust outreach and support program around uh, protecting tenants, letting them know their rights. Most recently in this neighborhood, HPD partnered with the city's tenant support unit to perform door knocking uh, at, at buildings with the highest concentration of rent stabilized uh, units and units with low income seniors. So, you know, in the first round, uh, and we'll, actually, we did two rounds of knocking across 13 buildings in late October, and we were able to successfully contact 70 tenants, some of which uh, took advantage of free legal services that the city provides. Uh, for those that we could not reach, we left flyers and leave behinds that explained how they can get in contact with us. And then, you know, taking a step back, the city uh, has consistent advertising and um, publication of both the tenant help desk uh, helpline that's being run by the mayor's office of tenants, plus our right to counsel advertising that we do almost in every neighborhood. This way, people know that we're here to help them. Um, we would absolutely be open to talking about doing more outreach. We'd have to bring in our other partners to the table, but we do think that this is a critical part of how we help protect tenants. What, what about the small landlords, the tenement building landlords or landlord who lo owns loft units? Are there, you know, discussion with HPD in terms of what program resources available to them to help them preserve their buildings? You know, we, we definitely have had conversations in this area. You know, we, both from either, you know, 
from new development or preservation, we have had some conversations, but we could probably do more, I'm sure. Um, I can't think of a, a specific example yet, so let me come back to you, but it's something we can certainly do, we can look at as a, a, a next step of the phase two of outreach on the ownership side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Chen. I'm going to now turn it over to Council Member uh, Rivera. Time starts now. Hi, good morning, everyone. I know there are a lot of people hoping to speak today, so I will be as concise as possible with my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for asking uh, important questions around commercial FAR, affordable housing, property owner outreach, and even outdoor dining, and of course, the council member Chin. Uh, so I guess I'll start with, uh, we want this project to create affordable housing. So we all know lowering FARs was essential, but we also want to limit dorm uses and allow for any commercial building to go through adaptive reuse to residential regardless of size. How can we eliminate adaptive reuse thresholds in this plan? Um, thank you, Council Member Rivera. I, I will try to address that. Um, so, I, and I think, you know, those are important issues that you raise, including, you know, kind of issues around dorm and, and, and a commercial FAR. And, you know, I think it, they really get at the core issue of what is the balance, you know, between the, the variety of planning goals and, and our um, housing goal here, right? So I think we are here in, in, in front of you and, and we look forward to continue working with you on addressing some of your concerns. And I, I, I believe that there are, you know, there, there is leeway for um, council to make certain adjustments and, and we're um, here to work with you. Okay, um, we'll certainly follow up on that. What is the current cost to a developer to pay into the affordable housing fund in a place like Soho Noho, shouldn't the cost be higher than in other rezoning areas because of higher market prices? Um, sorry, I can, sorry, sorry, I can I, take I, that. I okay, good. Thanks. <laughs> sorry, I can take that question. So the currently what we uh, predict the affordable. So the affordable housing fund is a number uh, that is created as a means to ensure that whatever is being paid for would equate to creating affordable housing uh, uh, for that neighborhood. So we think based on the current fee structure, which is uh, adjusted um, annually. So it's a one thousand and seventy dollars per square foot until June thirtieth, twenty twenty two. Developer would need to pay about four to eight million dollars in fees. Uh, that money would go a long way toward HPD creating a hundred percent affordable housing. But you know, due, due to that cost, we find that um, more often than not, actually a hundred percent of the MIH buildings have not used the fee and built housing on site. But to your question specifically, we think a developer would need to pay around four to eight million dollars in fees. And um, mm -hmm. council member, I would just add that we, for legal reasons, don't have the ability to target the amount that is required based on the neighborhood in which um, the, the, the development would, would be occurring. So this is the citywide. Uh, number. It's a very significant number, though. Uh -huh. Understood. Um, well, there are concerns that have been brought up regarding tenant protections currently living in affordable units in the proposed area. I know my colleagues have brought this up. So what is the city uh, proposing to do actually to increase these protections in addition to the current city and state protection laws in order to avoid displacement? And I can take that question. So I think what we've been certainly doing more of is trying to, to flex and leverage the tenant support unit. We're trying to, as the expansion of Right to Council and other resources, including with the creation of the Mayor's Office of Protect Tenants, new partnerships and cross uh, agency task forces to try to target those neighborhoods that need greater protections. Uh, we've talked to the mayor's office of protect tenants about things that we can do in Soho NoHo and initiatives. We'd love to talk to you more about that for sure. Um, but we are definitely in a new place with a centralized uh, mayor's office to help us where we are bringing 
DOB, we are bringing, we are working with our state partners to do more. This latest round of outreach to rent stabilized buildings, I think, is an example of something that has been successful and we can certainly talk about doing more, especially with regards to ensuring that we have the right language access uh, with us when we go out and knock on doors. Of course, it's very, it's very disappointing to not have anyone from LPC at this hearing. Um, what is LPC's position on this or when can we expect their input? I know I'm looking forward to meeting with them. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Council Member. You know, LPC has been That's involved fine. with rezoning since its very start. Uh, they were aware of and participated in planning conversations ever since we were working on Envision Solo Novo. They reviewed and had input in the historic resources chapter of the EIS that we did for this rezoning. And it's really important to note that over 85% of the study area here uh, is in uh, landmark districts and uh, will remain within these districts, meaning that all development, enlargement, and demolition will be subject to LBC review. Um, you know, many projects in this area have come to the City Planning Commission and the City Council for heightened setback waivers because the existing bulk regulations here don't allow the base height and building form that LPC would approve for modifications to those buildings. And the proposal that we have in front of us considers how LPC review interacts with zoning and includes provisions to facilitate the cornice alignment that they think is important to address this exact issue. Um, historic preservation and equitable growth are not mutually exclusive at all. As a city, we must stand by the idea that the city will change and that change can coexist with historic architecture like many cities around the world. And we will continue to work with LPC throughout this process. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. There's one thing that I failed to mention when I spoke about the tenant protections. Uh, you know, as and it gives me an opportunity to acknowledge the work of the council too. So certificate of no harassment had recently passed the council. The pilot has been extended. And I just want to be very clear that that pilot extends to Soho No. So uh, that is a huge uh, is a huge way for us to uh, have a tool at fighting harassment in places where developments are proposed. Well, thank you. And I just asked y'all to be a little like public about appropriately public about the campaign so people know the work that you're doing. And Mr. Chair, if I could just add um, that we have an opportunity to to improve the proposal and I urge the administration to continue having the hard conversations with good faith community representatives like the Noho Bowery stakeholders like Cooper Square Committee, they're organizations that have come to the table with constructive forward focused feedback that's going to allow us to ensure this rezoning does what it is in intended to do and further i've asked the administration to proactively reach out to potential partners in the creation of affordable housing and i know you mentioned language access but also make sure that there's a cultural humility in their current and ongoing tenant outreach and communication so thank you for being here for your testimony for answering my question and i know we have a few to follow up with and thank you mr chair for the time Thank you, Council uh, Member Rivera. Uh, council, uh, do we have any other council members that have any questions for this panel? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, seeing that there are no uh, further questions, uh, this panel is now excused. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony today. Um, council, if you can, please uh, call the next panel. Uh, Chair, the first panel will include uh, Christopher Marte, uh, Deborah Glick, Benjamin Wessler, and Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Okay, we're going to start with uh, Assembly Member Glick, uh, the Borough President, and then uh, with uh, Mr. Marte. Starts now. Uh, uh, Assemblywoman Glick. Yes. Good to I'm see here. you. 
It's lovely to see you. I'm just gonna make you stop for a second. If we can get the sergeant at arms to reset the clock, please. And um, how much time don't I have? <laughs> you have two minutes, but we can give you some time. Don't worry about it. All right. Um, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to speak before you. And these communities, Soho, NoHo, are communities I have represented for 30 years. Uh, I've extended uh, a, I have an extensive written testimony, but let me try to summarize. But this proposal is a knife at the heart of these communities, so it's very hard to get everything in in two minutes. And the ostensible reason for the dramatic zoning ch change is to add more affordable housing, even though the incentives for larger commercial development are a key part of the rezoning. Uh, we've heard how they are actually doubling. Right now, it's limited to 10,000 square feet for retail. They're more than doubling it. This is an invitation for big box retail. Um, the uh, MIH, I didn't say it, but Samuel Stein wrote in the Journal of Urban Affairs that zoning changes with MIH and ZD QA have only further exacerbated affordable housing issues by causing real estate speculation in anticipation, anticipation of the zoning change. And as you know, speculation has significant displacement in much of the city. Uh, I'm concerned that the oft-repeated and completely erroneous notion that these neighborhoods are filled with only rich people belies the reality of the working and middle-class residents who have long called these neighborhoods home. Yeah, there are wealthy property owners, but the majority of people who actually live in the community are average New Yorkers. As far as the uh, department's protestation that rent regulations can protect artists, the big loophole is the right for buildings to be demolished, even if there are rent regulated people living there. And so I'm don't worry about it, uh, assembly member. This, this proposal actually puts at risk rent regulated tenants. And the issue for artists is that they cannot live in residential zones because of the processes and materials that they use to create their art is antithetical to the housing code that exists for residential areas. They say they haven't dropped the JLWQA, but there was a little bit of a hint in there that said certified artists. The city has long ignored and rarely certifies artists. This goes back to Ed Koch. So they stopped protecting the area for artists. They stopped certifying artists to a large extent. And the rules are clearly li to limit who can actually be certified. So uh, with all due respect uh, to council member Chin, it's not clear who gets fined. Is it the landlord or is it a tenant who doesn't have the actual documentation that's undefined in, the le in her legislation? So it could put people actually at risk for eviction. Um, let me just jump quickly uh, to the plan, the plan that they have said for affordable housing. This plan is thousands, thousands of luxury apartments. And they've said they've had conversations and nobody's really interested and there's nothing in the area that's city owned. But two, ha um, Howard Street is a federally controlled parking lot. And the city has done nothing to further the conversations with the feds where we could get 100% affordable housing at that location. It is community board two that has entered into those discussions and tried to push it forward. And I appreciate uh, council member Rivera bringing up uh, dormitories. There's no bar to dormitories in this and NYU has always looked to expand. So let me just conclude by saying that the heights that would be allowed are far in excess and LPC can do nothing about heights. The opportunity programs uh, zones on the corners of these uh, areas border 
areas that are already under real estate stress. Chinatown, East Village, and this, has, this will only exacerbate the pressure on those communities for displacement. Now, if I thought that this would get more diversity and more affordable housing, I could be supportive if I was sure that JLWQA, artists, and rent-regulated folks were protected. But this is a plan for thousands of luxury units, an audacious giveaway to luxury development, guaranteeing a less diverse and more wealthy enclave while undermining an important and existing arts community. And it's completely contrary to their rhetoric. The arts fund, they can't even tell you who would be eligible for it. It's about getting rid of artists, but having some sort of dollars for arts programs that nobody can in fact discuss with you. So I urge a no vote on the plan as it's currently constructed, uh, particularly in the waning days of the most unpopular mayoralty that, this, that exists in my memory. So um, I appreciate uh, the extra time. Um, I, as I said, there's a very extensive written document uh, and I urge you or your staff to take a look at it. And I thank you for your courtesy. Thank you, always good to see you, Assemblywoman Glick, uh, I hope all is well. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, I am now going to move to uh, Senator Hoylman. Time starts now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's good to see you and your colleagues um, and my colleagues uh, at, here at this important hearing. Uh, I'll be brief. I'm going to submit testimony, um, but I wanted to let you know, Mr. Chair, that back in September, uh, I signed on to testimony from Congressman Nadler where uh, we stated that we were hopeful that the commission would go back uh, to complete the work of crafting a proposal that could generate broad agreement. Unfortunately, that just has not happened. And the concerns that I had back in September um, sadly remain today. I'll just summarize them. Um, as we've heard uh, from uh, Assembly Member Glick, the plan has almost no guarantee of affordable housing. Um, it allows for construction of mixed use buildings that would occupy the entire allowable FAR. And so long as the residential portion occupies less than 25,000 square feet, wouldn't require any affordable housing. Uh, this loophole threatens to undermine much of the proposal's uh, promise uh, and its main central selling point to the community, uh, which is surely not a guarantee of the construction of additional affordable housing and instead allows, again, as my colleagues have expressed, fully market rate buildings if they have mixed uses. Secondly, despite the use of MIH, the plan relies heavily on the demolition and replacement of buildings that currently house rent regulated residents to generate additional housing. This puts families dependent on the protections of joint live work quarters for artists or law, law units at risk of being evicted from buildings that are prime sites for demolition and reconstruction. We have to think of the folks who live there now. I'm concerned that some of the current residents of JLWQA units may also face harassment under this proposed plan. There are some I, current I, artists I, that may use loud or hazardous materials that's gonna subject them to harassment from their homes as well uh, as units around them. Um, third, the broad upzoning of an established and well-functioning historic district may be without precedent in the city. This administration is shifting responsibility for housing preservation to historic preservation while actively encouraging developers to harass and evict rent regulated tenants. It appears the outgoing administration is trying to box the LPC into a policy making role by forcing the commission to weigh in on issues such as housing priorities. This is deeply concerning and takes the LPC outside of its purview. The LPC has continuously allowed the facade of a building to be preserved while the entire structure behind it is removed. If the LPC continues to allow this type of facadism, this is all but certain to result in evictions of longtime residents in this area. And fourth, finally, I continue to be uh, opposed to the plan's invitation to bring big box superstores to Soho and NoHo by allowing large scale retail 
above 10,000 square feet, the city would be subjecting neighbors to quality of life issues that are generated by such uses. And that's ironic when we're all trying to save small businesses at the same time. A blanket rezoning of this kind isn't gonna work in these neighborhoods. I'd urge the city to maintain the special permitting process for large scale retailers until a new mechanism can be identified. In conclusion, the Department of City Planning hasn't identified effective solutions to modifying the SOHO NOHO neighborhood plan. I'd encourage your subcommittee and colleagues in the council to reject the plan as it's currently proposed and attempt a fresh start in the next city administration. Thank you so much for your consideration of my comments. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to um, Christopher Marte. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairman uh, Moya, for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Christopher Marte, and I'm the council member elect for District 1. The Soho NoHo Chinatown upzoning is a flawed rezoning application, and members of this committee should vote no. We have to remember why Soho, NoHo, and Chinatown were targeted for this rezoning in the first place. Manufacturing no longer dictates the use of this area, and commercial and residential uses have been allowed through address, permits, and special provisions to be used. Today, Soho and NoHo are fully mixed use and deserve truly affordable housing, but not at the expense of overdevelopment and displacement. The planning process for this rezoning started so then we could make sure that this rezoning area reflected the current use and local needs. Facil facilitating legal residency, supporting small businesses, preserving the historic districts, and introducing contextual affordability. The plan before the council today achieves none of these goals. The art fund property owner fees will dissolute residents from converting their JLQWA apartments to use group two. Out of contest commercial FAR and expanded retail floor will only push out small businesses in favor of super big box stores. Added density in the special district will incentivize a wave of changes to the area's historic architecture and the mandatory inclusionary housing with new loopholes unique only to this rezoning will bring more luxury development for the possibility of a fraction of affordable units. Hence, why housing groups and tenant groups like Tenant Pack, Met Council on Housing, Cooper Square Committee, the Coalition to Protect Chinatown, the Lower East Side, are strongly against this plan. As the future council member of this district, I know the zoning of Soho and NoHo is out of date. The residents and small business owners of Soho and NoHo know this too. But this rezoning is not the answer. I urge council to say no and to give the communities of Soho, NoHo, and Chinatown an opportunity to actually address the zoning concerns of this area. Say no to this giveaway to developers and say no to this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, uh, for your testimony today. Uh, our next speaker. Sure, the next speaker will be Benjamin Wesley. Time starts now. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Ben Wetzler. I'm a Democratic District Leader for the 76th Assembly District in Manhattan, and I'm here to speak in support of the application. In 2015, the Obama administration released an affordable housing toolkit, which outlined policies that local governments could adopt in order to reduce rents and increase the production of new affordable housing. The very top of that list of their recommendations was reducing barriers to new construction imposed by outdated and overly prescriptive land use regulation. And it specifically cited allowing greater multifamily residential density as of right and imposing inclusionary affordable housing requirements. These are precisely the types of changes envisioned in the Soho NoHo neighborhood plan. Four years later, in the closing days of the 2020 presidential election, former President Donald Trump ended his campaign by unilaterally eliminating the affirmatively furthering fair housing regulations imposed by his predecessor and boasted that residents of the wealthiest communities in the country would now vote for him since he had, quote, ended the long running program where low income housing would invade their neighborhood. Naturally, it was a high priority for the incoming Biden administration to reverse this decision and the Build Back Better Act being negotiated with Congress right now includes billions of dollars for local governments to make these, these types of zoning reforms in their wealthiest and most exclusive neighborhoods. This is a local application, but I'm talking about national affairs precisely to remind the members of the committee how important it is to consider these decisions in context. It is too easy to say that New York is the heart of the national progressive movement and then make up excuses why the very policies that our representatives are advocating for in Washington should not be imposed in our own backyards. 
affordable housing cannot exist only in theory. It needs to actually get built. And in order for that to happen, it needs to be viable. It needs to be constructed at the scale and density needed to meet the city's needs. And it needs to have as few unnecessary hurdles as possible. I urge you to approve the application and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, do you have any other speakers? No, Chair, that was the last speaker on the panel. And I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay. Um, there being no questions uh, for this panel, the panel is now excused. The next panel will include Anthony Wong, Carter Booth, Janine Keeley, and Anita Brandt. First speaker on the panel will be Anthony Wong, followed by Carter Booth. Time starts now. Hello, uh, greetings, uh, afternoon committee members. Uh, Anthony Wong, member of uh, Community Board 2 and Board Treasurer as well. Uh, for the past 36 years, since the age of five, I've lived on Center Street, which is part of the rezoning uh, plan uh, in Chinatown. However, if uh, this plan comes to pass uh, in January, I'm going to have to tell friends that I live in Soho East, as that's what the uh, city planning has labeled the area in terms of their zoning plan. Uh, in terms of the envisioning process during that time, uh, I did make it known to the uh, organizers that the uh, group didn't reach out to the Chinatown community. Uh, they did hold one workshop, uh, which was held. And the only person who attended was my mom, only because I encouraged her to go because I was out of town. And city planning didn't hold another one. So outreach was terrible in terms of what the HPD uh, individual said in terms of outreach, they did go to different buildings, including my apartment back in October. They were passing out information regards to tenant harassment and rights, et cetera. But the material is only available in English. And the person who came was a white person who only spoke English. And in my particular building, there were several individuals who live here who are Chinese and don't speak English. So that that's, needs to be remedied. Uh, in terms of the rezoning area, FAR is too, still too high for commercial. That's been mentioned. If any re residential housing doesn't come to pass, uh, the beneficiaries of the increased uh, FAR are going to be two major property owners, Edison Properties, and also a, uh, another individual who owns several buildings on Canal Street as well as Center Street that are in contiguous with each other. So if no housing comes about, they'll be the beneficiaries commercial, luxury, et cetera. Uh, affordable housing needs to be uh, mandatory uh, for sure. And more outreach needs to be done. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker. Carter Booth to be followed by Janine Keeley. Good afternoon, Carter Booth. I'm the immediate past chair of CB2 and member of the Envision Soho Noho Advisory Group. LPC and DOB have not spoken at public meetings to address the issues repeatedly raised today. I want to address problems in four intertwined areas. First, everyone promised a clear pathway to legalization for residents who don't have a certified artist in their household in JLWQA units. It was promised during the envision process, during the plan development process, and during the Euler process. DCP delivered this plan to you without delivering a clear path. We are hearing today for the first time publicly that there's new legislation before you to penalize those non-conforming residents, yet there's no clear, complete pathway and mechanism for them to comply. Second is the conversion of JLWQA manufacturing units to residential units, which is also important for those who want to pass on their apartments to family, who are not certified or want to sell their units to a broader market of allowable occupants. No one, including DCP or DOB, has created any basic case studies of representative buildings to review the feasibility of conversion from manufacturing JLWQA to residential. It has become clear that the conversion is not reasonably practical in many buildings and is simply not possible in others because of the differences in code requirements for residential buildings. Also, this conversion is not a voluntary process as presented. Most of the units are in co-ops, and as you all know, shareholders cannot independently make decisions regarding converting individual units, and boards or landlords could also force units to convert involuntarily. Third is that if there are limited to no conversions from JLWQA to residential, there is no funding for the arts fund. 
the projected conversions from DCP are not to be believed. Finally, without the Arts Fund, little in this rezoning celebrates, sustains, or expands the artistic nature of these world-renowned arts neighborhood at a commensurate level. Arts and culture are a critical pillar to this plan and a critical element for our city to rebound I from this fight. Without solution to these intertwined problems and others highlights today, this deserves reconsideration of the implementation of this entire plan. It is fundamentally flawed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker, please. Ian Keeley to be followed by Anita Brandt. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Janine Kiley, the chair of Manhattan Community Board 2. Our board voted 36 to 1 to reject the mayor's plan to rezone Soho, NoHo, and Chinatown. And we cited six major flaws, four of which City Planning Commissioner Ann Levin highlighted as her major concerns. One, the plan fails to achieve affordable housing object objectives. As Levin said, there's too much upzoning and opportunity areas with too little affordable housing that may encourage commercial development. It promotes demolition that will drive displacement and ignores 100% affordable housing you heard of about two, at 2 Howard. Two, it fails to maintain mixed use neighborhoods that are nearly half residential. We want the, to keep the special permit for retail um, for 10,000 square foot and above and eating and drinking establishments above 5,000 square feet. This exists in nearby Tribeca and Hudson Square. This is a zoning led bailout for over leveraged retail and it hurts smaller businesses. Three, it fails to amend the jail QWA zoning. Commissioner Levin stated that the conversion fee is too high and the arts fund mechanism needs serious work. We also agree with Commissioner Levin that the rezoning undermines the integrity of historic districts. Two other areas, it fails to mitigate any of the adverse impacts identified in the EIS, and it pushes a deceiving, dece intentionally deceptive narrative. The city projects in 10 years, 26 sites will produce 20, at 25%, 465 affordable units, zero guaranteed. Any other number you hear is misleading, please don't be deceived. And finally, as my colleague pointed out, the city failed to reach out to Chinatown where 43% of the projected housing would be built. Please vote no, because you would not let this happen in your district. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Anita Brandt. Time starts now. Muted, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Am I on? All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anita Brandt, lifetime resident and business owner in NoHo. I'm also uh, chair of the community board's SoHo NoHo working group. Uh, why is it that we voted no on the mayor's plan? Uh, this plan is based on incorrect assumptions and data, and therefore it's not fixable. It incorporates massive FAR increases and requires the adoption of incompatible residential rules and regulations that will directly result in destruction, demolition, and displacement. And while the plan does not guarantee any affordable housing or adequately address other stated goals, it does guarantee huge financial gains to a few well-positioned property owners. The plan will shatter the defining historic and cultural cores of our unique NoHo Soho district and will never be replaced. It will weaken landmark laws and new construction will dominate with big, bland, familiar corporate towers. The promise of affordable housing attempts to disguise that this rezoning will in reality reduce the available affordable units. In fact, the plan renamed parts of Chinatown, East Soho, officially identified as an opportunity area and targeted for building demolition. That's the one tried and true action that allows the removal of long-term subsidized tenants. As for new housing, what the plan promises in public is taken back in loopholes buried in the small print. Please join us, CB2, in rejecting this rezoning. We should start fresh, armed with the high quality data and information uh, we have gathered, and we can do better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, 
uh, next okay. speaker. That was the last speaker on the panel, and I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, this, uh, seeing that there's no um, questions uh, for this panel, the panel is now excused. If you can please call up the next panel. Next panel will include Ben Prosky, Moses Gates, Brendan Cheney, and Cordelia Person. First speaker will be Ben, ben Prosky to be followed by Moses Gates. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the city council for holding this important hearing today. I'm Benjamin Prosky, executive director of the American Institute of Architects New York, also known as AIA New York. We represent New York City's public and private sector architects who are passionate about designing a more equitable city. We are testifying in support of the Soho NoHo neighborhood plan. The proposed rezoning of these neighborhoods represents a major step towards making our city's housing policies more equitable. While there has been a significant amount of new residential construction in the city over the last few years, these projects have primarily been built in marginalized communities in the outer boroughs. We must find ways to increase affordable housing in more centrally located and wealthier historic neighborhoods. Without new housing, rents and home prices uh, will continue to rise, making the city unaffordable for most New Yorkers. Adding thousands of units of housing, including a significant amount of affordable housing, would make one of our city's most expensive areas more affordable. As such, we strongly encourage the city to add even more housing, particularly affordable housing, to this proposal. The best way to do this is to lower the commercial floor area ratio, thereby incentivizing that housing is prioritized over offices. While we strongly believe in mixed-use neighborhoods with both housing and offices, Soho and NoHo are already good examples of mixed-use neighborhoods. What they need now is more affordable housing. We are also confident that the area's architectural landmarks will be protected by the Landmarks Preservation Commission and other agencies. If anything, by allowing more New Yorkers to live in these architecturally rich neighborhoods, the rezoning should make Soho and NoHo more architecturally accessible. It is an architect's duty to ensure that neighborhoods are open and accessible to all, I'm not inspired. only to those with means. I strongly encourage the council to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Time starts now. We'll hear from Brendan Cheney next, and then Cordelia Person. Good afternoon, my name is Brendan Cheney. I'm the Director of Policy and Communications at the New York Housing Conference. We strongly support the Soho NoHo Neighborhood Plan, which among other things would bring desperately needed affordable housing to the neighborhood. The city is facing an affordable housing and homelessness crisis. In New York City, more than 77,900 people experienced homelessness on one night last year. Nearly 1 million households are rent burdened. And by one measure, New York is the fourth most segregated city in the country. This is an unsustainable situation and every neighborhood must participate in the solution. Asking every neighborhood to be a partner in creating affordable housing and upzoning in high income neighborhoods has wide appeal. Both were recommendations of the United for Housing Coalition, a coalition led by the New York Housing Conference and joined by 90 partner organizations in New York City. The Soho NoHo neighborhood currently does not have any income restricted affordable housing and the rezoning would bring a projected 3,200 units of new desperately needed affordable housing to the neighborhood through the mandatory inclusionary housing program. Bringing affordable housing to Soho NoHo would also bring diversity to a neighborhood that is predominantly white and wealthy, working to reverse and repair our history of racial discrimination. Soho NoHo has a median income of $144,000 and 77% of residents are white and only 2% are black and 6% are Hispanic Latinx. While the affordable housing will provide tangible benefits for the people that get the housing, it will also create economic benefits to the community. Research has found that 100 units of affordable housing construction creates 230 jobs and $46 million in economic activity. And the city, state, and national economy need additional stimulus to recover from the recession. There is one change we'd like to see in the rezoning. We recommend lowering the proposed allowed commercial FAR to 2.0. We believe that the current high allowable commercial FARs will result in office buildings instead of mixed income residential. 
Changing this will still allow ground floor retail, second floor office space, and mixed use buildings. As the city's economy struggles to recover, we fight our housing and homelessness crisis. Opportunities like Soho NoHo can create um, new affordable housing, increase neighborhood diversity, unlock new tax revenue, refill the construction pipeline, and help local businesses. New York Housing Conference supports this resume. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker, please. Next speaker will be Moses Gates, to be followed by Cordelia Percy. Moses Gates first, then Cordelia Percy. Time starts now. Hi, thanks so much for allowing me to testify. Uh, my name is Moses Gates, Vice President of Housing and Neighborhood Planning at Regional Plan Association. Uh, we wholeheartedly support this rezoning as a much needed addition to affordable housing in a neighborhood with wonderful transit, excellent access to jobs, and not enough income diversity and not enough diversity overall, which this plan will help accomplish and move forward with. Um, like many other folks supporting this plan, we would like to see it a little bit more intentionally focused on promoting mixed income housing through MIH, specifically by lowering the commercial FARs to the lowest possible uh, permitted while still being in, in scope and able to pass this council. I would like to make just kind of one point um, which is that if this rezoning is rejected, the neighborhood will still change. And our choice here today is what direction will the neighborhood change in? And since 1971, there has not been another rezoning. And the development that most encompasses this static paradigm uh, is just outside the rezoning area. And I'll note that Regional Plan Association testified it should be within the scope. Um, but it's on Sullivan Street, uh, uh, between Sullivan Street and south of Spring Street, uh, 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 with the back fronting Sixth Avenue, where four 4,600 square foot single family homes uh, were developed only a few short years ago, currently valued at $12 million each in a neighborhood where the walk score is 99 out of 100 and the transit score is 100 out of 100. And that is really the choice that's facing us today. Will we move forward with Soho as a more and more exclusive area for the super wealthy to have life? Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we lost you at the last minute, but thank you, Moses, uh, for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Next and last speaker on this panel will be Cordelia Person. Time starts now. Hello, I'm Cordelia Person, the executive director of the NoHo Bid. As a member of the Envision um, Soho NoHo Advisory Group, I have uh, been deeply engaged in this process from the beginning. Everyone knows there are some real problems with the current zoning that need to be addressed. The current mismatch of zoning rules that have been patched together since our last rezoning continue to lead to the kind of problems the opposition to this plan have been complaining about. What the area needs is a coherent plan to follow to go forward. We need zoning that actually matches the current usage versus continuing with the long, cumbersome, expensive variance process that only works for certain well-financed tenants and developers. From the beginning, the NoHo Business Improvement District's goals for the rezoning center around retail use um, in our buildings. We are happy to see that the plan makes retail as of right and ends the arbitrary 10,000 square foot limit to the size of retail that makes no sense due to the size of our building floor plates. We have said since the beginning that retail is in a major flux and that property owners and retail uses need the flexibility to use their spaces as the time and trends lead them. And COVID has made only made this more true. The NoHo bid feels very strongly that we want to preserve the historic character of the district though. And we are concerned about the level of upzoning currently proposed. Others have come up with alternative zoning scenarios that we believe will allow more growth, encourage more housing, but they'll also set height limits that will not be detrimental to the character of the district. We hope the Department of City Planning will look closely at these plans and alter their current proposal and we can get this done and move the district into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. 
Uh, Chair, I believe that was the last speaker on this panel. Um, I'm Angelina Martinez Rubio taking over as subcommittee counsel. So we, I don't see any council member with council members with questions. So we'll call on the next panel. Um, and that will be Andrew Berman, Kate McClintock, Sam Moskowitz, Andrea Goldwyn. And so the first speaker is Andrew Berman, followed by Kate McClintock. Time starts now. I'm Andrew Berman representing Village Preservation and we've submitted written testimony. But I'm here today to strongly urge you to reject the mayor's Soho NoHo Chinatown rezoning plan. It's full of lies, distortions, and bald-faced giveaways to the mayor's developer donor friends who've lobbied for it, masquerading as a social justice and affordable housing plan. That's why housing and tenant groups like the Met Council on Housing and Tenants PAC strongly oppose it. It's why thousands of New Yorkers through our website alone have written city council members urging them to reject it. How exactly can one justify supporting a plan that would allow construction of over 10 million square feet of space in this small area, but only accounts for about a third of it being built? How can you justify a plan which allows giant big box chain stores of unlimited size, NYU dorms, huge office towers and hotels, and even 100% luxury condos and rentals with no affordable housing, as long as they don't exceed 25,000 square feet per zoning lot? How can you justify a plan which would likely create little or no affordable housing due to multiple loopholes, but would potentially displace hundreds of lower income tenants, disproportionately seniors, artists, and Asian Americans, and permanently destroy their rent regulated housing? A plan that would allow development up to two and a half times the size currently allowed here and the maximum legally allowable size in New York State for residential development. For the sake of these neighborhoods and all of New York City, please reject this plan. And I want to also quickly say the HPD representative mentioned how there's a $1,000 per square foot uh, cost if you don't include affordable housing. As was also mentioned by another speaker, new market rate housing in this neighborhood commands well over 2,000 square feet. So it's very clear that developers are going to choose the uh, fund option. And I also just want to mention that the development that Moses Gates referred to on Sullivan Street, that's actually not allowed by the existing zoning. That was approved by a zoning variance uh, that the city approved. Um, and it really speaks to um, the... Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker is Kate McClintock to be followed by Sam Moskowitz. Time starts now. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Kate, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. I'm Kate McClintock speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. One of the many lies upon which this rezoning proposal is based is that it's either this plan or maintain the status quo and opponents are unwilling to consider any changes to the current zoning whatsoever. This rezoning plan with its incentives for demolishing rent regulated housing, adding huge big box chain stores and oversized developments with no affordable housing is actually worse than the status quo. But there's a community alternative plan endorsed by more than a dozen local groups that calls for real change, including deeper and more broadly affordable housing, residential development with real affordable housing requirements without the massive loopholes, allowing for a wider range of retail uses without the giant big box chain stores and eating and drinking establishments, a path to legalization for non-artist residents without endangering the status and protections for artist residents, more compatible as of right uses like museums and nonprofit social services, without allowances for NYU and private university expansion. But we all oppose the destructive, unnecessary, massive upzoning the city wants, which is just a giveaway to the mayor's developer and donor friends and the oversized chain stores and NYU expansion the city's plan entails. Please join this community in implementing a real rezoning plan based on equity, fairness, and preserving the best of what we have and building upon that rather than destroying it and reject this plan. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Next speaker. Next speaker is Sam Moskowitz. Do we follow by Andrea Goldman? Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Sam Moskowitz and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. One of the many lies of this plan is that it will make these neighborhoods more diverse and affordable. It will actually make them wealthier and more expensive. And we have submitted solid documentation proving this. 
even if one ignores that the plan will result in the destruction of a considerable amount of affordable housing with low in, lower income residents, and that it will actually create little of the promised affordable housing new developments under the plan, which are 70 to 75% luxury and 25 to 30% affordable, will still be populated by wealthier people than the current neighborhood and cost more to live in. As per documentation we've provided, new market rate construction in this neighborhood commands significantly higher prices than neighborhood housing overall. The 70 to 75% of residents in market rate units in new developments can be expected to pay at least an average of $17,000 a month rent or $6.35 million per unit. This would make them considerably richer than the top 70 to 75% of income earners currently in the neighborhood and paying higher housing costs. But even the 25 to 30% in the so-called affordable units will be wealthier and paying higher rents than the last wealthy 25 to 30% of current residents. The incomes required for those units are considerably higher than the average income of the 25 to 30% least well-off current residents of the rezoning area. A vote for this plan is a vote for a richer and more expensive neighborhood. We urge you to vote no. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, speaker and the last one on this panel is Andrea Goldwyn. Time starts now. Good day, Chair Moya and Council members. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking for the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy was a member of the SOHO NOHO Advisory Group. We agreed with the goal the conveners presented nearly three years and so many meetings ago, updating antiquated zoning to reflect current residential and commercial uses. We also support the goal of affordable housing, but like many members of the advisory group, we cannot support this proposal. A core principle for the group was that SOHO and NOHO's historic character is integral and should be protected. The proposal allows nearly doubling the size of buildings in the historic districts. It's an invitation for out of scale commercial development, unlikely to create affordable housing within the historic district boundaries. The proposal ignores the unique asset of the historic district. This neighborhood doesn't have parks, open space, or reasonably priced grocery stores. It does have historic buildings, which form streetscapes that attract residents, workers, artists, tourists, and economic development. The rezoning threatens those streetscapes and the area's economic viability. It labels rare buildings dating back to the 1820s as prime development sites. No one is against more housing, but there needs to be a balance that also protects these resources. DCP says that LPC review will be the safeguard, but when DCP brought in city agencies to discuss their role in the rezoning, LPC was nowhere to be found. There are signif still significant questions about how much affordable housing will be created, affordability levels, and whether loopholes will allow offsite units or none at all. The proposal doesn't address quality of life concerns the public and advisory group brought up over and over again. Council members. This is your chance to improve the plan. Steve Herrick and Zella Jones, members of the advisory group, have submitted thoughtful and detailed alternative proposals that allow respectful development while protecting historic character. Please listen to the advisory group and consider the alternatives. Working together, we can find a better plan that protects SOHO and NOHO and lets them thrive. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Conservancy's views. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Chair, I see no council members with questions, so I'm going to call on the next panel, which will be William Thomas, Ancor Dalal, Doug Hanna, and Edward Siegel. And so the first speaker is William Thomas, to be followed by Ancor Dalal. Time starts now. Hello, everyone. My name is Will Thomas. I'm here to support the rezoning as the executive director of Open New York, an independent grassroots pro-housing organization that aims to create a New York where everyone who wants to live here can afford to do so. I'd like to center my testimony on a few facts. Right now, New Yorkers are facing rent increases of up to 50, 60, 70 percent as rent discounts offered during the pandemic expire. Homelessness is at the highest rate since the Great Depression. There are over 14,000 children who sleep in city shelters each and every night. The hundreds of affordable homes this rezoning would provide are desperately needed. In addition, residential construction in Soho and NoHo has been illegal as of right since the 1960s, which in turn has shunted demand for housing into surrounding neighborhoods, raising rents and causing displacement. 
more market rate housing in Soho and NoHo to the wealthiest neighborhoods in the country would help put this process into reverse. This rezoning is a critical step towards achieving a fairer, more just, more affordable city that works for all New Yorkers. This rezoning will help to alleviate New York's dire housing shortage. It will create the conditions necessary to lower rents, to reduce pressure on gentrifying neighborhoods, to create more vibrant, walkable neighborhoods, and allow the city to focus our housing budget and subsidies on areas most in need of investment. The plan is not perfect. We believe that the office densities are far too high. There's a high risk that commercial development will crowd out residential as it wouldn't need to provide any community benefits. Office density should be kept at five FAR. In addition, the city should mandate the deepest affordability option of MIH and expand its community preference policy beyond community board two to ensure the rezoning is a force for integration. At Open New York, we've advocated for a pro-housing rezoning here for almost two years. And while some may disagree, it's undeniable that Soho is a fantastically wealthy neighborhood, that many such neighborhoods have not built enough housing, and also that more mixed income housing would hardly be the end of the world. I hope the council can see the clear benefits of this plan for the neighborhood and for all New Yorkers, see past the ample misinformation around it and approve it with needed amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker. Next speaker on this panel is Ankur Dalal, to be followed by Douglas Hanau. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Ankur Dalal, and I'm here to testify in favor of the proposed rezoning. I support the rezoning because it has the potential to create thousands of new homes, including hundreds of permanently affordable homes in wealthy, high opportunity neighborhoods. We are now at the end of a process that began over four years ago. While this started as an effort to end special permitting requirements for retail spaces, over the years, a broad coalition of New Yorkers dedicated to promoting greater equity in our city have transformed the rezoning proposal into one that would provide desperately needed housing for thousands of families. This is not without controversy. Many longtime incumbents are bitterly opposed to any change to these neighborhoods. But you are the city council, and your role is to address the needs of all New Yorkers over the privileges of the very few. Allowing the rezoning would be consistent with the history of this city. Over 100 years ago, New Yorkers' wealthiest families, the Vanderbilts and the Astors, attempted to use their money and their influence to prevent apartment buildings and offices from encroaching on what they considered their stretch of Fifth Avenue. But back then, we knew this wasn't a city that could be owned by a few, and we didn't let their mansions or their millions block change. Today, those parts of the city are home to tens of thousands of jobs and a hundredfold more homes than previously existed. As our city did then, I urge you today to not allow a wealthy few to block needed change. Allowing the rezoning would also be consistent with the values of this city. New York is and has always been a city of immigrants. My family is an immigrant family, and we started our lives in America in New York City. When they first moved here, we had enough housing that even nearly penniless immigrants could find homes here. When I testified to Manhattan CB2 in support of this rezoning, I told my family story, and I said that we are a city with a statue in its harbor that tells the world that everyone is welcome to live here. And for that, for mentioning the Statue of Liberty, I was booed, heckled and screamed at by the local audience. As a city council, I urge you to think about which side of this debate is on the side of our city's values, traditions, and history, and to vote with them. Please support this rezoning and communicate to the world that New York is open to everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker will be Douglas Hanna, to be followed by Edward Siegel. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Douglas Hanau. I'm a long time New Yorker, I've lived here my whole life, raising two teenage daughters. This rezoning is about the future of New York, not the past. Without rezonings like Soho Noho and other rezonings, um, the future will mean young people like my children my teenagers, college age daughters, will have no place to live in New York City. The people who own expensive homes, like I do, will continue to see those houses um, get wealthier and wealthier and worth more, while the young people, like my kids, will have no place to go. We have to pass this rezoning and all kinds of rezonings. The city is stagnant right now. We're not building enough housing. We're not building enough affordable housing. And to oppose this means you're voting for New York to remain in amber. We won't be able to address climate change. We won't be able to address 
inequality. We won't be able to address any of those progressive issues that young people who are not represented at this meeting fight for every day. They march in Washington. So this is a fight that is pitting young people against old people, but the young people don't have a voice. So please support this, allow New York to be a vibrant place, dynamic place where young people can live together with older people, where wealthy people can live with people who are starting out their lives and trying to get better and trying to make it. So please, I implore you to support this rezoning. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. The last speaker on this panel is Edward Siegel. Time starts now. Do we have? Do we have Ed Siegel? Oh, hi, yes, I'm sorry, I'm here. Okay, Ed. Go ahead. Um, so my name is Eddie. I, uh, I live about two blocks away from the rezoning boundary. Uh, and I urge you all to vote in strong support for this project. Uh, we are in the middle of a housing crisis. I think a lot of the speakers already have discussed a lot of the same points that I, you know, this is going to be a long meeting. I don't need to remind you too deeply of, but uh, this will create hundreds of units of affordable housing. We need more market rate housing and uh, dense urban cities with lots of people uh, are phenomenal for the environment. I would love to welcome all of these new neighbors into my neighborhood. And uh, I think this project is one step of many that uh, our city is going to need to do to make sure that we reduce as many rent burden households as possible in our city. Uh, thank you all for your time and I uh, hope you support this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Chair, I don't see any council members with questions. So I'm gonna call on the next panel. And the next panel will be Zella Jones, Mark Dykus, Sean Sweeney, and Pete Davis. So the first speaker on this panel will be Zella Jones to be followed by Mark Dykus. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairman Moya and members of the subcommittee and Margaret Chin and Carolina Rivera. Um, this has been a most helpful session. NoHo Bowery Stakeholders is a 10-year-old nonprofit community benefit organization. We appreciate Councilmember Rivera's confidence in our contributions to this process. Our members are residents, businesses, nonprofit institutions, owners, and lessors, and rep represent over a million square feet of NoHo's built environment. We believe there needs to be new zoning and that new zoning should create opportunities for affordable residency. There are, however, several modifications that, we must, that must be included. The zoning envelopes do need to be reduced um, specifically in the historic districts. Um, other colleagues have brought this up. Um, we need better protections for historic buildings. We're advocating for additional restrictions on additions to buildings in the historic district. We are interested in increasing the contribution of new development to art-based initiatives. We're advocating that any new development be included in an affordable calculation and those and funds be distributed to art um, supporting uh, endeavors. Transition of non-artists to JLWQA units. Um, the provisions of this proposal, proposed rezoning need much more thorough consideration. They are not clear. In some cases, they are contradictory and they are not mandatory. Further, the cost of transitioning between the ARC fund and the attendance CFO improvements will, make it, will be a major deterrent in achieving its intent overall. We are advocating for performance standards on use group 10. We feel that mixed use district, districts in mixed use districts, ramifications of commercial size are acute, either by community review of retail size over 25,000 square feet or by defining acceptable performance standards, which Tom is met Clark. or not. So you can wrap it up. I'll give you a couple of seconds. You can. Okay. Um, some combination of the two. And finally, we are advocating for tenant protections. We thoroughly endorse the tenant protections recommended by the Cooper Square Committee. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker.
Um, the next speaker after Zella is going to be Mark Dykus to be followed by Sean Sweeney. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Chairman, Cha Chairperson Moya and members of the committee. My name is Mark Dykus and I'm the Executive Director of the Soho Broadway Initiative, the not-for-profit that manages a neighborhood-focused business improvement district on Broadway from Houston to Canal. <clears throat> the initiative is adv advocated for long-standing, long-needed zoning changes to facilitate the long-term health and success of our community. Indeed, our board has adopted a set of planning goals that has guided all of our advocacy in this regard. However, as we near the conclusion of this ULERP process, our board is divided on this zoning proposal before you today. The vast majority of our residential board members oppose the proposal, while our commercial members generally support it. Despite these diverging positions, there is general agreement on the following recommendations. First, the initiative, initiative strongly supports allowing the conversion of JLWQA units to residential without requiring a certified artist to occupy the unit. We firmly believe the conversion process should be efficient and inexpensive with flexibility around code compliance. Next, the initiative believes that the proposed arts fund is an insufficient and unsustainable approach for celebrating Soho's remarkable legacy of arts and culture. The provisions for creating an arts fund should be removed from the proposal with a separate process for arts and culture planning undertaken when there is community and political support for doing so. Third, the initiative is committed to working with the city to address quality of life issues in our unique mixed use district. We call on the city to make enforceable commitments to address garbage, retail, lighting, and signage, sidewalk and vehicular congestion, commercial deliveries, and public space. We have more details which we'll share in our written testimony. Finally, the initiative strongly believes that protecting existing residents, especially those who live in affordable and rent regulated housing must be a priority. We are the city to provide adequate resources to protect against displacement of these residents. Thank you for your time and we look forward to continuing to advocate to create a better Soho Broadway for all residents, businesses and visitors. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Next speaker is Sean Sweeney to be followed by Pete Davis. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Sean Sweeney. I'm the director of the Soho Alliance, a community group founded in 1981, interested in uh, landmarking and zoning. And we were the successors to the Soho Artists Association, which initially got this successful zoning that we now have in place. But I want to tell you about myself. I moved to Soho in 77 from Brooklyn. I was an immigrant with my parents who were supers in the building in Brooklyn. I moved to 99 Prince Street in Soho where I lived and work and Chairman Ma, uh, Moya, you might, I noticed that sign behind you, house uh, music. I worked at 99 Prince Street, the, 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 the groundswell of house music. And uh, currently we, we, we got, we went on uh, rent we, right we when it's about- your time now. I'm gonna give you more time to speak. Just yeah, for I, that. I, I, I know you'd I, like that, I, sir. I, I like your- trouble for that, Sean. I, I like your turntable. <laughs> Thank you. Vinyl Mania, that was my place. Uh, oh, I, I know that guy. Okay. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Now I'll begin. Okay. Um, so I moved to, uh, so I, I'm i also the vice president of the Downtown Independent Democrats, which I'm not speaking for, but they also have come out against this. And why have 23% of the city voters only voted last, last uh, week? Because there's a distrust of government. I was on that panel, that Envision Soho No panel, and the main goal was to allow greater residential uses and to permit retail, not big box stores. We went to had dozens and dozens of meetings and what happened? We were ignored. The only people who wanted an increase in, in the uh, square footage of retail was the Rebney per, uh, person. NYU, when, when asked said, we don't want to come into Soho. Even the Broadway property owners did not want an increase in FAR. Then when COVID came, this process died. It went away for nine months and then got re uh, resurrected in the waning months of the worst mayor since Jimmy Walker. So who is supporting this? This is not a neighborhood plan. All, all our wasted hours with, uh, with Gail Brewer and Margaret Chin, what was it before for de Blasio to push this down our throat? There's not going to be any affordable housing. We know that. There are so many loopholes. You could drive a Mack truck through it. I mix by it. That's it. Thank you, sir. Okay, Sean. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. The last speaker on this panel is Pete Davis. 
Time starts now. Okay, hi, I'm Pete Davies, 41 year resident of Soho, rent stabilized certified loft tenant, senior citizen, aging in place. The mayor's proposal for the Soho Noho neighborhood plan does not work. I urge you to reject the city's rushed and reckless plan to upzone these neighborhoods. We can do so much better. Before continuing, Mr. Chair, I need to point out that the public cannot see any of the committee members. Now, back to my testimony. In 2019, I served on the Soho Noho Advisory Group, representing the Broadway Residents Coalition. The key goals then, legalize non-conforming loft residents, bring into line various non-conforming retail. But the city's plan, cobbled together during the chaos and the confusion of the COVID-19 pandemic, fails to provide for residents, leaving many at risk, and it inadequately addresses retail conditions. Instead, the council is presented with a blunt, unimaginative, and careless plan filled with false premises, promises for uh, uh, uncertainty and lacking equity, with no guarantee of affordable housing. The plan hides its true purpose, the economic rescue of over-leveraged real estate speculators done by the city's magical grant of new FAR, equal to over 9 million square feet, more than three Empire State buildings. All of that incentivizes harassment of existing residents. HPD has done no outreach to our rent stabilized building where the new owner has failed to register the building and failed to provide us with our new uh, lease uh, extensions. The rezoning speculation hijinks have begun. Vote law on this unworthy proposal and for a better opportunity. We can do so much better. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Chair, there are no council members with questions for this panel. So I'll call on the next panel, which will be Anthony Borelli, Dan Miller, John Sanchez, and Sheena Kang. So the first speaker will be Anthony Borelli, to be followed by Dan Miller. Before we get started, I just want to make a quick note. Uh, I'm going to have uh, council member Levin uh, take over uh, for a brief uh, moment. Uh, thank you so much. Time starts now. Uh, hi, my name is Anthony Borelli. I am Senior Vice President for Edison Properties. Uh, thank you, Council Members, for the opportunity to represent Edison in this hearing. Uh, Edison Properties is a family-owned real estate company. Uh, Edison Affiliates own and operate businesses on the properties uh, the family owns. Uh, since the early 70s, Edison has owned and operated two public parking lots in the proposed uh, rezoning area, one at 375 Lafayette at the corner of Great Jones uh, and another at 174 Center Street at the corner of Hester. Uh, Edison Properties developed, owns, and manages the 243-unit Ludlow Rental Apartment Building at the corner of Hudson, uh, Houston, and Ludlow. Uh, this is a 7525 building developed on a former parking lot. Two other residential uh, rental projects were built on Edison parking lots. Uh, these lots were ground leased to developers. One is at uh, 88 Leonard, 352 unit, uh, units in an apartment building in Tribeca. Uh, the other is at 241 West 28th Street, 480 units um, developed under the Voluntary Inclusionary Program and Affordable New York programs. It has 30% affordable units. Um, we work with architects to understand uh, and to study uh, conceptual residential developments on Edison's sites within the proposed rezoning area under uh, the proposed uh, zoning framework, including uh, quality housing and MIH. Uh, on the Center Street lot, we modeled a, a rental apartment building uh, with ground floor retail. We were able to achieve uh, a total of 210 units, um, and uh, which would yield somewhere around 40 to 65 uh, below market units, depending on which MIH unit uh, option is used. We also modeled uh, a rental residential development with ground floor retail on our Lafayette Street parking lot. Using a similar right. approach, we were able to uh, achieve 238 units. Um, I'll just quickly cut to the chase. Um, 
the original uh, originally proposed FARs favored residential uses. That's even uh, that's now even more the case given city planning's amendments. Uh, MAH will ensure that affordable housing is part of any project, any residential project on Edison sites. Um, and um, uh, the densities proposed would provide for the most housing in new buildings designed to fit within tailored contextual envelopes. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to participate in this hearing. Thank you. The next speaker will be Dan Miller to be followed by John Sanchez. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Dan Miller, and I'd like to speak in favor of the rezoning in my capacity as a resident of Brooklyn. There's been a lot of talk about Soho as a neighborhood uh, in this rezoning process, and that's appropriate, but it's also appropriate that we take into account the rest of the city because housing is a citywide issue. The entire city faces a massive shortage of new housing, both affordable and market rate. We, when people move from neighborhood to neighborhood, they don't always stay in the same neighborhood. They don't always want to stay in the same neighborhood. Uh, I'm considering moving myself at the end of my lease and I'm going to be looking at apartments in Brooklyn, but I'm also gonna be looking in Queens and at the end and even in Manhattan, even in Soho, if I could afford it. Because people aren't stuck in place, housing is a citywide issue. The, and the fact is that we are not producing nearly enough of new housing to serve the city's needs, let alone those of people who would actually want to move here. So we need to ask, we're not, we, we're not building enough housing right now. We know this because rents are high. If we're going to build new housing, where should we build it? And the obvious answer is wealthy, well-connected neighborhoods like Soho and NoHo. These are the kind of places that we need to be building as much housing as possible. If we can't build here, where can we? Do we, should we simply shunt all residential development to the outer boroughs, to poorer neighborhoods? Should we make the, should we just freeze all new construction and make it impossible to live here for the middle class? Or should we build more housing in the places that it's best suited? I say yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be John Sanchez, followed by Sheena Kang. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is John Sanchez, and I serve as a district manager of Bronx Community Board 6. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Mr. Sanchez. All right. Good afternoon, my name is John Sanchez and I serve as the district manager of Bronx Community Board 6. I fully support and urge the committee to support the NoHo SoHo plan with higher residential density and lowering the commercial density. It's not customary to comment on another neighborhood, but that is exactly the problem. Our housing crisis is a, city, is a citywide problem and what happens in one neighborhood impacts another. Thousands of our fellow New Yorkers live in shelters and nearly 4,000 children sleep in cars, parks, or abandoned buildings. This isn't due to any moral failings, it's partly due to the fact that our city limits who and how many people can live in neighborhoods through a tool called zoning, which says we won't allow new housing to be built because of rules we designed in 1961. New York City should not be a city where the cost of residency in Soho and neighborhoods like it is a six figure salary or parents with a six figure salary or being lucky enough to have moved there 40 years ago. No neighborhood in New York City, including Soho should be one where a majority of New Yorkers are unable to afford to live in. We need to open the closed neighborhood doors of Soho and open it to people of all incomes and races when looking for a stable home. New York's historic character comes from the idea that people from around the world and across the country journey to come here in search of better opportunities, to open businesses, and to raise their families. New York's greatness doesn't come from architectural details, and it certainly doesn't come from de facto segregation. The Soho No Hold Plan is a great first step to show that we can bring affordable housing to all neighborhoods, not just neighborhoods like Bronx Community Board 6. Please support this plan. Thank you. Thank you. The last speaker on this panel is Sheena Kang. Time starts now. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to testify. 
My name is Sheena Kong, and I am a senior policy analyst at Citizens Housing and Planning Council, or CHPC. We are a nonprofit think tank focused on improving housing policy and planning in New York City. So thanks to everyone who has put their hard work and effort into this process. I know that many people here today are not entirely satisfied with the version of the plan that we have before us, but I also believe that no version of this plan will satisfy everyone. And so voting yes on this one is ultimately the right thing to do. This is an opportunity for the city to do something about segregation and racial injustice instead of just continuing to talk about it. Communities rarely meet new development with smiles and applause and processes like these are never easy. But we as a city have an obligation to do them. We must build enough housing so that every New Yorker has a place to live. We must end the legacy of racial segregation and the exclusion of low-income people and communities of color. The city and its elected leaders uh, have an obligation to do these things, even if some of its more affluent and more powerful residents don't like it. A lot of the opposition to this plan has ranged somewhere between mildly misinformed to downright exclusionary. I have heard opponents say that low-income residents would bring the neighborhood down, that people of color would not feel comfortable living among such luxury, and that Soho and NoHo are already diverse because Jay-Z and John Legend once owned property there. I have watched opponents try to redefine Soho as a low-income community of color by manipulating data and appropriating the demographics of immigrant communities living nearby. This last ploy is not only deeply offensive, but it also undermines the very real concerns of communities that have dealt with the impacts of disinvestment and structural racism for decades. Letting this opportunity pass us by would be a huge mistake. We urge the council to consider the suggestions that groups who have put time and energy into Bye. making recommendations for how the rezoning could be improved have created. But we also urge you to recognize much of the opposition to this plan for what it is and not to lose sight of the vision of a more equitable city that New Yorkers both need and deserve. Thanks very much. Thank you. That was the last speaker on this panel and council member Chin has a question. Go ahead, council member. Time's, time yes, starts now. Yeah, thank you to this panel. Um, I have a question for Mr. Uh, Relly, uh, representing Edison Property. Hi, Anthony, thank you for testifying. I wanted to see if you have met with HPD uh, to see if there's any possibility of creating more uh, affordable units and also lowering um, the uh, AMI. Are there any uh, like, HPD program that you might be able to, to utilize to do that? Yeah, well, I, I should say that, you know, Edison doesn't have any immediate development plans for either of our sites. Um, but we did talk to HPD um, and they made us familiar with their programs uh, and their term sheets. Um, and we had a good conversation. We shared information about our sites. And as I said, they shared information about what types of programs would be available to, um, to us should we pursue a residential project in the future. Um, you know, it, it's, it's worth saying that, at, you know, at this time, we're, we're unable to say, you know, which programs we would tap or how we would, you know, finance a project. Um, but um, HPD was very helpful in opening the door and making us familiar with what was available to developers um, and us uh, at the time um, that, that, that it would be appropriate to use. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for testifying. Um, I'll call on the next panel, which will be David Herman, Valerie Della Rosa, Donna Raftery, and Steve Herrick. So the first speaker is David Herman to be followed by Valerie Della Rosa. Time starts now. Do we have David Herman? Um, I'll skip David and we'll go back to him and we'll continue on with Valerie De La Rosa. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I couldn't unmute. Uh, 
Good afternoon, Chair Moya and subcommittee members. My name is Valerie De La Rosa. Today I'm speaking to you as a Mexican American millennial renter in Community District 2. I've lived in the district for six years and as a graduate student in economics at CUNY's John Jay College. The proposed Soho NoHo Chinatown rezoning will fail to maintain a mixed use neighborhood. In your deliberation, please take into consideration the following data points from the second quarter of 2021. Soho recorded the highest retail leasing velocity in the second quarter of 2021. The largest transactions were all brands based abroad, including the UK, which was Vashi um, on Green Street, as well as a French apparel company, AMI Paris, and a Canadian co, co company, Canuck. All three global brands are opening up their first Manhattan locations. Soho is one of the only quarters in Manhattan to record an increase in average asking rent rising 13.3% quarter over quarter and 7.4% year over year to $469 per square foot. The uptick was mainly caused by the addition of above average price space, which was formerly occupied by Uno de 50 at 123 Prince Street, while the inventory remained mostly unchanged. Eliminating the 10,000 square foot cap on retail incentivizes more large retail development and does not support small businesses, nor does it ensure a healthy vitality tenant mix that supports a residential neighborhood. More importantly, the cap ensures the community has input on potential quality of life issues and supports small businesses. I leave you with three guiding principles from Envision Soho NoHo that said that a plan should promote economic vitality. And economic vitality should encourage a vibrant and diverse ground floor landscape that enhances the quality of life for residents. And two, specifically I'm allow and incentivize, allow and incentivize scarce neighborhood resources that aim to protect and serve the community. And three, provide predictable zoning rules that support small businesses. I strongly urge you, Chair Moya, to reject the mayor's plan. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. So we're gonna go back to David Herman. Which apology uh, looks like you were not unmuted. Go ahead. Time starts now. Um, oh, there we go. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, hi, my name is David Herman, and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. The city's argument for this plan is based on three claims. First, that the plan will create 3,500 units of housing, 900 of them affordable. Second, that developers which developers will choose. Uh, residential developments over commercial ones and not utilize the many loopholes in this plan to not include affordable housing. And third, that even though the plan allows over 10 million square feet of new construction in this tiny area, only a third of it will actually be built. Be built. Our analysis of the rezoning submitted to the council shows that a very different outcome is much more likely. But don't just trust us. Look at the city's miserable track record for accurately predicting outcomes from their, um, from their other rezoning plans. As per data we've submitted, a coin flip would be a more accurate predictor of what will actually happen in rezoning than the city's analysis. For the first three developments under the East Midtown rezoning, the city had a 0%, 0% accuracy rate. In Hudson Square, which is right next door to Soho, they grossly misjudged how much commercial development would take place versus residential. In East Harlem, East New York, Jerome Avenue, Long Island City, downtown Brooklyn, and the East Village, they've been less accurate in their predictions than a storefront fortune teller, grossly misestimating the amount, type, and location of new development and the creation of, of promised public amenities. Don't ignore the data when so much is at stake and so many can be harmed. Please vote no in this plan. Thank you. Thank you, David. We're gonna now call on Donna Raftery to be followed by Steve Herrick. Time starts now. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this application. My name is Donna Raftery. I'm a member of Community Board 2 and wholeheartedly support the resolution in opposition to this plan, which I encourage you all to read. I am attending today to speak as a long-term nearby resident. Soho has been a part of my backyard since the late 70s and 80s when I lived in Tribeca and spent most weekends in Soho enjoying the many galleries and unique small retailers. Living in what is now called the Meatpacking District since the mid 80s, I have continued to visit Soho often. 
I worked nights on Spring and Crosby in the 90s and watched as Balthazar opened its doors in 97, transforming that block. The neighborhood has changed a lot over the years. The beauty of the city is the uniqueness of its neighborhoods. This plan with its upzoning and large retail will turn Soho, Noho, and Chinatown into something more akin to a mini midtown, destroying the very character and unique shops that have made the area so desirable. We need to look at what came out of the envisioned Soho NoHo report and go back to the drawing board to create a plan that honors the nature of this historic district, truly adds affordable housing and protects the artists that are here and expands retail use on the ground floor for unique small scale retailers, keeping the special permit for retail over 10,000 square feet. Please reject this plan and encourage city planning to work with the community to develop a truly creative plan that considers everyone needs and enriches the neighborhood. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. The next speaker and the last one on this panel is Steve Herrick. Time starts now. Steve, we can't hear you. Okay, sorry about that. I thought I was unmuted. Okay. All right, can we reset the clock? We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Steve Herrick, Executive Director of Cooper Square Committee, and I've submitted written testimony. The rezoning plan does not reflect the recommendations of the advisory group, and city planning has ignored calls for changes to the plan. The city council has a chance to make those changes. I asked the city council to vote no on the ULARP application unless the following changes are made. First, reduce the proposed residential FAR. The proposed increase in floor area ratio from 5.0 to as much as 9.7 and 12.0 throughout much of Soho and Noho is wildly out of scale with the built environment. In the housing opportunity zones, the city council should change the R10 zoning to R9A, which is 8.5 residential FAR with MIH. Height limits should not exceed 175 feet since there are very few buildings taller than that in these areas. Along Broadway, Lafayette, and Canal Street, change the R9X zoning, um, which is 9.7, down to R8A, which is 7.2, and impose a 125-foot height limit. There are virtually no buildings taller than 12 stories along Broadway and Lafayette Street, and really nothing taller than six stories on Canal Street other than the area between West Broadway and Sixth Avenue. Um, a second change we urge is the City Council to reduce the proposed commercial FAR. Uh, the FAR was reduced slightly by the City Planning Commission in some parts of Soho and NoHo, but it's still too high. It should be kept at 5.0. There needs to be a significant differential between the residential and commercial FAR, or else developers will choose to build offices and hotels instead of mixed income building. We urge you to look at Cooper Square Committee's alternative proposal, which uses more appropriate MIH densities to create about 600 low income units. And we think it will create more low income housing than the current proposal, which will end up incentivizing office and hotel development. The city can still achieve 800 to 900 low income units uh, if affordable housing funds are used to acquire additional sites to build 100% low income housing on them. A third recommendation. Okay, um, I have other comments which I will uh, I will submit in writing, but uh, I would ask that you please revisit the plan or else reject it. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Levin, I don't see any council members with questions, so I can call on the next panel if you're okay. Uh, I see you nodding, so I'll call on the next panel. Um, the next panel will be Austin Celestine, David Gordon, Denny De Salas, and Sunny Ung. And so the first panel is Austin Celestine to be followed by David Gordon. Time starts now. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Austin Sullivan, and I'm an urban design student at NYU. This plan isn't perfect. Similar rezonings have higher affordable housing proportions, the commercial allowance is too high, and there are several other missed opportunities. But this plan is infinitely better than the status quo and needs to be passed. Soho is disproportionately white and wealthy, and the neighborhood hasn't just had a problem building affordable housing, it has had a problem building housing, period. This is a supply crisis. This neighborhood's ridiculous rent demonstrates this perfectly. 
The 900 affordable units are long overdue for this high opportunity area and the 2700 market rate units will help stymie gentrification in working class neighborhoods across the city and take pressure off of outer borough neighborhoods. I find it interesting that people regularly point out that MIH has failed but fail to mention why and how to fix it. When a Manhattan Institute study from last year asserted that to fix MIH, it should be applied to high opportunity neighborhoods explicitly invoking Soho NoHo. On top of that, 85% of the rezoned area is in a historic district. The people implicating Chinatown's proximity to the opportunity zone fail to mention that it's one of only three areas that aren't landmarked. Perhaps the city would have made an opportunity corridor along Broadway, but historic districts weren't touched and said districts weakens the output of this rezoning. We should revisit this district, reduce its size and designate individual buildings, protect those historic buildings whilst maximizing the housing output in the rezoning. Again, this is a supply crisis and we need to get as much housing as possible to help the entire city. Lastly, I would like to mention the false dichotomy between housing production and tenant protection that has been created. We can and should do both upzone the neighborhood to allow as much housing as possible and for working class newcomers to enjoy what everyone in this neighborhood celebrates and give the tenants the resources and protections to stay in the neighborhood and allow them to age in place. It is very urgent that the city council passes this plan. The ramifications of rejecting this plan are disastrous. Thank you. The next speaker will be David Gordon to be followed by Danny Salad. Time starts now. Hello, thank you for having me members of the council and members of this committee. My name is David Gordon. I'm a 23 year old resident of lower Manhattan and I live just a few blocks from the proposed rezoning. I recently uh, finished my time at NYU over the summer and I strongly support this rezoning. This neighborhood is one of the wealthiest and most transit oriented in the city and it will allow young people many of them from NYU, like myself, to stay, in the, to stay in the city and build a life for themselves. For working class residents of New York, the income restricted units will give them a foothold in the area. Meanwhile, the market rate residential will allow young people, though more established and maybe older than myself, to move into this area, allowing young people like myself and my friends to move into the units that those future residents will then vacate. This filtering process is how NYC can become more inclusive. I have been able to stay in NYC with my friends and colleagues thanks to a few lucky breaks and an, incredibly, and an incredibly supportive family. But most people will not have those breaks and even mine will run out eventually. This rezoning will open doors for more young people, people like myself. Lastly, I wanna mention that I'm gay. Very proudly and thankfully, my family is incredibly supportive of me because of this, but I often think about the gay and queer people who don't have the same support, or even if they do, they live in a place that isn't as tolerant as Lower Manhattan. These folks would love to move to NYC, whether in the Lower Manhattan or a filtered place in another borough, to, a, to move to a city like New York where they can feel safe and embraced or at least avoid hostile stares would be everything for them. Without the opportunity for future residents, we are not a fully accepting city, and I urge you to support this rezoning. Thank you, David. The next speaker is Denny Salas, to be followed by Sonny Ng. Time starts now. Good afternoon, council members. As a resident of this area, I'm testifying in support of the rezoning for NoHo and Soho. What matters most in our city is progress. We have espoused idealistic goals that have called for equity, fairness, and opportunity for too long, but we have fallen woefully, woefully short. New York City remains one of the most segregated cities in America, a city ruled by Democrats that has relegated success and the fulfillment of the American dream to its wealthy enclaves. Providing housing opportunities to immigrants and working class families and, and families in higher income neighborhoods will help destroy the obstacles that have held them back. Rezoning No and Soho is not a panacea to our problems, but supporting this project, the Gowanus rezoning, and for that matter, the Blood Center will place us on the right path and show the rest of the city that we're still capable of doing the right thing, even in the face of considerable resistance. This plan is imperfect, and the commercial density allowance must be lowered to spur more housing. So please make those, those corrections. Thank you for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful day. 
Thank you. The next and last speaker for this panel is Sunny Eng. Time starts now. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Sunny. I live in Brooklyn and have been working in Soho for the last five years. I support the Soho NoHo rezoning plan. The city has a housing crisis, and if you rent, you would know that. It's expensive and difficult to find a place to move. And if you're someone who rents in the city, this cycle happens to you every couple of years. The Soho NoHo upzoning provides an opportunity to create more housing stock in a white affluent neighborhood that has excellent transit connections for once. This will relieve pressure for gentrifying other neighborhoods like Harlem, Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights, Sunset Park, and Chinatown. On the subject of Chinatown, I just wanna mention how opponents of this plan, including preservation groups and community board two, with their completely disingenuous resolution, have constantly been using Asian Americans as pawns and continue to mislead the community by mischaracterizing the rezoning boundaries and its effects, as well as attempting to attach Chinatown to the name of the rezoning. If you wanna fight the Soho NoHo rezone, upzoning, then fight it for the real reasons you're opposing and not try to drag the Asian American community into this. You don't really care about whether or not there were sufficient consultations with the Chinese community. If you did, you would have represented your constituents better instead of using them as cover. Don't pretend you care about diversity when you artificially inflate numbers to prevent a plant that would allow more people of color to move in. Don't act like you've ever crossed Broadway or shopped at any of the businesses that were impacted by COVID or anti-Asian hate, because if you did, you would know there were affordable grocery stores there. You're no better than white conservatives that have used Asian Americans to fight against affirmative action in court. If you really care about displacement and gentrification of Chinatown, then you should build more housing in Soho and NoHo instead. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny. That was the last speaker on this panel, Chair Levin. So I can call on the next panel, which will be Juan Rivero, Lan Lanil Stevens, Marianne Arisman, and Genevieve Hinton. First speaker is Juan Rivero. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Juan Rivero and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. One of the many falsehoods at the heart of this plan is that 25 to 30 percent of space in all new development will consist of affordable housing. This is an utter lie. The plan doesn't require or guarantee a single unit of affordable housing being built and will likely result in little, if any of it. At 358 Bowery, where the city projects that affordable housing will be built, a commercial tower is already set to go up with no affordable housing. And that's because the plan exempts from its affordable housing requirement all retail space, offices, hotels, and community facilities, including NYU dorms and other private university uses, as well as luxury condos and rentals of up to 25,000 square feet per zoning lot. As per detailed, in a detail, as per detail in an analysis that we have submitted, on every single site in the rezoning area where the city predicts affordable housing will be built, the rezoning actually provides a strong incentive not to build it by allowing developers more market rate space if they exclude affordable housing than if they include it. It is magical thinking or simply a lie to say that profit driven real estate developers will forego these financial incentives and include affordable housing when the plan allows them such lucrative ways not to do so. This rezoning is not designed to produce affordable housing. It merely uses that false promise as a fig leaf for this obscene giveaway to developers. We urge, urge the city council not to be an accomplice to this willful deception and to reject this plan. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Lanel Stevens, to be followed by Marianne Arisman. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Lanel Stevens, and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. The city has consistently lied about the danger this plan poses to affordable housing in the rezoning area. In spite of their claims that the 2019 rent laws prevent this, earlier this year, the New York Apartment Law Insider published an article entitled, Demolition, One of the Last Ways to Regulate, Deregulate an Apartment, which said, 
With the June 2019 passage of rent regulation reforms, owners are desperately seeking ways out of rent regulation and, highlighted, demolition generally available to rent stabilized buildings regardless of their condition as one of the few remaining ways to achieve this. DCP's lies don't end here. They claim few buildings with rent regulated units will be underbuilt under this proposed rezoning. In fact, per data we submitted to the council, 90% of buildings with such units would be, and nearly half of those would be more than 50% underbuilt, which is DCP's own very high criteria for defining when a building is likely to succumb to development. 100% of rent regulated units in the Chinatown section of the rezoning would be underbuilt, as would all those outside of historic districts or in non-contributing buildings within historic districts, which are automatically eligible for demolition. 30% of rent regulated units in the rezoning area fall under this category, but as per documentation we've submitted, the LPC's regular allowance of def demolition of all but the facades of buildings means no landmarked units are safe. Don't buy the city's lies. Vote no. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Marianne Arisman, to be followed by Genevieve Hinton. Time starts now. My name is Marianne Arisman, and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. From the beginning, we were told that this process would look to ways to preserve and reinforce the artistic character of Soho and NoHo. In fact, this plan seems to be designed to do everything possible to destroy that character. The allowance for big box chain stores and eating and drinking establishments of unlimited size will make it incredibly difficult for any art gallery or arts or design related business to continue in any ground floor space. The upzoning will create huge incentives for landlords to push out remaining artists living in rent regulated and loft law units to gut or demolish their buildings which is why groups like Lower Manhattan loft tenants and New York City loft tenants are opposing it. Allowing vastly larger office buildings and hotels will further dilute and diminish the artistic character of these neighborhoods. The new allowance for as of right luxury condos and rentals along with NYU dorms and other private university facilities will further supplant and dislodge any arts related uses in the neighborhood. And the new rules more or less amount to a phasing out of the artist in residence regulations, which helped make these neighborhoods such vital centers of artistic activity. The plan allows for no new artist residences and includes no provision for new artist housing among the affordable housing and no space for arts groups. This rezoning doesn't respect the artistic character of these neighborhoods. And I urge you strongly to reject it because it destroys the artistic character. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne. The last speaker on this panel is Genevieve Pinton. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Genevieve Pinton and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. It is undeniable that the proposed rezoning will have a disproportionately negative impact upon Chinatown and Asian Americans. And that's no surprise given that the process by which this rezoning was created completely failed to reach out to and include the Chinatown community or even acknowledge its impacts upon them. Calling this the Soho Noho rezoning when several blocks of Chinatown are also included is emblematic of this failure. The Chinatown section of the rezoning is in fact targeted for the largest upzoning with the largest incentive for demolition and displacement, oversized development, and new wealthier residents. This area of Chinatown has a disproportionately high concentration of lower income residents and rent regulated housing. And as per documentation we've submitted, blocks with higher concentrations of Asian Americans throughout the rezoning area track consistently with where the city has targeted the highest upzonings, which creates the greatest pressure for displacement, oversized development, and new wealthier residents. 
The city still refuses to acknowledge that Chinatown is even in the rezoning, although elsewhere the city's own website calls this area Chinatown, it's in the Chinatown bid, and the majority of its residents are Chinese American, and the Museum of the Chinese in America, the China Buddhist Association, and the iconic Pagoda Building at 183 Center Street are all located here. So don't buy the city's offensive whitewashing and reject this plan. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, that was the last speaker on this panel, Chair Levin, and I don't see any um, council members with questions at this time, so I'm going to call on the next panel. The next panel will be Christopher Good, Andy Zhang, Casey Berkowitz, and Michelle Coopersmith. First speaker will be Christopher Good, followed by Andy Zhang. Time starts now. Hi, sorry about that. It wasn't allowing me to unmute myself. Um, hi, I first moved to Soho in 1978. And for the past 20 years, I've owned my home uh, on the east edge of the rezoning area. My daughter attended PS 130 on Baxter Street. I'm a longtime volunteer with Visiting Neighbors, an organization which helps local seniors age in place. Once again, I'm before you today as an advocate for all housing. And I support this rezoning because I think a diverse and equitable neighborhood is more important than ever increasing loft values. I would like to rebut some of the claims regarding my immediate neighborhood, the Chinatown part of rezoning. First, the area between Baxter and Lafayette Street, south of Grand Street, is already gentrified. There are 60 multi-million dollar condos on these few blocks alone. Four hotels have been built, and more recently, the remaining large manufacturing buildings have been converted to expensive office space. Second, this area's 13 rent-regulated buildings are not at risk of demolition, demolition or resident displacement. Not only were tenant protections strengthened in 2019, but because of the small footprints of these buildings, new development on these sites has never made economic sense. Despite the past 20 years of intense gentrification, not a single rent regulated building has been demolished for new development here. The zoning will not change this, but simply allow for the residential development of this area's few vacant lots and underutilized commercial buildings. Most of these sites were too small for office development, so they will now be available sites for housing. We will get market rate housing, which helps to reduce the gentrification pressures on less, less wealthy neighborhoods, including Chinatown. Additionally, we'll all benefit from new affordable apartments being added to Soho. Please do not buy into the displacement and gentrification smoke screens being put forth by the same individuals and groups who have been fighting 100% affordable housing like they are fighting Haven Green just a few Time blocks expired. Away. Please say yes to this new zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker will be Andy Zhang, who will be followed by Casey Berkowitz. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Andy, and I'm here to support the proposed Soho Noho rezoning. Uh, I support this rezoning because we as a city desperately need more housing to address the overly expensive housing costs and overcrowded living conditions faced by New York City residents. We've had skyrocketing housing costs due to historically low vacancy rates, and we have over 300,000 people living in overcrowded conditions due to lack of available units. The only way to ameliorate both these pressing issues is to build up the amount of floor space per residence. This is something that can be gleaned from data and evidence collected not just in this one neighborhood, but also the entire city and metropolitan area of New York City, the state of New York, the whole country, and all over the world. The answer is clear. Build more housing. I do not see this rezoning proposal as perfect, and I do wish to see it improved. I believe that even more housing needs to be included than what is currently proposed. I say we lower the office and commercial densities in order to add additional housing units instead. While commercial space is undoubtedly valuable, the primary issue facing New York City today is a housing shortage and not a commercial one. Commercial spaces are currently still at historically high vacancy rates compared to our historically low housing vacancy rates. The answer is clear, build more housing. I want to use this opportunity to reject any attempts to use the Chinese and Asian American and other immigrant communities as tools to oppose this plan. The vast majority of this rezoning plan features the wealthier and whiter parts of Soho Noho and is not Chinatown. The spillover housing demand from people desiring to live in these neighborhoods has had gentrifying effects on the lower income residents of Chinatown and Two Bridges. This should not have to happen. 
In the same way that we ask the rich to pay their fair share in taxes, I ask the wealthy and white property owners and aesthetic snobs dominating these anti-housing groups to end the economic lies they're spouting and build your fair share in housing. To them and to the city, either build more housing or get out of the way. Stop using us as bargaining chips and build your fair share. The best and only way to stop displacement is to have enough housing for everyone to move into and live in. When there's a housing crisis, the city needs to stop coming back to us repeatedly to have us do their homework. Cease with the Time theatrics, expired. ignore the incumbent interest, and rezone and build more housing. The answer is clear, build more housing. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Andy. The next speaker is Casey Berkowitz, to be followed by Michelle Cooper-Smith. Time starts now. Hi there, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I appreciate in particular that this hearing is remote. I urge the council to continue this even in, in perpetuity into the future. I know I and the hundreds of other people on this call probably would not have been able to join were it in person in the council chambers. I also wanna point out on that note that even though this hearing is available via Zoom, it is still uh, unrepresentative of, of New York City's population. Only so many people can take time out of their day to testify at a hearing like this. And I hope that in this decision and in your other decisions moving forward, you will take the opportunity to take the, the broad, more representative scope of what New Yorkers truly want and need into consideration as you make your decisions. Uh, it won't shock you to hear that I'm in favor of this rezoning. In particular, I wanna emphasize that the, the, the area and Community District 2 and the rezoning area in particular is significantly whiter and wealthier than New York City as a whole. In addition, it has vastly underproduced its proportionate share of housing. I could argue, in fact, that it should be producing more housing and more affordable housing than rest of the rest of the city because of its access to jobs and transit and good schools. However, some parts of, of this community district have actually lost housing units over the last decade. Frankly, that's unacceptable. This, opportunity, this rezoning is an opportunity to begin to remedy that, although I, in my view, it doesn't go far enough. And in order to do that, we need to, to fix the, the commercial and the residential FAR imbalance. I urge the council and the mayor's office to um, reduce the commercial FARs and increase the residential FARs where appropriate and within state capacity limits. Uh, there's plenty more to be said. I'm sure that you will hear it later this afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to, to listen to us all and make this available. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker and last one on this panel is Michelle Coopersmith. Time starts now. Thanks. Hi, my name is Michelle Coopersmith. I'm a District 1 resident and I support rezoning Soho and NoHo. I was the first generation of my family since the 1890s to not grow up in New York, not because my parents didn't want to live here, but they could but because they couldn't afford to with the family. My father grew up in a one bedroom apartment with his mother and grandparents in Regal Park. And my mom shared a bedroom with her brother in East Flatbush. They saw the suburbs as somewhere they could live the American dream, which was only plausible in a place with abundant housing. Of course, I made it my mission to move back as soon as possible. And I now live two blocks from my grandmother's home on the Lower East Side, where she used to sleep on the fire escape to find space in a tenement apartment that housed her parents and six siblings. My family's history of crowded housing is the story of many in New Yorkers, but it doesn't have to be. My New York does not build enough housing for many reasons, but one of them is that it's so, many, so much of the city is hindered by restrictive zoning. Right now it is literally illegal to build so housing in Soho. A lucky few are able to get certified as artists decades ago and have now called Soho home for years. That doesn't mean they should be the only people that get to live in Soho for perpetuity. We need a Soho NoHo rezoning to update the restrictive zoning that hasn't been touched in 50 years when the neighborhood was zoned as a manufacturing district. New York needs more housing, period, and this will be the first time the administration has actually tried to rezone a neighborhood where mandatory inclusionary housing will work. So let's make sure the AMIs for any MIH housing built through this rezoning are as low as possible. Please also do whatever you can to prioritize residential building over commercial building. Just yesterday, Advocates for Children released a report that 100,000 NYC school kids were without stable homes during the last school year. Let's do the right thing and allow more homes to be built so we can start chipping away at that number. Also, I'd like to apologize to anyone who heard my name called multiple times during the Soho NoHo GCP hearing, where I unfortunately was unable to testify in the end. My job does not always allow me to block off an indefinite number of hours during a workday to sit in a hearing, like I'm sure many other New Yorkers. I hope council members consider any written testimony as carefully as live testimony. Just because you aren't privileged enough to sit in a public hearing for hours doesn't mean you don't care about the community. Thank you all for your time. 
Thank you, Michelle. Apologies, my camera was off. Um, Chair Levin, there's no council members with questions at this time, so I'll call on the next panel, which will be Jean Wilkie, Ingrid Vigan, Maria Feliciano, and Chuck Delaney. So the first speaker is Jean Wilkie to be followed by Ingrid Vigan. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Jeannie Wilkie. I'm co-chair of the NoHo Neighborhood Association, and as I was on the city's SoHo NoHo Advisory Committee. What originally started out as a plan to legalize ground floor use, uh, retail use, and find a path to legalize non-artists living in, uh, non-certified artists living in artist housing is now morphed into a monster. Right now, this plan has instrument surmountable flaws. The city's plan creates a mess of future problems and legal actions. We need a better plan for affordable housing, especially. The 747 airplane hangar wide of loopholes will not add affordable units, but it will add a lot of $25 million penthouses. Manufacturing loft buildings. Most cannot comply with residential building codes, thus no affordable housing added. This is also the first ever massive upzoning of a New York City and world known historic district. This will be the city council's legacy. Bullseye is on the back of tenants no matter what the city says. Over 50% of renters supposedly pay $2,000 a month and below. This area is also a red zone for air quality by the city's own data. Within and surrounding the area, the main thoroughfares between three bridges and the Holland Tunnel. Yet this area has one of the lowest per person of green spaces and open space by the city's own data, which will decrease further with this upzoning. The city kept talking, there are few artists left, but hundreds showed up again and again. Significantly, most of these were seniors. The so-called arts fund and new penalties is unfair and unequal taxation to the non-rich and long-term existing residents and a conundrum for co-ops, while commercial buildings get a free ride for extra FAR. Southeast Asia is Chinatown. City's PR campaign should not deny this. Diversity is most important, but the current plan creates even less diversity by having no guaranteed housing built in, and even if it was built in, a high AMI threshold. We want real affordable housing and diversity in our community. Help us achieve this. We need a better plan. Do not let the ghost of Robert Moses reappear to shame us all. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Ingrid Vigan, to be followed by Maria Feliciano. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, I'm Ingrid Vigan. I've lived and worked in Soho for decades. I was a young artist and a member of the original Soho Artists Association that negotiated the founding of Soho with the City Planning Commission back in 1969. I support changes that allow a more diverse range of people to live in Soho, but I oppose the way the rezoning gives the real estate industry a bonanza that has nothing to do with affordable housing. This plan talks of building contextually, but takes the tallest building in the area and makes that the context for building as many as 40 taller buildings in our low rise neighborhood. Please limit the height of new buildings to heights that are really contextual. I'm also for changing the zoning of the area from M15A to more appropriate zoning that better reflects the mid-use, mixed use area that Soho and NoHo have always been. I'm also for the ground, all ground floors to permit retail as of right, but that's no reason to not allow the expansion of retail stores beyond the current 10,000 square feet, inviting Walmart and other big box stores to gut our historic buildings and explode the population of shoppers that crowd our already crowded sidewalks. We really need affordable housing, not only in Soho, no, but other areas of the city. But we need this city council to do that without giving the real estate industry ways to crowd our neighborhoods with new glitzy places to rent and sell to their money buyers. We're counting on you to do both. Build new housing, but save Soho and Noho from this deeply flawed plan. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next speaker is Maria Feliciano to be followed by Chuck Delaney. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Maria Feliciano and I am a residential owner and board member at 543 Broadway 114 Mercer Street. I represent 18 families in this building. We oppose the DCP's rezoning plan while supporting diversity and housing fairness in our midst. Because our community representatives focus and priorities commercial and real estate interests, the only winners in this proposal, residential voices have been abandoned and left to advocate for ourselves. Unlike real estate uh, property owners who have no interest in affordable housing, residents are not represented by our elected officials. DCP and our local representatives have a vision for the future of Soho and NoHo that does not include residents, present, future, or affordable. The point here is to commercialize 100% this district. When our building is rendered uninhabitable due to the callously conceived JLWQA conversion to UG2 general residential zoning, what then? Will the 18 families that live here be expected to exit our homes and mass and for cheap, sell our properties to real estate speculators? For what? Hair salons, gyms? Contrary to, and respectfully, uh, to Anita Lerman's misleading introduction to this meeting, we are not adjacent to vibrant communities. We are a vibrant community. We are not a commercial district. We are a mixed use district of residential and commercial voices. More than 8,000 people reside here. And I urge you to consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. The next speaker and the last one on this panel is Chuck Delaney. Time starts now. Council Member Chin, committee members, uh, committee staff. The City Planning Commission's proposed SOHO and NOHO rezoning is a terrible idea. Overwhelmingly rejected by Manhattan Community Board 2, criticized by Borough President Brewer. I know others will testify to many reasons that the council should reject this proposal. Hell's Hundred Acres, as Soho was once known, was pioneered for residential use by artists and fellow travelers in the 1960s and 70s. The best option is to reject this proposal and start anew. The damaging aspect of this proposal I want to highlight is the danger to loft tenants and other low and moderate income tenants in Soho, NoHo, and adjoining neighborhoods, particularly Chinatown. As one of the four founders of Lower Manhattan loft tenants in the 1970s, and as the tenant representative on the loft board, I have been in many loft units in Soho and NoHo over the years. If adopted, this proposal would put many residential buildings at risk of demolition. For the record, I must note that I'm not providing this testimony on behalf of the loft board. Rather, as a longtime tenant organizer, I speak on behalf of loft tenants who are being put at risk by this proposal, particularly because CPC staff that drafted it never comprehended the laws and provisions that protect this unique community and that allowed it to flourish. And indeed, it does flourish. There are no artists left in Soho, then Koch Administration Deputy Mayor Robert Esnard told a group of loft tenants way back in the mid 1980s. That wasn't true then, and it's not true today. However, amid the tourists and shoppers that the artists' presence helped attract to the neighborhood, you have to look for them, but they're there on Green Street, Crosby, Broadway, Mercer Street, and all through this unique zone. Sadly, city planning staff made little effort to count them or calculate the threat their proposal creates for these pioneers. I will submit detailed written testimony. I'm expired. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. That was the last speaker on the panel, Chair Levin, and I don't see any council members with questions, so I'm gonna call on the next panel, which will be Kathleen Webster, Ryder Kessler, Mikey Lampel, and Ken Ayu. So the first speaker is Kathleen Webster, followed by Ryder Kessler. Time starts now. Oh, good day. My name 
is Kathleen Blakem of the Met Council on Housing. For 50 years, I have lived in the community as a rent-stabilized tenant, and I'm very familiar with the needs of our community. Please vote no for the proposed upzoning of Soho, NoHo, Chinatown. This upzoning is another giant giveaway to developers during de Blasio's lame duck year in office. Many are de Blasio donors who lobbied relentlessly for this giveaway. Such development would cause the demolition of more than 600 units of rent-regulated housing. These units are the homes of lower-income and Asian-American residents. Also, this rezoning will incentivize secondary displacement of thousands more tenants in the surrounding area who are Asian-American and lower-income residents. This plan includes office, hotel, and other commercial space, as well as luxury condo space and facility space for institutions like NYU, which are all exempt from affordable housing requirements. The pandemic has had a devastating impact on New Yorkers. Over a million New Yorkers have lost jobs and are facing eviction because they cannot pay the rent. Over 70,000 New Yorkers are without stable homes. Our community does not need another upzoning for super luxury housing and commercial corridors. This proposed plan will not provide or preserve needed true affordable housing, rather it will only increase the housing prices of New York. The corporate change in the commercial corridor will be the death knell of small businesses. During the pandemic, 50% of small businesses have closed. New Yorkers need commercial rent control to save and revive small businesses, not another giveaway to corporate chains. Please vote no to this rezoning plan, and please consider the plans proposed by Village Preservation right. and Working Group. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. The next speaker on this panel is Ryder Kessler, to be followed by Mikey Lampel. Time starts now. Hi there. Um, my name is Ryder Kessler. I'm a member of Community Board 2. Um, unlike many of my board colleagues, I'm here to urge you to approve rezoning of Soho NoHo. I want to focus in on our progressive values. Uh, first, as progressives, we say we're committed to following the facts, and the facts here are clear. We have a housing supply crisis. The lack of housing stock in New York is the primary driver of high costs that make New York the most expensive rental market in the nation. Social science research demonstrates unequivocally that building more housing, including market rate housing, lowers prices for everyone and reduces displacement. Second, we say we're committed to racial equity. When we do build housing here in New York, it's disproportionately in poorer black and brown neighborhoods. Meanwhile, largely white and wealthy neighborhoods like Soho and NoHo do not contribute to new housing stock and that has to change. Third, I wanna highlight the question of sustainability. It's another self-described progressive value. We are in the midst of a climate crisis. New York experienced record rainfall twice within just weeks this year. The single most important step we can take to ameliorate climate change is to generate housing density in transit rich areas like Soho and NoHo. So overall legalizing housing production in Soho and NoHo is a critical step to making New York more affordable, less segregated and more sustainable. I urge the council to approve this rezoning with the recommended modifications to reduce commercial density so that vital housing production is not crowded out. Thank you. Thank you, Ryder. The next speaker is Mikey Lampel, to be followed by Ken Ayo. Thank you for having me today. My name is Mikey Lampel. I'm a member of Open New York, a lifelong Manhattan resident, and a student at NYU's Wagner School of Public Service at the Puck Building in Soho. I strongly support the proposed rezoning to create thousands of desperately needed units of mixed income housing. Going to school in Soho and NoHo is a privilege because the neighborhood showcased some of the greatest aspects Time of Time expired. Wait, I, that Yeah, I think, I think we need to reset that clock. That was, I think, leftover from Ryder's clock. I can continue. Okay, go ahead. Um, going to school in Soho and NoHo is a privilege because the neighborhood showcased some of the greatest aspects of New York City a vibrant art scene, historic architecture, and incomparable transit access. However, Soho and NoHo also represent many of the city's fixable inequities. The neighborhoods can contain almost zero units of deeply affordable housing. Market rate apartments are far out of reach for the middle class, 
and they are two of the least diverse neighborhoods in the whole city. This rezoning plan will preserve and build upon what makes in Soho and Noho such vibrant neighborhoods, but it will help eliminate the structural inequities that make them so inaccessible. The creation of an estimated 900 units of deeply affordable housing will be a life-changing development for the families that can move in and finally escape the horrors of housing insecurity. There are hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers in need of affordable housing that the city does not have. So it is a moral imperative to build affordable units in every neighborhood of the city, especially ones like Soho that currently don't have any. Building new housing in Soho and Noho would take rent pressures off of surrounding neighborhoods and it would lower the city's unacceptable levels of residential segregation by allowing a diverse group of people to move into a wealthy and predominantly white neighborhood. I also believe the rezoning can be improved by reducing commercial densities to incentivize more housing as opposed to office space. Lastly, the community preference policy should be altered to include residents outside of CB2 so that low income workers from adjacent neighborhoods are eligible for more affordable units. In the 50 years since SOHO and NOHO zoning laws came into effect, the neighborhoods and the city as a whole have changed considerably. It's time the zoning changed too. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. The last speaker on this panel is Ken Ayo. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? We can yep, hear you. Can you. Okay, great, got you. Uh, thank you. So uh, I just want to uh, express my support for the rezoning. Um, I, I, I think adding uh, homes for 3,000 people, mixed income housing, um, and then um, also 900 homes for, uh, sorry, uh, for 900 families uh, who are desperate need of affordable housing is a great idea. Um, I would like us to encourage the um, maximizing the incentives for um, um, uh, residential instead of uh, office space. So I would like to see the city council to reduce the com uh, commercial densities um, and, and maximize the residential densities. Um, I also would like to see a city uh, broaden the community preference um, as a means for integration. Um, as a uh, former uh, historic, uh, uh, historic district resident, um, uh, I often find myself the only Hispanic um, in my district. Um, so increasing and broadening the community preference to those who work in the rezoning uh, area or live in other neighborhoods that um, uh, besides Soho, no, I think uh, be a huge gain to integration in the city. Um, since before the city was the second most segregation um, in the country. Uh, and then lastly, for I'd like to echo uh, my previous uh, colleague uh, who, who mentioned our progressive values, right? So we often, as progressives, like to say that we are pro-immigration um, and what have you. But then, you know, it's one thing to be pro-immigration, but if you don't provide them a home, hey, that's not pro-immigration. And so creating affordable housing um, is a key step in that process of immigration. Um, time expired. Yeah, and if I'm running low on time, um, I'll uh, see the rest of my time. But uh, please vote yes for the uh, rezoning and reduce the office densities and broaden the uh, community preference. Thank, Thank you. you, Ken. Can you say your name for the record, though? We didn't. Oh, my name is Ken. It. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chair Levin, I don't see any council members with questions, so I'm going to call on the next panel, which is going to be Hugh Evans, Sarah Eccles, Trevor Stewart, and Frederica Siegel. So the first speaker is Hugh Evans, followed by Sarah Eccles. Time starts now. I don't see here, but can we then call on Sarah Eccles and we'll call on you Time. Time starts now. Myself. Okay, I got it. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Eccles and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. 
Um, in response to the widespread criticisms that their plan will likely result in little or no new affordable housing and oversized big box chain stores, the city made some changes to their proposal. To call them window dressing would be an insult to window dressing. Analysis we performed and submitted to the council show small changes to the allowable commercial FAR will have no effect on the likely production of affordable housing. First of all, 88% of the sites where the city predicts affordable housing will be built where were outside of the area covered by the changes and therefore unaffected. But even with the changes, we found that the rezoning still allows developers to build the maximum allowable amount of FAR without including any affordable housing on 92% of the sites where the city predicts affordable housing will be built. On the other 8% of sites, even with the changes, under the rezoning, developers can still build more market rate space when they don't include affordable housing than when they do. With such incentives, why would any developer choose to include affordable housing? And the requirement for special permits for loading docks for stores over 10,000 square feet is a hollow, meaningless gesture addressing none of the harms the rezoning will do to, to a small business. The plan remains a sham and a developer giveaway, even with the changes. We urge you to vote now. Thank you, Sarah. The next speaker that we skipped, I see him in the Zoom now, is Hugh Evans. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Hugh Evans, pronouns are they, them, and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. Projections about the affordable housing this plan will produce is based on the city's claim that no developer will choose to just pay into a fund rather than include affordable housing, as they're allowed to for developments with 25,000 square feet of residential space or less. The city's main argument is that no developer has chosen to do this so far, but as per documentation we've submitted, that's an outlandish basis for arguing that it won't happen here. By far the majority of those other developments the city has cited and had additional public funding, making them 100% affordable. So paying into a fund to avoid including affordable housing wasn't an option. And all those other developments were located in much weaker housing markets where market rate units command fairly similar or even slightly lower rents than the quote, affordable unquote units, providing little incentive to pay into a fund to avoid providing affordable units. But in Soho and NoHo, Market rate units bring in astronomically higher rents or sales prices than affordable ones, giving developers a huge financial incentive to limit their residential space to 25,000 square feet, pay into the fund, and avoid providing any affordable housing at all. If they have unused floor area, they'll just fill the rest of the building with lucrative retail, office, hotel, or community facility space, which has no affordable housing requirement. This is just one more reason why we strongly urge you to vote no on this plan. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Hugh. Um, Chair Moya is back. So Chair Moya, next speaker is Trevor Stewart. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Council Member Levin for uh, stepping in uh, during this time. Uh, Trevor, whenever you're ready. Time starts now. Uh, Trevor, we gotta, you gotta unmute yourself. My name is Trevor. Hold on. Trevor, hold on one second. You, you got to unmute yourself one more time. I'll get it right. There you finish. go. Now we, now we hear you. <laughs> My name is Trevor Stewart, and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. One of the many reasons to oppose this deeply troubling plan is the enormous scale of development it allows. Uh, for all practical purposes, the current maximum allowable FAR here is five since a higher FAR is only allowed for a very narrow band of community facilities. But under the rezoning, the allowable FAR increases at least 30% to 6.5, but also 94% to 9.7 FAR in some areas, and a mind-boggling 140% to 12 FAR in other areas. This is enormous, not only compared to the very generous size of new development currently allowed, but to existing buildings in the rezoning area, which average around 4.8 FAR. The maximum allowable FAR of 12 is two and a half times that size. That's 20% larger than allowed for residential developments on Billionaires Row in Midtown. In fact, it's the highest residential density legally allowed in New York State. 
This not only means grossly out of scale construction, but huge financial incentives for demolishing existing buildings smaller than what the new zoning allows, including buildings of historic significance, both landmarks, landmarked and those listed on the National Register, but not landmarked, as well as buildings with affordable rent regulated units. The dramatic unprecedented proposed upzoning is not only wrong, it's unnecessary to achieve the plan's purported goals. Mandatory inclusionary housing requirements uh, could be applied to new developments at the maximum allowable FAR of five. For these and many other reasons, we urge you to vote no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Next speaker is Frederica Siegel. Time starts now. My name is Frederica Siegel. Although I am chair of CB2's Land Use and Housing Committee, today I'm speaking as an individual. This plan is an unacceptable substitute for direct city investment in affordable housing. We need to revise mandatory inclusionary housing with text that mandates higher percentages of permanently affordable housing and lower median incomes. Eliminate any funds, offsite housing options and payments in lieu that would create affordable housing outside CB2. Expand the preference area to include Chinatown. Please eliminate the potential for any combination of bonus packages that would result in buildings as much as 40% greater than FAR would permit. The plan must better address demolition, displacement, and other forms of involuntary housing loss. It fails to take sufficient steps to protect residents during conversions from joint live work to use group two. Apply the toughest protections available. Require unequivocal proof that each conversion is voluntary. Please eliminate the arts fund. But if you don't, restrict the funds it generates to the rezoned area and reduce the tax to a maximum of $5 per square foot just like in Hudson Square. Apply it to every type of request for a use conversion. I reiterate the community's longstanding opposition to lifting the current caps on eating and drinking and oversized retail. Why not institute a special permit when restaurants exceed 200 total seats as in Hudson Square? Develop tough quality of life performance standards to govern retail deliveries, hours of operation, lighting, refuse and inventory storage. Lastly, Please prohibit dormitories and close any loophole that would let NYU expand further into Soho and NoHo, which they did pledge to do, to not do, in 2012. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Uh, Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel, and I don't see council members with questions, so I'm going to call on the next panel, which is going to be Eric Goshow, Harrison Grinnan. Margaret Basley and Megan Hines. So Eric Gosho, followed by Harrison Grinnan, the next panel. I'm starts now. Eric, we can hear you. I don't know what happened here, but anyway, Hello. can you hear me? We can hear you. Well, Chair, um, well, uh, I'm trying to get by my May. Hold on, let, let, we'll, let, let's restart the clock on you, Eric. Hold on one second, okay? Sorry, it won't no take worries. long. No worries. It seemed to get, yeah, where's my camera? We can hear you, no. no. All right, well, Chair Moya, my name is Eric Gosho. I'm a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. My firm, Gosho Architects, uh, is very much involved in housing in New York City, including affordable and supportive housing. But I'm not writing about, uh, from that point of view, I'm writing as a reading and writing and talking as a citizen of the greatest of American cities, one with flaws and opportunities, two of which I'd like to mention here. The first is the obvious and desperate need for housing in New York City. Housing of all types, for all people, in all boroughs, in all areas of our city. Our zoning laws intended to create well-being and safety for all no longer serve that purpose. By limiting residential density, our zoning resolution simply restricts the ability of many 
to live here by implicitly encouraging rising housing costs. This has to change. Secondly, is the, sec is the segregated nature of our neighborhoods, perhaps unintentionally supported by the marketplace and its interpretation of zoning laws. The rich and mostly white here, the poor and mostly color there. In this great city that I love, one of the great pleasures is the knowledge that here we can all exist together, work together, eat food from all over the globe together, worship as we see fit together. We're a melting pot of comedy and civility. These two flaws suggest opportunities to make our city more open, more inclusive, more civil. The NoHo SoHo rezoning accomplishes both goals, goals of more housing and housing more integrated and more representative of our city's diversity. Time expired. This rezoning will act as a model for others. Thank you very much. Sorry for the yeah, delays. No worries. Thank you for the <laughs> testimony. Have a good day, Eric. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Harrison Grinnan. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Harrison Grinnan. I work for a large company in Midtown with many coworkers who are immigrants. Of my coworkers, not a single one with children is able to afford to live inside the boundaries of New York City, despite white collar pay. When I brought that up at the first community board meeting I've ever attended, a meeting community board two in Manhattan, I was shouted over hearing white homeowners yell, who cares and oh boo hoo. A member of the community board said that Soho should not have to bear the burden of providing affordable housing because of its contributions to culture and its cobblestone streets and that Jay-Z owning property there showed that it was a diverse place. At a second meeting, a representative of the Municipal Arts Society said that an alternative plan was better and then under questioning from Gail Brewer about what would be better, said that actually the area was simply too expensive and thus not a good location for affordable housing. I believe that contrary to those voices, Soho does have a duty to the rest of the city to do its fair share to help with the housing crisis. By contrast to the previous rezonings, and especially the previous administration's down zonings and specifically rich white neighborhoods, this rezoning gives us the opportunity to turn the page on the failed policies of the past. The area is extraordinarily wealthy and exclusive with sky high market rate rents to prove it. Rents have rebounded from their pandemic lows and the average asking rent in Street Easy in the area is currently $5,800 per month. These sky high market rates are great for mandatory inclusionary housing. What it means is that with zero subsidy from the state, these high rents will support affordable housing for people who can't afford the market rents. When mandatory inclusionary housing is used in poorer neighborhoods, it struggles, but in a neighborhood like this, it will succeed. With this rezoning, not only will wealthy people be able, wealthy people be able to move to new housing instead of creating a chain of displacement as they outbid existing tenants who are not lucky enough to have rent control, those same rich people will end up subsidizing will hopefully total about a thousand households living at fixed rents in an area with extraordinary access to jobs, transit, and schools. This rezoning won't be easy as I learned watching community member members shout abuse at anyone speaking in favor of it, including the Department of City Planning staff. The opponents of it know what they stand to lose, a one-way ratchet on property values and rents. Achieving housing justice is a cause worthy of standing up to these bullies, their lawsuits, and the publicity their money buys. I hope you will work expired. To this is the kind of action upon which legacies are made. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. The next speaker, and I'm not sure we have her, but Margaret, if, Margaret Basley, so if you are um, there, please unmute yourself. Time starts. Margaret, if you can hear us, all you have to do is unmute yourself. We can come back to her because I see our next speaker speaker ready. So Megan Hines. Time starts now. Hi, um, I'm gonna be quick um, because I have my two month old baby uh, on my lap right now, but I'm here to speak in favor of the rezoning. Uh, we have a housing crisis, climate crisis and social justice crisis. And this is one of the few actions we can take that chips away at all three of them. Uh, we need to, pay down our housing shortage, that housing needs to be in transit rich and walkable neighborhoods to reduce reliance on cars, and white wealthy neighborhoods need to step up and start doing their fair share in terms of housing production. I would also say that this is a process that is uh, very undemocratic and not very uh, well sampled. It 
uh, gathering opinions on the topic. I can say as like a working person and now as a young mom, it's very, very difficult to come to these meetings and sit for hours waiting for, waiting for people to speak. So just you know, keep that in mind as you listen to people's testimonies today because it's not a particularly representative sample. Thank you. People can always submit uh, their testimony, um, Megan, if they can't, but you know, a lot of, this is our forum that we have here and we try to keep it as open as possible. That's why we do these hearings that go on uh, for several hours. Um, and so we thank you for your patience and we appreciate your testimony today. And um, we wanna make sure that everyone has the ability to uh, speak. And if not, we can always remind folks where they can send their testimony uh, to the, uh, the city council so that they're able to uh, submit that and uh, they, their voices will be heard. And with that, uh, let us move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Chair Moy, it looks like we couldn't get Margaret basically. So, and I don't see any council member questions. So we can move on to the next panel, which will be Catherine Schoonover, David Mulkin, Alita Camp, and Victoria Fariello. Catherine Schoonover, first speaker. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Schoonover and I am speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. As has been noted by several other speakers, among the many unconscionable elements of the rezoning plan is the allowance for big box chain retail and eating and drinking establishments of unlimited size throughout the rezoning area including on narrow side streets, which form the majority of the rezoning area. Do Soho, NoHo, Chinatown, or New York City for that matter, really need more of these? This will only make it impossible for anything but huge chain stores or giant restaurants or bars to survive there and will harm smaller local independent businesses. This helps no one but the big developers and big landlords who've been lobbying in favor of this plan. Large chains take revenue out of our city and turn our neighborhoods into giant outdoor malls indistinguishable from anywhere else. Oversized chain stores, bars, and restaurants don't tend to support healthy, successful retail environments as we see higher retail vacancies in areas with large numbers of chains than in those with independent businesses. They will also generate huge amounts of vehicular traffic in what is already one of the most traffic clogged areas of New York City. One of many reasons groups like the Sierra Club New York City oppose this plan on environmental grounds. Residents support reasonable size limits on retail, such as 5,000 square feet for eating and drinking establishments and 10,000 square feet for general retail. This proposal is nothing more than an unmitigated giveaway to powerful corporate interests, and we strongly urge you to reject it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker. The next speaker will be Alita Kemp. Time starts. Sorry, Bethany, I'm muting. Thank you. Thank you for hearing my testimony. My name is Alita Camp. I love to explore New York's various neighborhoods. The proposed SoHo NoHo plan should be a no-no plan. No, because the numbers are wrong. While affordable housing is essential to the survival and vitality of New York, 20 to five to 30% affordable means 70 to 75% market rate, uh, decreasing diversity while increasing financial incentives for property owners. No, because this plan will destroy one of New York's treasures. New York is a gorgeous mosaic as former mayor David Dinkins defined diverse New Yorkers. However, neighborhoods provide the community essential to the city's vitality. Neighborhoods thrive through protections afforded by zoning and historic and special districts. Distinct neighborhoods are why people want to move here, live here, stay here, visit here, and spend money here. This plan will irre irremediably damage the special character of Soho Noho and parts of Chinatown. No, because ironically, low income and senior residents will lose their housing in the affected parts of Chinatown. No, because small businesses in Chinatown will be lost. 
No, because artists will lose their homes. The Times real estate section this weekend pointed out the rare event of live work artist spaces. Is this something to be thrown away? No, because the special character of Soho as an artist enclave will be lost to encroaching residential towers and big box stores of suburban size as of right. Communities and neighborhoods destroy, deserve protection to preserve livability for residents, allow small businesses to flourish, and maintain character and a tie to New York's layers of history. Soho Noho are an important part of New York's history, with a unique character as first a manufacturing area leading to the vernacular architecture, and then as an artist community building upon New York's reputation as a magnetic artist environment. Don't allow a plan to damage their character, the very thing that drives New Yorkers and visitors alike to the Soho Noho communities. The proposed plan is not worthy of New York and one of its iconic neighborhoods. There are better alternatives. Make this the no-no plan. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Next speaker is Victoria Fariello. Time starts. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Victoria Fariello. I'm a district leader in Lower Manhattan. Um, I am here to uh, ask that the city council vote no on the zoning uh, proposal. The proposed zoning plan does not guarantee affordable housing. We've heard that from many, many people. There are infinite loopholes in MIH that can be used to skirt any affordable housing requirement. For example, you can build dormitories or you can choose to build offices, other, other means to just avoid building affordable housing. So we need to be clear that this is not about affordable housing. There's much greater likelihood that this will generate displacement rather than create affordable housing. Instead, we should be focusing our efforts on sites such as Five World Trade Center, where we could have up to 1,300 affordable units in a truly resource-rich neighborhood that would not displace a single person. Or to Howard Street in Soho, where, that could provide 300 units of affordable housing. The proposed plan is an incredible disrespect to the community leaders and members who have been working with elected officials to provide meaningful feedback to them. But the plan remains virtually unchanged after 14 months. They put hours of work with the belief that their input mattered. Instead, they've been completely disregarded. For these reasons, among others, I strongly urge our council members to vote no on the proposed zoning rezoning plan. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. The last speaker on this panel is David Mulkin. Time starts. Hi, um, I'm the president of the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors and a 25-year public high school history teacher. This upzoning plan contains no guarantee that any affordable housing would be built and is widely perceived as a giveaway to big real estate. After long months of workshops and meetings at which the city assured the community that its voices would be heard, the plan produced by city planning ignores our voices and obviously was preconceived a long time before. This process was a sham and the end result is a mess. The area's incoming city council member Chris Marte strongly opposes it and community board two voted by a staggering 36 to one to reject the plan. Soho and NoHo are iconic, economically thriving, historic districts, famous for cast iron architecture and as incubators for modern art. By adding height and bulk, big box superstores, luxury housing, and NYU dorms, this upzoning plan would destroy the area's unique creative character and displace longtime residents and businesses especially in Chinatown. Lastly, this bold plan shows contempt for the city's half century old landmarks law. If passed, it would set a terrible precedent for the destruction of historic districts in every borough in the city. As such, you cannot vote on this as merely a lower Manhattan issue. For the good of the entire city, Please vote to reject the Soho NoHo rezoning plan. Thank you. Tara, that was the last speaker on this panel, and I don't see any council members with questions. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions, uh, can we call up the next panel, please? Arthur, do you want to call the next panel? Next panel will include Enzo Repetto, Campbell Munn, Nicholas O, and Max Livingston. First speaker on the panel will be Enzo Repetto, followed by Campbell Munn. Time starts. Hello? Hello? Yes. Hello. Hello there. Uh, my name is Enzo Repetto. I'm a current NYU student who's attending, and I wanted to voice my support in favor of the SOHO NOHO Rezoning Act. And my, um, the reason I support this plan basically is I've seen many students and many of my friends planning to live in the city in the future. But at the current rate that we're seeing housing right now, it seems more and more unlikely due to rising costs. The only way that we're going to be able to address this is that we need to be able to up public transportation and build in areas where public transportation already exists. The best way to do this is that we need to start up zoning places such as Soho in order to be able to build up and create these opportunities for people to live in in the future. It would be more affordable housing and also prevent gentrification by building in places that have been decreasing housing over time. Over this time, We'd see more housing in other areas. And overall, that's my take on it. Thank you. The next speaker. You testimony. Next speaker. Campbell Munn, who will be followed by Max Livingston. I'm Starch. Campbell, you're on. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Campbell. Can I get, oh, thank you so much. My name is Campbell Munn. I'm 20 years old and I'm a junior studying architecture and urban planning at NYU Gallatin. I live on 103 Second Avenue on the border of the East Village in NoHo, uh, just one block from the rezoning's affected area. I spend much of my free time and classroom time in the neighborhood, often even in the buildings potentially affected by the rezoning. Uh, in short, I'm testifying in strong support of the proposed rezoning with one caveat. The rezoning should not proceed with the commercial FAR increases as proposed. We principally have a housing crisis, not a shopping or an office crisis. With that said, I'll spend the rest of my time speaking to the three reasons why I support the rezoning. Soho NoHo is one of the few neighborhoods of NYC to have lost housing in the last decade, but the neighborhood has seen endemic apartment create urban palaces out of their neighbors' homes is abhorrent. It is no secret that the city is experiencing an acute and not soon to end housing crisis. The rezoning would finally end the year-on-year -year increase in the neighborhood's housing stock. Two, the affordable housing in the rezoning is set to provide a crucial step to desegregating New York City. We are familiar with the rezoning, excuse me, with the history of redlining and the recent federal, the racist federal housing policies enacted in the 1930s. However, this legacy is not behind us and it is incumbent upon this generation to do all it can to bring about a more just and integrated New York City. The hundreds of affordable homes would bring racial and economic integration to a neighborhood known as a rich man's playground. This is a truly exceptional opportunity to take a bold step to a more equitable New York. Three, finally, I want to address the historic nature of the district. Specifically, I want to talk about an example on the, lower, uh, on the west side of Lafayette Street between 4th Street and Astor Place. This is the former site of a full stack of colonnade houses built by John Jacob Astor in the 1830s. As this wealthy neighborhood turned into the warehouse district in the 1850s, a number of the colonnade houses were replaced by store and loft buildings and later full lots. Time. A number of buildings have since been landmarked or mentioned in the 1999 LPC NOHO designation report. This is to say that new construction can exist with older construction and often one landmark building can be replaced by another. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker, please. Max Livingston, who will be followed by Nicholas O. Hi, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. My name is Max Livingston. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'd like to start out by voicing my strong agreement with the need to upzone Soho and NoHo. My primary concern, uh, echoing what many others have said, uh, with the current rezoning plan is that <coughs> office densities are too generous, which could result in developers opting to build new offices rather than new residences. Um, upzoning wealthy areas in New York 
is a crucial and necessary policy tool to counter the climate crisis, the housing affordability crisis, and to combat the legacy of segregation, redlining, and racial injustice in housing. Um, as someone who is from New York originally, from the Upper West Side, um, when I moved out of my parents' apartment after college, I would have loved to live in Lower Manhattan. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff there. It's beautiful. Uh, it's close to my job. Unfortunately, the city's housing construction peaked in the 60s. So while there were plenty of apartments available for my parents' generation, and I would note the generation of a lot of the SoFo residents who I see testifying in opposition today, there were way fewer apartments to go around for the city's growing population when their children, my generation, tried to move into our own apartments. Um, so I moved to Crown Heights in Brooklyn. And I love Crown Heights, it's a great neighborhood as well. It's much farther from work, and I'm sure, you know, walking around that I look the part of a gentrifier. But I just want to say that the actual gentrifiers are the ones in meetings like these opposing with a passion that I didn't realize people could have about zoning, uh, any reasonable change to the ancient zoning code, um, opposing any new housing being built near them, fighting so, so hard for the status quo, really just uh, the true definition of small c conservatives um, in what is one of the most liberal cities uh, in the country. Um, if the city had taken such a slow approach to building the housing stock that it already had, um, most of Brooklyn would still be Dutch farmland. We need more housing now. That's the only way to solve the affordability crisis. I would also like to say that trying to govern a city of 8 million people through public comment and direct democracy is kind of ridiculous. I have the ability, in fact, I recently did, elect and or vote against a mayor, borough president, city council member, state assembly person, state senator, governor, and among others. I vote for them because I trust them to govern. I trust them I'm to check the facts. An event like this is guaranteed to attract people of vested opposed interests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker. Next and last speaker will be Nicholas Ho. Hi. Um, Hi. Um, I support this rezoning. Um, I, uh, you know, New York City is the greatest city in the world because of growth, because of change. New people, um, immigrants move here. I myself, I'm an immigrant. Um, you know, uh, uh, I'm very lucky to be here, but, you know, many of my family members who were immigrants and came, you know, at the same time as I did, um, had to leave New York City because, um, you know, the rent is simply too high because we have this devastating housing shortage. And, and ultimately, the solution is to build more housing. Um, you know, currently, we renters, we compete for limited housing, whereas by building more, landlords will have to compete for us renters and the way they'll do it is by lowering rents or increasing quality. Um, to a great extent, I feel like a lot of the opponents of the rezoning are um, homeowners who, um, you know, when the rents go up, they don't feel it. They just see, they might see their property values go up and they don't see it. But when the rents go up for us renters, we just see ourselves, you know, one step closer to um, having to move again. Um, you know, imagine, I don't know when was the last time a lot of these opponents even looked for a rental apartment for themselves to live in. Um, so, uh, I asked the city council to think about the 900 families who could move into the affordable housing, uh, through this, uh, rezoning, as long as the 2000 families who can move into the market rate housing, which in turn will free up 2000 extra units outside of Soho NoHo, helping another 2000 families. That's just, that's 5,000 families who can benefit from this. Um, and all the people and all the renters who couldn't be here at this hearing to speak, to uh, speak up uh, for themselves. Um, finally, as a Chinese, a member of the Chinese American uh, Chinese community in New York City, I think it's not really appropriate for uh, other people, rich white people, to use us as pawns. Um, you know, it, despite being next door, Chinatown was excluded from school district two because Soho parents don't want their kids to go to school with Chinatown kids. So I think that you know what we should do is approve the rezoning and expand the community preference to Chinatown folks so they can uh, get priority to the Soho units. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, next speaker, please. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel, and I see no members with questions for this panel. So with your permission, we can uh, call the next panel, which will include Alexander Naratov, Renee Monrose, Ali Ryan and Emily Hellstrom. First speaker will be Alexander Naratov to be followed by Renee Monrose. Time starts. Alexander Naratov, architect, member of the Envision Advisory Group, living and working in Soho for more than 40 years. 
representing New York loft tenants as well as private clients. Portions um, of this massive rezoning are not well worked out. It took 50 years to get there. Uh, the remaining six weeks seem too short to rethink and rewrite this text. The city council should consider these points and others I'll present in written testimony. One, substantial demolition follows increases in FAR covering non-fireproof buildings exceeding their construction class height limits. Demolition will lead to evictions. Strong new protections for rent regulated housing must be included. Two, the underbuilding disincentive, page 57 and 58, should clearly include commercial only construction above the first floor to tie MIH equally to commercial as well as residential construction triggers. Three, most problematic is the fate of joint living work quarters for artists. This use is preserved, but no new conversions to or new JLWQA floor areas allowed, forcing the juxtaposition of these uses in new partial conversions and inevitable enlargements, exposing MDL and building code incompatibilities, depth of lighting and ventilation, studio use restrictions, egress yards and courts, requiring expensive CFO changes to implement. What really does not work is a proposal to impose an enormous tax on the very artists and homesteaders who created the neighborhood in order for them to sell their spaces. There is a simple way to eliminate this painful solution, eliminate the problem. New artist certification was already deleted by the proposal. That leaves no reason to maintain artist exclusivity in joint living work quarters for artists. Declare them to be joint living work quarters for anyone and preserve the one valuable characteristic of mixed use space, no limits to the percentage of the space used to live or to work, while solving the compatibility problems outlined above by simple text changes coordinated with the New York State Legislature. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your testimony. Next, next speaker. The next speaker will be Emily Helstrom, to be followed by Renee Monroe. I'm Starch. Hi, my name is Emily Hellstrom, and I've lived in Soho since 1996 and spent over half my life here. I have been a theater artist here. I'm choosing to raise my family here. I have made community here. I am the president of my co-op board, the largest residential building on Broadway, the vice president of the Soho Broadway bid, and I am an active participant in the civil life of the civic life of this neighborhood and this city. But my voice does not count. People from Soho, NoHo, Chinatown, and all over downtown Manhattan who are equally woven into the fabric of this vibrant, vibrating place are all fiercely pleading with you to stop this bad plan. A plan that doesn't accomplish what it set out to and will have unintended consequences that will ripple throughout this city and radically and permanently alter the, this world famous place. But it is clear those neighborhood voices do not count. Our community and many organizations I sit on have come to the table with real compromises, yet almost no changes to this plan have been made throughout this entire process. No, the only voice that matters here today is money. At the root of this rotten rezoning is money, a commercial real estate bailout cloaked in virtue signaling. Trickle-down housing does not work where market forces do not follow the normal paths and huge real estate interests have millions of dollars to spend exploiting loopholes. During an envisioned Soho NoHo, I sat next to someone high up in Bornado Realty Trust who openly advocated for allowances for rooftop penthouses. One of those loopholes, rooftop penthouses. What are we doing here? A blunt instrument like off the shelf zoning will open up a cascade of unintended consequences. But if money counts, then I will be plain. This plan will fundamentally reshape a neighborhood that currently draws millions of visitors per year from which the city reaps enormous amounts of money using a plan that will put unprecedented power over the direction of the neighborhood into the hands of large real estate holders. I hope your voice will count. Please vote no and let's get started on a real conversation to tackle the problems we all know exist and we all want to work on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Allie Ryan will be the next speaker. Time starts. Okay. Hello, my name is Allie Ryan, and I'm a Council District 2 resident and a documentary film producer with a small production company. I request all city council members to vote no on the proposed SoHo NoHo neighborhood plan. 
a yes vote, even with negotiations, will create a visual legacy of significantly enabling the demolition of an internationally recognizable neighborhoods for their signature architecture and signaling the death toll for small businesses in an area that is specifically known and celebrated for small businesses and finally displacing elderly and artists who created these neighborhoods now wanting to age in place. Today, I wanna to bring a face to the potential large retail over, um, over 25,000 square feet. Encouraging large retail over 25,000 25, square feet discourages small business owners. Commercial truck traffic is not just sanitation trucks, but tractor trailers bringing in goods for these larger stores. I see this as a result of two targets that have moved into the Lower East Side. Just drive into the suburbs and you will see the sprawl of 25,000 square feet large retail, such as Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, Knolls, among other chains. History has shown that these large box stores have swallowed small storefronts. And in recent years, even before COVID lockdown, the growth of online shopping has caused retail stores to abandon their physical spaces as seen right now, if you walk down Broadway. In closing, I wanna say city council members, please vote now on this plan and send DCP back to the drawing board under the next mayor's administration with a mandate to work with the Envision report recommendations, keeping in mind that consumer habits have changed as well as live work habits. Thank you. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. I see no members with questions for the panel. So with your permission, we can call up the next panel. Uh, that will include Laura Tenenbaum, Margot Margolis, Michelle Varian, and Lee Bank. First speaker will be Laura Tenenbaum, followed by Margot Margolis. Time. My name is Laura Tenenbaum. I speak on behalf of myself and our artists JLWQA co-op, which has a 50 year commitment in the Soho community. We urge you to reject the proposed rezoning in its entirety because of its fundamental and unfixable flaws. City planning was asked by our council member and borough president to tweak things to make our community work, not bulldoze it and hand it over to overextended big real estate. This plan for a dystopian future was an ugly surprise for us, a slap in the face after months of community participation. Even worse is the message about democratic process and data gathering when it is being rammed through during a pandemic. Any rezoning's goal must include retaining Soho's vibrant, popular, active, inhabited arts community, not turning Soho into a cookie cutter commercial center with big box stores, clubs, and interactive retail entertainment venues as city planning gleefully anticipates. We urge that the needs of our Asian American neighbors, both residents and small businesses, such as those who predominate our block, be placed above those of the developers. And that a realistic path for legalization without a punitive arts fund be found for non-conforming residents. It was painful for us older residents to be labeled relics by DCP and none of us or our businesses important enough for DCP to quantify in its study of our community, to have them label part of Chinatown Soho East. The picture DCP paints for you is not the truth of our communities. I understand that the rush to get this done before the mayor's term ends makes it difficult to do this right but you should be presented with a state of the art plan for the future. And this plan is anything but. Unlike Soho, the plan needs a complete do-over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Margot Margolis will be followed by Michelle Varian. Time starts. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Wait, hello? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Margo Margolis, and I'm a certified artist. I'm, I'm speaking today to oppose this plan. I think it's an unworkable and disastrous plan. 
I moved to Soho in 1972. At that time, New York was in a recession and people were fleeing the city. It was the artist that created a grassroots community here, and it was Soho that firmly established New York as the preeminent cultural capital of the world. Um, you recognize the successes of the area that followed and the factors that have made Soho a global destination and a huge economic engine for the city. This could all be destroyed by the city's plan. So here are some of the problems. The city claims that this will create affordable housing, yet there's no guarantee of one unit of affordable housing that will be built. There are so many loopholes that will prevent this and favor instead the construction of commercial space, offices, dorms, and large big box stores, all oversized construction. The proposed increase in the size of the buildings will incentivize developers to demolish buildings and displace small businesses, low artists, local low-income tenants, and Asian Americans. There are 635 units of rent-regulated housing that could be lost. I'm afraid that I and other seniors who are aging in place will be forced to leave. And I wonder if the Department of Aging has been consulted in this plan. Furthermore, the city has not addressed the mechanism for conversion. It's near impossible to convert JLWQA to residential as the building codes are different and incompatible. Even where possible, conversions would take an exorbitant outlay of money per unit, plus a total evacuation of the building. The city lists as potential sites for development 29 landmark buildings in the Soho National Historic District to be demolished. It's heartbreaking. This plan is for erasing history, culture, and displacing them with a big oversized mall and luxury housing. Time. I'm for affordable housing, but not this way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Bell Varian will be followed by Lee Benke. Time starts. I go in two minutes. Oh, the Ruby Evan, thanks. Michelle Varian, Michelle, you're on mute. There you go. My name is Michelle Varian, and I am a 25 year residential tenant and small business owner here in Soho. I share a rent stabilized JLWQA loft with my artist certified hus husband, where we both live and work. We have heard nothing from HPD, who were incapable of helping us when we were horribly harassed by the most recent owners of our building. Our affordable loft created the opportunity for me to start my design and manufacturing business and eventually open a retail store in Soho. My store grew to showcase not only my own work, but that of over 100 other mostly local and locally manufactured design brands, a contributing economic driver for many other small businesses. It became an international destination, visited annually by business delegations from around the world, Germany, Brazil, Japan, even Beverly Hills Chamber of Commerce came to visit me. Businesses like mine were what they wanted to emulate in their own cities. Unfortunately, I was forced to move my shop and manufacturing out of Soho due to the increasingly burdensome high rent. I moved my shop to an area in Brooklyn with lower rents, and now my store, business, and the block I moved to are flourishing as the new it place to visit for cool retail. Because I now have the profits to reinvest in my employees and business versus owing every last cent of potential profit to my landlord, I can now consider scaling my business to additional locations. As a small business rep at the dozens of Soho NoHo advisory group meetings, I was, quote, in the room where many, many great ideas were put forth regarding the future of Soho by residents and small business owners, while commercial real estate reps contributed few new ideas or suggestions. What I am now aware of is that I was in the wrong room. Commercial and real estate power brokers were busy making lucrative backroom deals that did not reflect any of the hours and hours and hours of community input that the ULERT process requires. Unlike big real estate, we do not have the ears of elected officials. DCP has made clear their vision for the future of Soho. It does not include residents, affordable or otherwise. Many of you officials know this proposal will not create affordable housing. 
but a carefully crafted PR Thank campaign you, by real estate lobbyists Thank and you. gaslighting by DCP has made any opposition. Next uh, speaker, please. D. Benke will be the next and last speaker on this panel. Yes, I'm can starts. you hear me? You can, hear you. can you hear me? Okay, I am an artist and I've lived on Broadway since 1984, before there was retail. I'm not rich and I welcome the city's goal of affordable housing. Unfortunately, this is not the plan that will accomplish this. This proposal is a setup for failure for both residential and retail spaces due to the incompatibility of these historical structures to comply with the proposed requirements. These incompatibilities are not being discussed or considered as this process is rushed through. Residential conversion from joint work to UG2 for many of the buildings in the district will be impossible due to the structural issues that cannot be altered. This will leave many joint work units in limbo for years. Alexander Nemetov has provided testimony for this, which has been independently confirmed. My building is one of them. City planning has punted on this issue, an act of irresponsibility I find incomprehensible. The possibility exists that several hundred remaining families will be put into a state of housing uncertainty to allow a smaller fictional number of families to receive affordable housing that may never be built. This is the city's version of robbing Peter to pay Paul, disenfranchising one group to give an illusionary help to another group. It smacks of political opportunism, and is not worthy of a favorable consent from this council. The same exists, issue exists for upzone to retail. It will overwhelm the status of mixed usage and is physically impossible to achieve under the required landmark status of the buildings in our historic neighborhood. You are destroying a community with a yes for this plan. Thank you. For your testimony today. Uh, next speaker, please. That was the last speaker on this panel and seeing no members with questions for the panel chair with permission I'll call the next panel, which will include Samir Lavingia and Aaron Chilowich. Samir Lavingia. Time starts. Perfect. Uh, hi, my name is Samir Lavingia. I live a few blocks from the rezoning area. Uh, previously, I've lived in the community board that represents Soho, but I moved in March 2020. I just want to tell a brief story about how about my journey moving to New York and into my new residence. I want to highlight that people who are new to the city are just moving to the neighborhoods they can afford. When I moved to New York, uh, I looked where my work was and I wanted to live nearby. Uh, my work was in Chelsea, so I looked at Chelsea, West Village, Soho, and a few other neighborhoods. I did extensive research and looked at many, many units until I found something that would work for me. Fortunately, I was, I was uh, with my girlfriend and we both had relatively high paying jobs. So I was able to find a place in the West Village. But what if I wasn't? What if I worked in Chelsea, but I wasn't paid highly enough to live nearby? I would have looked at all those neighborhoods and realized I couldn't afford it. I would have then looked at areas in Williamsburg, Bushwick, et cetera, places convenient to the subway until I found something to afford. And simply put, that's how gentrification happens. New people will move into the city and we should welcome them with open arms because everyone has their own reasons to move, be it, um, LGBTQIA plus persecution uh, in other states, wanting to live in a walkable city where they don't have to own a car or literally anything else. And they will want to live in the neighborhoods, in the most desirable neighborhoods that they can afford to live in. And they are going to filter down until they can find something they can actually afford. It's not their fault. Like we blame gentrification on individuals, but it is not an individual choice. It is the city's fault for not producing enough housing in these highly desirable neighborhoods. This rezoning is an opportunity to alleviate this issue. That brings us to my move in March. My girlfriend and I split up and I could no longer afford to live in the West Village. So I was on the hunt again for something I could afford. We don't have a variety of housing at different income levels. So whatever, whenever a unit, uh, like family unit size changes, pick up or adding a kid or anything else, people are forced to move. That form of displacement is not talked about, but it is real. If we had more affordable income restricted and market pressure based housing, then people would be able to stay in neighborhoods when they have to move. Thank you for listening to my perspective. Aaron Chilowich. Aaron Chilowich will be the next speaker. Time starts. Hello, my name is Aaron Chilowich. I am a resident of Tribeca. Uh, I live just outside of the area that is under consideration today for rezoning. I have lived throughout Brooklyn. For, I have lived in Brooklyn for most of my time in, uh, in, as a New York City resident. And only recently did I move 
to so to Tribeca, where I'm currently living in an apartment purchased by my partner's family in the 1980s. My partner's family purchased this apartment for about $125,000, or in 2021 terms, about $340,000. There is nowhere in New York City where you can purchase a home for this amount today. This is not because the city is not subsidizing enough, though they're not subsidizing enough. This is, or the federal government is not subsidizing enough. This is because we are not building enough housing anywhere in New York City, and particularly not in areas such as Soho Noho that are wealthy and white and are beyond gentrified. People have said repeatedly throughout this hearing that none of the affordable ha- that that none of this affordable housing in this plan is guaranteed, with the exception of a tiny portion of developments that are provided direct capital subsidies. No affordable housing is guaranteed. Someone has to choose to build it, and I know this because I work in affordable housing. I hope you will give builders a chance to build in Soho Noho, and I hope you will use this as an opportunity to look beyond Soho Noho and and consider additional rezonings in other wealthy areas in Lower Manhattan. Thank you very much. That was the last speaker on this panel, Mr. Chair, and seeing no members with questions. With your permission, we will move on to the next panel, which will include Flavin Judd, Jane Fisher, Zeke Luger, and Justine Leguizamo. Flavin Judd will speak first, followed by Jane Fisher. Time starts. Hi, my name is Flavin Judd, and I grew up in Soho. Um, although I can't afford to live there um, and haven't been for a very long time. Um, I would love to have more families and, and diversity in the neighborhood because that's the Soho I grew up in. Um, it was an incredible, vibrant place. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, due to luxury apartments and shops, um, a, a lot of people had to move, a lot of small shops had to move, and it's become basically a shopping mall. And unfortunately, um, uh, this plan will increase that, uh, that, that's, that trend. Um, it's completely naive to think that any low-income housing will come out of this plan. The supporters of the plan say it will become a model, and they are right. It will become a model um, in its clear goal, and that is avoiding the building of low-income housing. Um, the many loopholes and mechanisms it proposes will mean that low-income housing will be almost impossible to build citywide in the future. They will have the model how to avoid that. Um, luxury apartments and retail are the goal of this entire plan. Hudson Yards uh, stole $1.2 billion in low-income housing investment funds to build luxury apartments. That is uh, the model uh, for the future as far as um, developers go. And that's what they want to do for the rest of the city. So I would hope that everybody votes no on this. Thank you very much. Jane Fisher will be followed by Zeke Luger. Time starts. Hello. I have been a resident of Soho for just under 40 years. My husband, excuse me, start the video. I tried to do that. To begin, I have been a resident of Soho for just under 40 years. My husband is a certified artist in residence in our small co-op, a building that was raw and rodent infested in 1979 and which he and others made habitable. We have lived there ever since, raising a family, contributing to our community and increasingly paying sky high real estate taxes. I am appalled by what the debt-ridden mayor is trying to pull off as he heads out the door, eyeing a run for governor. This so-called plan is a parting gift to his developer funders. Number one, this deeply flawed plan does not guarantee affordable housing its purported purpose. Do you hear that? It does not guarantee a single affordable unit. Number two, it will without doubt encourage demolition of historic buildings. Right now, 29 buildings within the world recognized Soho Cast Iron Historic District are targeted. And this irreversible destruction will come for what purpose? Not for affordable housing, but for extreme development, big box chain retail, and the encroachment of NYU. Number three, 
there has been zero resolution of the incompatibility of the JLWQA and residential building codes, meaning this plan will throw thousands of loft dwellers into a twilight zone of punitive taxes based on requirements that cannot be put into effect. Stop and figure this out. Number four, the city aims to hit early Soho settlers who built this neighborhood with a penalty tax on the fruits of their labor, bleeding the elderly artists to subsidize an undefined arts fund. How could anyone see this as fair or even legal? Do you plan this new sales tax throughout the city and New York State, Hudson Time. Valley, Long Island? Will commercial interest pay one? I ask you to kill this proposal and go back to the Thank table. You. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Next speaker, please. Next speaker will be Zeke Luger, followed by Justine Leguizamo. Time starts. Uh, hi, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, so DCP has had one main community partner for this rezoning, Open New York. Uh, almost all the pro rezoning testimonies today came from members of Open New York. So who are they? I first met Open New York last December. I was asked to help fight a rezoning in Flushing, a lively and unique neighborhood near my school, Queens College. Like many New York neighborhoods, much of Flushing is now demolished after rezonings allowed enormous gla uh, new glass condo and hotel towers, displacing thousands of longtime residents living in rent stabilized housing. I published an opinion piece criticizing the Flushing developers. Uh, just hours later, I was disturbed to find I had more than 60 comments calling me stupid, a liar, pro homelessness, a climate denier, and a NIMBY. Um, Soho activists I've talked to say they've been similarly bullied and gaslit. Uh, Open New York is a pro-developer, pro-displacement, alt-right astroturf organization created to cyber bully tenant advocates into silence across all neighborhoods of New York. Your paid leaders recruit young people on transit Twitter who feel climate change and bombard them with hyper-aggressive messaging, demonizing anyone who stands up to the developer agenda until they imitate this bullying. They self-describe as grassroots, but Open New York does not do street outreach in their targeted neighborhoods. Uh, however, they do have a project submission form on their homepage intended for submissions, uh, both from the general public as well as developers. Uh, quote, if you would like Open New York to consider advocating for a project you are involved with. Open New York is founded by a quantitative real estate investor who makes money betting on these resilience he's influencing and still directs their every move. In August, he tweeted, had drinks in NoHo tonight and I'm walking back downtown through Soho and fantasizing about how all this is gonna look like post-war Dresden come January. Uh, what's scary is that he's right. After all the demolitions, up zone neighborhoods like Flushing and downtown Brooklyn look like they've been bombed. Uh, Flushing streets are filled with people living there after their affordable houses, uh, homes were destroyed. Uh, what is DCP doing with these people? Is, that, is this what our city government has been doing, actively destroying people's homes for two decades now? Uh, Open New York is a highly inappropriate community partner and is an example of how DCP has been wildly irresponsible throughout this entire process. This plan will not create affordable housing, does nothing to bring justice to the unique New York neighborhoods. DCP so has displaced and destroyed. Please vote no on this district. Thank you. Time. Justine Leguizamo will be the next and last speaker on this panel. Time starts. Hi, uh, this is Justine Leguizamo. Okay. Um, my name is Justine Leguizamo and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. The city insists that developers will choose to build residential buildings with affordable units in the rezoning area rather than commercial ones without any claiming that the residential market is so much stronger than the office market in this area. But right next door to the rezoning area, Google just signed a deal on the largest office building purchase in the country, not only showing that the office market in this area is quite strong, but likely providing a catalyst for further office development in the area. And Google is not an outlier. As we've shown in documents submitted to the council in next door Hudson Square, the city grossly underestimated how much office development would take place there when they rezoned the area in 2013 and overestimated how much residential development would take place. And ironically, the city has included in this proposed rezoning a provision that would prevent existing commercial buildings from being converted to residential use and including affordable housing. All this illustrates that at best, the city is incompetent in their planning, but more likely is not operating in good faith in this process and has no true interest in affordable housing. Their interest is payback to developer friends and supporting the real estate industry, which has supported the mayor. Don't be complicit in this corrupt charade. Vote no on this sham plan. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, next speaker. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. 
I see no members with questions for this panel, so we'll call the next panel, and that will include Amanda Yagi, David Lawrence, Richard Moses, Ronnie Wolf, and Jean Standish. The first speaker will be Amanda Yagi, who will be followed by David Lawrence. I just want to make a very quick uh, announcement before that. Once again, um, we appreciate everyone's patience today. We, uh, we will get to everyone's testimony. If you are logged into this webinar, we simply ask for your patience. Please stand by uh, as your name is called. There is no reason um, for anyone to be using the raise hand button. Uh, and with that, Amanda Yagi to be followed by David Lawrence. Time starts now. My name is Amanda Yagi. I live in Harlem, and I'm here to speak against the Soho Navo Chinatown plan. No affordable housing in Soho is guaranteed in this plan. The mandatory inclusionary housing can be built as far as half a mile from the zone's limits. What this plan does guarantee is massive developer profits, notably for landlord Jonathan Chu and his family. This is a familiar scheme to New Yorkers, one that allowed the last president to become a self-proclaimed billionaire while the city's giveaways to local moguls, Steve Schwartzman and Stephen Roth, ensured he had the funds to run and win. Filtering is also familiar from the 80s, then called trickle-down economics. It works as well for housing as it did for the economy. A meaningful way to address the housing crisis would be to enact vacancy controls as well as rent control. Proponents of this plan for Open New York, including one who spoke today, have claimed that New York City suffers from segregation and that incentivizing white newcomers to move to black and brown neighborhoods, as in the East New York and East Harlem rezonings, is beneficial for longtime residents. The author of their Bible, The Color of Law, expressed enthusiasm when told of black residents leaving Oakland by the thousands, saying it was too bad that they were now concentrating in Vallejo. Rent law protections, of course, are available to those who can go to housing for it as evidenced by the struggles of tenants at 83 to 85 Bowery. Open New York members have alleged that historic districts are themselves tools of white supremacy, something the advocates for Mount Morris in Harlem and Stuyvesant Heights in Brooklyn, among many others, would be surprised to learn. The residents of rent stabilized and low rise buildings would be the first affected by the precedent set by this plan, unless you believe that development in New York is ruined by something other than profit margins. It is breathtakingly cynical to appropriate such social justice language to incentivize investment property construction. But after the city cut funding for every department but the police I'm last year, it's unsurprising. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. David Lawrence, is the next speaker. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes. You? Yes, hi, I'm David Lawrence. I'm a photographer. Um, I'm here today because I've spoken up over and over again, along with thousands of others who've all tried to be good citizens with good intentions, contribute, contributing to this process, and feel that it's only a dog and pony show so that our mayor can repay his developer friends who've bankrolled his campaigns. They pretend that it's all about affordable housing, but it's really all about forcing the artists out of Soho so the developers can turn it into a clone of Midtown and a bigger energy campus. Personally, I'm a legal certified artist. I've been in my law for 26 years. I've lived in Soho since 1982. And I'm now being asked to pay a tax of over $300,000 if I decide to sell my loft to my daughter. Meanwhile, illegal retail owners face zero tax, the conversion or any kind of conversion or legalization penalty. And in fact, they're told that the sky is the limit with this zoning to do whatever they want to do. How's that fair? City plan seems to think that all of the live workspaces will magically become residential, but many of those spaces will not meet the residential building codes because they are created out of industrial spaces. The goal is to leave artists with no options in limbo. So we move out and those spaces can be torn down or converted back to commercial use. Under this plan, in 20 years, there will be little or no affordable housing as others have stated. Our neighborhood will be richer, 
whiter and denser. Where is the new infrastructure to support all of these new people? DCP would like to double the population of Soho with this plan. So -called, the so-called arts fund is a slush fund to buy off the arts organizations so they will not flee our neighborhood after Walmart moves in next door to them. If this plan moves forward, you'll be killing the goose that laid the golden egg. Bye-bye art and artists eventually means bye-bye tourist dollars. Please reject this plan. Thank you for your time today. The next speaker will be Richard Moses to be followed by Ronnie Wolf. Time starts now. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Richard Moses, president of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, also known as LESPI. I'm here today to express LESPI's strong opposition to the mayor's proposed Soho NoHo neighborhood plan to upzone Soho and NoHo, which also includes portions of the East Village and Chinatown. If approved, this plan would allow buildings to be built up to two and a half times larger than what is currently permitted. It would promote out of scale luxury condominiums, destroy the character of these neighborhoods, and set a dangerous precedent, threatening neighborhoods throughout the city. Included in the Soho NoHo plan area are some of the city's most popular historic districts. The plan, as it now exists, would dramatically alter the scale within those districts. It would also allow for the proliferation of large chain big box stores, making it more difficult for small, independent, and family owned businesses to survive. While this upzoning plan is presented as a means to promote affordable housing, the specifics of the plan belie this claim. There are no provisions that guarantee inclusion for explicitly middle and low income residents. Actually, the plan threatens the area's existing lower income residents and promises to make the neighborhood less affordable, neighborly and hospitable than they are now. The charm and livability of New York City lie in its neighborhoods and their distinctive qualities. Those distinct charms are what draw prospective residents to live in New York and tourists to visit. Our historic districts and neighborhoods are not only characterized by beautiful, irreplaceable architecture, but typically with a low scale that allows for light and air, particularly important in these times of pandemic. We need a plan that would cre help create more affordable housing for the area while maintaining the neighborhood character that so many residents, businesses, and visitors cherish. I respectfully urge you to vote to defend the right. neighborhood and reject Soho NoHo neighborhood plan up zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Next speaker will be Ronnie Wolf, followed by Jean Standish. Time starts now. Ronnie Wolf, I need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. Hello, I'm a 42 year resident of Soho, a certified glass artist, a residential representative on the Soho Broadway Initiative and a small Broadway commercial owner. I speak on behalf of those I represent we oppose the DCP plan and Councilwoman Chin's bill. We oppose the plan as there doesn't exist a code that will enable co-ops to transition from manufacturing to residential seamlessly without raising taxes. DCP and DOB haven't resolved the how to convert JLWQA to use group two residential. Thus any mechanism short of being seamless and cost free imposes unintended burdens on the residential community. The envisioned Soho NoHo plan sought to make non-conforming residents legal and to create a pathway to legalizing buildings stuck in CFO limbo. DCP's plan does not have a clear path on how that can be done and has the potential to destroy more rent regulated homes than build affordable ones. The arts fund is insulting and despite DCP's claims, residents gain nothing from it. The bill's misguided intention is 40 years too late. But if the zoning had been enforced, the city would have lost out on collecting 
hundreds of millions of dollars in property taxes. Hmm. Terrorists, retailers, shoppers, and media companies are drawn to Soho because its residents preserve the historic facades of their buildings. And because only in Soho can you experience such storied architecture with low FAR. This diverse, culturally rich neighborhood developed organically, while DCP's plan is solely a financially dri driven developer's dream. Voting for as of right oversized retail is a vote against small businesses, the quality of life of its residents, and against what made Soho the go-to destination celebrated around the world. These are rational reasons why we oppose the plan. Please vote no. Uh, Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Our speaker will be Jean Standish. Time starts now. Hi, uh, my name is Jean Standish and I'm vice president of the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors. If the Soho NoHo upzoning is implemented, it would actually make these neighborhoods richer, less diverse and more expensive and likely destroy much of the affordable housing and push out long-time tenants and businesses, all the while allowing grossly out of scale new construction and big box chain stores. It provides multiple incentives and loopholes for developers to avoid building any affordable housing at all, but would enable and encourage huge commercial structures, luxury condo construction and hotels. Included in Soho and NoHo are some of the city's most popular historic districts. Consequently, the Soho NoHo upzoning would set a dangerous precedent for the destruction of historic districts all over the city. This plan calls for the first upzoning of an historic district in the 66 years of the Landmarks Preservation Commission's existence. Even if new developments are built, as the city predicts, with 70 to 75% luxury condos and 25 to 30% affordable housing. These developments will overall actually be more expensive and house wealthier and less diverse residents than the current neighborhood overall, making for a less equitable, less affordable neighborhood. I urge you to oppose the Soho NoHo upzoning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next speaker, please. <clears throat> and that was the last speaker on this panel. Uh, I see no members with questions for the panel, so we can. Uh, Call it the next panel. The next panel will include Anita Isola, Leslie Clark, Lucy Coteen, and Anita Jorgensen. First speaker will be Anita Isola, followed by Leslie Clark. Time starts now. Who do we have up? We are waiting for Anita Isola to be the first speaker on this panel. Anita, if you can hear us. Anita, if you can hear us, you need to accept the unmute request. Okay, we'll come back to Anita. I see her in the list. Uh, and go to Leslie I'm unmuted. Mark. Oh, I'm Thank sorry. You. It wasn't allowing me to unmute. Um, my name is Anita Jorgensen. Um, I live and work in the neighborhood. Um, I'm an, a lighting designer and um, I am 100% for affordable housing. I'm 100% for diversity ethnic as well as um, economic uh, diversity. However, this plan gives no guarantees of affordable housing as many people um, have stated. Um, it is a plain and simple giveaway by Mayor de Blasio uh, to his donors. Um, the plan in fact does not require any housing at all, let alone affordable. The community is starved for parks. Nowhere in the plan are parks mentioned. The neighborhood is starved for schools. 
Nowhere in the plan is that mentioned. This is a neighborhood with families. We need those um, amenities. Well, it's not really an amenity, it's a requirement. Um, oversides zoning will grossly uh, affect the character of the neighborhood. Uh, it'll push out small businesses. Um, an example would be McNally Jackson, um, who is continually struggling with her rent. One of the most um, admired uh, booksellers um, in the city. This upzoning will force all of the commercial retail rents to go way up, which will then spill over into the adjoining neighborhoods. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, next, please. Next speaker will be Leslie Clark to be followed by Lucy Cotin. Time starts. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Leslie Clark. I am a resident of Greenwich Village and I am here to testify this afternoon for my neighbors to the south and east because I fear that just as the destruction of Noho Soho Chinatown is designed to serve big real estate interests, the same will inevitably happen to those of us in the historic district of Greenwich Village. The Soho Noho Chinatown upzoning does not guarantee any additional affordable housing as it is now proposed, not one single unit. It would, however, inevitably result in the destruction of a historic district and the destruction of existing affordable housing by the one means that this does not protect against, which is demolition of buildings that contain rent stabilized housing. In fact, I fear that this plan is part of a larger real estate industry agenda to replace rent stabilized housing, which is in desperately short supply with luxury housing of which we have plenty throughout New York City. There is a pervasive understanding, misunderstanding of districts like Noho Soho as luxury districts. This is simply not true. There are rich people everywhere in New York City, but this area and even my area still contain many thousands of units of truly affordable rent stabilized apartments. This proposal does nothing to prevent the destruction of small buildings that content, contain rent stabilized units throughout this area and would therefore in the end, result in a decrease in affordable housing. I urge you to reject this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next speaker, please. Lucy Cotin, be followed by Anita Isola. Time starts. Uh, hello. Hi. Good, good afternoon. Almost good evening. Um, my name is Lucy Cotin. Could we stop the pretense that the rezoning has anything to do with equity? Every MIH inspired rezoning has been a catalyst for displacement and gentrification. As soon as the developers get a whiff of a rezoning, they swoop in and start buying up everything they can. Landlords with low income tenants, such as the artists and the rent control tenants, begin harassing the tenants as soon as the rezoning proposal is made public. They want to join the bandwagon of greed and destruction. There are many accounts of the harassment of low, tenant, low rent tenants. Stop talking about the 20 to 30% affordable units with incomes as high as $130,000, higher than many of the residents living in the area, and talk about the 70 to 80% market luxury housing that changed the Democrat, demographics of the area. Talk about the big box stores that replace the local store and take their profits out of the city to deliver them to their shareholders. If the city wants to build low income housing, they would find a way that does not give our, our tax base to big developers looking to make the next billion dollars on the back of those who pay all the taxes that make the city function. To consider the destruction of this amazing landmark area is shameful. Do you think that tourists come to, to see another 50 blocks of soulless glass, steel, and cement high rises? These beautiful buildings are the soul of the city that must be preserved. What are the real goals in this rezoning? One, dismantling landmarks. Two, 
opening up all of Chinatown to be gobbled up by the developers. They are the next area to be upzoned. There's so much detailed information that Village Preservation, along with others, have put together. They should be giving the presentations. This is one of the... Time. Developers and been charged with multiple ethic, ethics violations. Let's not forget that the rezoning it says give back to those many do, for those many donations. If you care about the city, Thank agree you. with the community so board and vote. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Next and last speaker on this panel will be Anita Isola. Time starts. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Anita Isola, and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. In spite of the efforts by the mayor and other proponents of this upzoning plan to portray it as motivated by social justice and equity, fair housing, let's be 100% clear about who the main beneficiaries would be. It's big real estate developers and big private institutions like NYU. Imagine you bought or own a piece of property in the rezoning area and suddenly you're, un, you're able to build two and a half times as large as the rules had allowed you previously. And that you can suddenly include highly profitable uses that were prohibited previously like luxury condos, big box uh, chain stores, NYU dorms or classrooms. Well, if you're Edison Properties, who owns the two largest development sites in Soho and NoHo, and you've made multiple large donations to the mayor and his disgraced campaign for One New York, your dream is about to come true, and a multi-million dollar windfall is coming your way if, your plan, if the plan is approved. Same if you're the union busting Chu family, which owns some of the other largest development sites in this area, and which has made campaign contributions to key decision makers in this process. This proposal isn't about benefiting New Yorkers or those in needs. It's clearly about benefiting the wealthy and the well-connected developers who've lobbied, donated, bought, and paid for it. Please say no to this plan. We can do better. Thank you. You need it. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Chair, sure, that was the last speaker on this panel, and I see no members with questions for the panel. So we'll call it the next panel. And that will include Lorna Nove, Jordi Mark, Peter von Meerhauser, and Connie Murray. First speaker to be Lorna Nove, followed by Jordi Mark. Time starts. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, I'm Lorna Nove, the interim executive director of the Historic Districts Council, which is the, the citywide advocate for New York City's neighborhoods. The proposed SoHo NoHo rezoning proposal has the potential to be profoundly damaging to the designated landmark properties of the historic districts that, in, that, are in, that it encompasses and to the practice of historic preservation throughout New York City. Landmark designation does not concern itself with use. Landmarking does not stop the development of housing, nor does it mandate the price of what that housing might cost. Some of the most densely populated areas in the city are landmark districts and have been for decades. To imply that landmark, that landmarking prevents the development of new housing and development is simply not correct. Look at Dumbo, Gansport, Tribeca, even Soho and NoHo. The population in these formerly commercial districts has increased after they were landmarked. Protecting historic districts does rely upon having the underlining zoning match up with the existing buildings. If the city increases the underlining zonings of these buildings, i.e. encouraging much more bulk than they currently have, it puts an enormous strain on the Landmarks Commission to keep the landmark building intact. 
If city planning says a 15 story building can be built where a seven story building currently stands, how can, how can Landmarks Commission say no? This baked in conflict strains the system and is unfair to both property owners and the agencies. This is not an unknown fact or new situation. Over the past 55 years, many historic districts have been rezoned after landmarking in order to bring the underlining zoning into better compliance with the LPC's regulatory standards. It is sound urban planning to do so. If adopted, the SOHO NOHO rezoning plan will be the first time the HDC is aware of where underlining zoning of a historic district is deliberately adjusted to be less aligned with the existing built environment. This disjunction pre-plans a conflict between city regulations and undermines the preservation process explicitly put forward by landmark designation. It sets a terrible and damning, damaging precedent. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Jordi Mark to be followed by Peter von Meerhauser. I'm Starch. Hello, I am a resident and a renter for over 40 years in a building across from a proposed M16 R10 rezoning. I've watched the neighborhood, neighboring streets change from an area of empty lofts revitalized by artists and galleries to a crowded tourist destination called Soho. I've watched neighborhood stores on my streets serving my community replaced with trendy, expensive specialty shops serving tourists. I've experienced increased traffic, noise, and crowds that came with zoning changes allowed hotels. Neighborhoods have value for different reasons. For me, the main value is for the neighbors, as the name itself suggests. With tourists crowding our sidewalks that have been narrowed by restaurant expansions, with narrow streets further stressed by bike lanes, rental bike parking, street closures, and inadequately controlled tunnel traffic, with more and more public space being taken over by private businesses, at least we still have light and sky. We are a low rise neighborhood. We are historically low rise with small retail businesses. The proposed zoning change will stress our community, not serve it. The zoning change for Soho NoHo only brings large retail, more people, more deliveries, more taxis, garbage, and noise. And the zoning change means less sky, less light, less unique neighborhood profile. Additionally, the lie of affordable housing is also a ploy to make overbuilding and neighborhood destruction acceptable. The truth is that with the proposed income parameters, many of us in my building would be considered too poor to qualify for so-called affordable housing. And dangling it before us in this plan is not any way toward the truth. This is not an affordable housing plan. Please stop overbuilding, stop the destruction of a unique and historic neighborhood. Respect and preserve the nature and character of these low rise neighborhoods. Say no, no to Soho NoHo zoning changes. Thank you. No to Time. Soho NoHo developer, it's a developer's Thank plan. You. It is not a plan. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Peter Von Meerhauser, who will be followed by Connie Murray. Time starts. Peter von Meerhauser, if you can hear me, you need to accept the unmute request. Peter, if you can hear us, uh, you can- I can you. hear you. Okay, great. We can hear you now. Okay. Are you ready? Okay, I am ready. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Peter von Meerhauser. I'm a uh, long time Oh, yes. Sorry. I'm a longtime resident of a Soho, and I've been listening to this Zoom since 1030 this morning. And one thing I have noticed is that all of the participants, both pro and con for this uh, measure, have expressed a desire for more affordable housing. I don't think that's the issue here. Everybody wants more affordable housing. The problem comes in, uh, comes with the fact that, whoa, there we are. 
um, <laughs> uh, how do we get there? And nearly every single one of the proponents of this measure has said that the commercial, I forget how it's worded, the uh, density, the commercial density allowed by this uh, plan in its current form is too high. But not one of them has said that they will push to get that reduced. They only talk about, um, you know, passing this plan uh, because it will be uh, provide affordable housing. Everybody wants affordable housing. This is not the way to do it. What is the rush here? Why can't they go back to the table? Why can't the council go back to the table and come up with a plan that suits both of these uh, factions here? Um, I say to those students at NYU who, you know, earlier on were, uh, you know, complaining about the fact that they couldn't live in this area, you are going to be sorely disappointed when this bill passes because you will not find the uh, rents uh, affordable. Um, Time. Thank you, Peter. Thank, thank you. you. Today. <laughs> Next speaker, please. Next and last. Next and last speaker on this panel. Let me go to the roof. Will be <laughs> Connie Murray. Connie Murray will be the next and last speaker. Time starts. Connie. Connie, if you can hear us, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to speak. Hi, sorry about that. It's okay. Whenever you're ready, Connie. My name, my name is Connie Murray. As a former resident of Soho and a native New Yorker, I oppose the city's proposed rezoning for Soho NoHo, because while the Department of City Planning cannot guarantee that even one unit of affordable housing will be created, it can guarantee that almost 200 historic buildings will be on the chopping block, displacing over 1,000 low-income residents and eliminating their already existing deeply affordable homes. I ask you as our elected city officials to find any logic in killing truly affordable housing only to replace it with scammy MIH unaffordable homes. As well, there is nothing green or sustainable about demolishing hundreds of buildings and turning Soho into a massive construction site. The only proponents of this proposal as demonstrated once again today on this call are the Yimby Zealots from Real Estate Development Lobbying Group, Open New York, the same group who have notoriously and deliberately slandered elderly area residents as being members of the Ku Klux Klan for having simply shown up to try and fight to be able to stay in their homes. Like the Department of City Planning, Open New York knows all too well that no affordable housing will be created by this rezoning, only deep tax abatements for the greedy real estate developers for whom they work. Say no to this gratuitous developer giveaway. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. I see no members with questions for this panel. So with the permission, we can go to the next panel uh, that will include Anna Markham, Pauline Augustine, Michelle W, and Darlene Lutz. First speaker will be Anna Markham to be followed by Pauline Augustine. Time starts. I'm waiting for the timer to start. Okay. You can, you can start. Okay. Hello, my name is Anna Markham and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. 
One of many pernicious elements of this plan is that it strongly incentivizes demolition of rent regulated affordable housing, permanently losing this precious resource in displacing residents who are overwhelmingly lower income and disproportionately artists, seniors, and Asian Americans. We've identified 650 units of housing in 108 buildings in the rezoning area. The city says there are 185 such buildings, meaning the number of units is probably near 1,000 or more. Um, with a little over 4,000 housing units in the rezoning area, that's one in four units and residents with a target on their back as a result of the rezoning. With a proposed increase of allowable density of 30 to 140 percent, virtually every rent regulated building will be underbuilt under the new zoning creating strong incentives for landlords to do whatever they can to get tenants out and demolish their buildings to build substantially larger. Um, landmarking won't prevent that, since the LPC routinely allows demolition of buildings behind their facades, which is all that's needed to permanently eliminate rent regulated units. Anti-harassment regulations won't prevent it either, as has been proven time and time again. And the strengthened rent laws of 2019 won't prevent it, as they left the demolition allowance entirely intact, though those changes virtually guarantee these units would remain affordable unless they are demolished. A vote for this plan is a vote for destroying affordable housing and displacing tenants. We urge you to vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker, please. Pauline Augustine, to be followed by Michelle W. Time starts. Pauline, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. All right, there we go. Hi, um, my name is Pauline Augustine and I live, um, um, I strongly urge the council to vote no on the disastrous Soho Noho Chinatown upzoning plan, first of all. I live in one of the tenement buildings in this richly historic district on Sullivan Street. I personally have a huge stake in this not going forward. I'm a low income 80 year old senior living in regulated housing. Owners of affordable housing in my neighborhood have been aggressively harassing and evicting those of us who are not artists and live in regulated housing for many, many years and who have developed and created this area. I have friends who have been displaced just recently and the building is up for demolition. The whole building is affordable housing. Aging in place, not here, if they, and if you vote yes, have a say. I have questions. Why should I have to leave my home of many years for new development? What about aging in place for persons who and all the people who live here? And there are many of us. Why do you think that this whole place is filled with only rich people? I'm upset hearing testimony from people who are not really aware who lives here. I'm not in approval of a plan that will not guarantee I can stay in my home. And where do you suggest I find a quote, uh, affordable, unquote, studio apartment anywhere in New York City today? It won't be in this neighborhood, according to this Soho Noho plan. Maybe the people in the forum are not aware that there are over 20,000 applicants per unit when truly affordable units are built in, as someone mentioned, outlaying areas of former devastation with little and public transportation. Not only can we age in place, not age in place of our choices, you're placing us in former brownfields and industrial areas. But the scarcity of truly affordable housing will not be in the least changed by what is being proposed in this plan. The use of verbiage regarding affordable housing as the end game of this plan is ingenuous, be kind with my words. I won't live long enough to get a chance to even apply for a unit anywhere, much less be awarded one. I I'm... also have to do affordable to whom and not for me. So I would like you to really, really vote no and think seriously about the humans who are in this area and who will be affected. Thank you so much for your Thank you for letting me testify. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker will be Michelle W., who will be followed by Darlene Lutz. Time starts. Michelle, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. There you go. 
I moved to Soho in 1976 into a crumbling apartment that I somewhat restored with my own hands. It still needs work, but I love it. Profit focused development plans like this one have been implemented over the detailed objections of local residents in neighborhood after neighborhood in our city. Not long ago in Inwood, after three public hearings like this one, not a single detail of the original plan was altered in response to public concerns. I urge the city council to seriously consider the harm to Soho, NoHo, and Chinatown this plan will cause. You need to take the extraordinary step of actually weighing the interests of the people affected against increasing the wealth of real estate speculators, no matter how generous they may have been to you. This plan's PR uses the hot button housing shortage issue to distract, but its cynical vagueness and integrated loopholes in fact do not guarantee any affordable housing. It's a ruse to further enrich the developers and their cronies through the construction of still more luxury housing and oversized office towers, further burdening our aging infrastructures and disregarding the changes in workspace habits that the pandemic has created. People of lesser means will be displaced Rent-stabilized housing will be lost, as will architectural treasures that give this area its unique and appealing character. To be sure, we do need to create affordable housing, but this is not the plan to do so. This plan also extracts profit for the realtors and the vaguely allocated so-called arts fund from the sweat equity of longtime Soho artists who made the neighborhood an international attraction while freely allowing commercial interest to transform our unique neighborhoods manufacturing spaces into yet more anywhere USA retail malls. And the nod to public spaces sounds nice if you're aware of the, if you aren't aware of the impossible volumes of traffic that will be redirected to an already choked Broom Street and why you agreed never to expand into Soho. But all it had to do was wait for the right scheme to break the promise. And for that, and for the right politicians to allow this expansion, don't do it. This Thank you, Michelle. So Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you so much. Uh, next speaker, please. The next and last speaker on this panel will be Darlene Lutz. Time starts. Thank you. Uh, my name is Darlene Lutz. I am a 40 year uh, resident of Soho in the Southwest Quadrant. Um, I have attended all of these meetings uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, it's been very stressful for uh, the residents here to feel that we have not been heard. And we haven't. I think the uh, Community Board 2 resolution uh, directly points to all of the reasons why this plan uh, should be voted down, sent back to the drawing board, and see if we can come up with that works for all. Um, I uh, happen to live across the street from a large lot that has been vacant for uh, the last 15, 16 years. It is owned by Trinity Church Wall Street. Uh, a development was scheduled to happen there for uh, the last 10 years uh, for an 800 unit uh, residential building with a pre-K through fifth grade school at the base. Uh, this was a result of a deal that the community came up with uh, in the Hudson Square rezoning. It remains to be a vacant lot, except for the party bar that's been operating there for the last four years. And uh, I would suggest that perhaps the community council would uh, start paying attention to some of the uh, properties such as this that could be uh, utilized and uh, developed right here and right now. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. That was the last speaker on this panel, Chair, and I see no members with questions. So I will announce the next panel. That will include Nikki McGee. 
Sante Scardillo, Joel Lobenthal, Julie Finch, and Susan Wittenberg. Sante Scardillo, uh, I would ask you to accept the uh, promotion request so that you can testify. First, we will hear from Mickey McGee and then Sante Scardillo. Time starts now. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. And thank you, Chair Moya and members of the City Council. It's a long day. Um, my name is Mickey McGee and I live in the South Village. It's a pocket neighborhood wedged between the Soho Cast Iron District and Hudson Square's massive tech and entertainment industry development projects. Um, the Soho NoHo rezoning targets the southern part of our neighborhood for massive upzoning with increases of FIR of up to 12 with no guarantees, none, as you have heard from so many people testifying, no guarantees of affordable housing. A large part of the housing in the South Village continues to be 19th century tenement buildings with conventional, conventional affordable housing. That is to say, rent stabilized housing that has no requirement for a low end on income. In other words, it is genuinely affordable. You do not need to make $64,000 a year to live in a rent stabilized unit. You can live in a rent stabilized unit with much lower income and many people do. Uh, our affordable housing is significantly threatened by this rezoning. We already have small buildings in our neighborhood being snapped up by international entrepreneurs um, and emptied of their rent regulated tenants. Please feel free to contact me to learn more about this. I'm not gonna go into it in detail in a public hearing. People who know this area know that the neighborhood group, South Village Neighbors, of which I am a founding member, has been here on the ground since 2013, supporting affordable housing efforts. We were here opposing the Sullivan Street development that Moses Gates mentioned earlier at a site that produced a 16-story luxury tower and four multi-million dollar brownstones with no affordable housing. We have been fighting for affordable housing. Earlier today, we heard the Department of City Planning staff members say that Soho Noho Chinatown rezoning uh, is putting the thumb on the scale for housing. If that were the case, wrap it up. We're gonna. Yeah, if that were the case, I would be speaking in favor of this plan. But far from tipping the scale for affordable housing, this will be devastating for the affordable housing that we already have. Thank Please you. vote thank no, you. and thank you for your time. Next speaker. Next, next speaker will be Sante Scardillo, followed by Joel Lobenthal. Time starts now. Sante Scardillo, if you can hear us, uh, we need you to accept the unmute request, which you can do on a phone by pressing star six. Okay, we'll come back to uh, Sante Scardillo and take Joel Lobenthal. Joel Lobenthal. Time starts now. Am I unmuted? Okay. Hello. Could you start me now, please? I just yep. unmuted. Uh, we, can you we hear can, me? We can hear you. Okay. I have been disheartened and disgusted to see one neighborhood after another in this city targeted by upzoning, resulting in overbuilt, financially inaccessible communities robbed of their unique character. I have watched the Soho NoHo Chinatown upzoning gambit play out for the last two years, watched as residents were lied to, watched as the city attempted to impose a top-down agenda that primarily benefits New York City developers and the international investment community. It is clear that what this latest of zoning means for Soho, NoHo, and Chinatown is an end game. It will disincentivize affordable housing through exemptions and loopholes. It will radically advance the mayor's longstanding attempt to curtail landmark preservation. This is an inflection point for New York City. If approved, the mayor's plan will be used as template for more and more district upzoning, up zoning, excuse me. I have lived in the West Village almost my entire adult life. I am horrified at the prospect of the West Village becoming the next victim 
of upzoning, I, I urge the council to reject this upzoning proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Julie Finch. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi, start my video. Okay. Um, so I was married to Donald Judd and we lived at the corner of Spring and Mercer Street from 69 until 76 when I left to get divorced. I brought up my two kids there and I was chair of Artists Against the Broom Street Expressway. I support Village Preservation's alternative plan as well as Cooper Squares and other peoples. My children, my son Flavin Judd has already spoken and my daughter Rainer Judd will also be speaking today. Why change a district distinct neighborhood? I agree with almost all of the previous speakers who asked you to vote no. I was also a member of community board too, and I am like totally stunned that they voted 36 to one. It's a phenomenal vote. And I am urging all of my council members, especially Corey Johnson to vote no. This is a sham. And the, the lie that they have used affordable housing and um, asking us to be in favor of diversity is, is very dirty politics. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Simone, next. Please. Susan Wittenberg who will be followed by Sante Scardo. Susan Wittenberg. Time starts now. Susan? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, oh wonderful. Okay, sorry, I, I um, was having a problem. Let me just get this here. I had a very difficult time signing in today. So um, thank you for letting me speak, even though it's so late in the day. As a longtime Soho resident and a certified artist, I'm against this plan because it eats away at the heart of the area and gives little in return to any group other than commercial property owners and developers. For them, it's an, it's an unexpected bonanza. Small residential buildings, home to rent regulated tenants will be torn down, replacing these lower income people with luxury towers and some mandatory inclusionary housing units at higher income bands. Big box stores and chain restaurants will proliferate squeezing out local oriented shops and restaurants, the few we have remaining. Even tourists may become less interested in coming here as it feels more generic. The plan is poorly thought out, filled with inaccurate and dated conceptions and goes against everything groups local and citywide have suggested. This area has been pressing for more affordable housing but lost every battle, battle to the developers. Find a way to meet the needs retain scale and the unique character of this area. This plan personifies greed. Don't add it to the list of other failed rezonings. Take more time. Don't be afraid to go back to the drawing board. As an artist, I know this is often ha how the best ideas happen. Make this a truly visionary plan and you will have the full support of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Sante Scardillo. Time starts now. Sante Scardillo, if you can hear us, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony, which you can do on a telephone by pressing star six. Sante, can you hear us? When we come back to him, uh, that was the uh, last of this panel to be called. We can uh, try to come back to Santos Scardillo in a future panel. Uh, I will now call the next panel, seeing no members with questions, which will include Madeline Gingold, David Rowe, Peter Field, Peter Feld, excuse me and Nina Roberts. 
First speaker will be Madeline Gingold, followed by David Rowe. Time starts now. Madeline Gingold, if you can hear me, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony, which you can do on a phone by pressing star six. So we'll come back to Madeline Gingold on this panel. Oh. Madeline Gingold, I saw that you had just unmuted it. I'm sorry. Madeline. Okay. Oh, there we go. Madeline, can you hear us? Madeline. Okay. All right, we'll come back to Madeline Gingold. David Rowe or David Rao, we'll hear from next to be followed by oh. Peter Feld. Time starts now. Hi, um, I'm Kathleen Rowe. I'm David Rowe's wife. Um, my husband, David Rowe, is an artist. I'm a graphic designer. We've lived in Soho since 1970. We've built out three lofts, the first two in rental buildings. The, third, the second one was a Helmsley Spears building and we were evicted because he had managed to sell out one of the units and we'd no longer fit under the loft law. So consequently, at that point, which was 25 years ago, I said, I'm not being evicted again. And we looked for a building we could buy into. Now, I'm listening to this and I have to say, so many people have been so eloquent. Richard Moses, Mickey McGee have spoken so well about the true issues that this um, proposal is not about affordable housing. It's not going to gain affordable housing, but it is going to put pressure on the large number of existing affordable housing in the neighborhood. It's really a question of far way overbuilt in this proposal. And it's about letting big real estate have their way. And I'm really a bit shocked by the council members and your position that if, if you can't see this, if you don't understand it, if you go along with this, because it really, I have to say, is a big problem. <laughs> um, for the people who founded this neighborhood, and we're, we're people who came here straight out of college. We believed in civil rights. We believed in equal opportunity. To pose this as something about affordable housing, and this is an elite neighborhood, all you're asking is to allow big real estate to add elite housing above our heads. And I really encourage you to listen to your conscience and your heart and vote against this. Thank you. Today. Next speaker, please. Peter Feld, who will be followed by Nina Roberts. Time starts now. My name is Peter Feld, uh, East Village renter. Uh, thank you, Chair Moya, and all for listening all day. And I want to appreciate my own council member, Carlina Rivera. I urge you to reject the outgoing mayor's pro developer plan as now drafted. Chris Marte was elected in opposition to this plan, and though it'll be weeks before he's in office, I would ask for consideration of the principle of representation. Uh, we need more truly affordable housing, but luxury developers and honestly, free market capitalism have nothing useful to offer our housing crisis. Half empty glass towers for a quote, new investor asset class that's been called quote, vertical safe deposit boxes will make things much worse. I support desegregating rich neighborhoods, as well as the environmental rationale for density. But we need to rethink density think, since things are never going back to how they were before COVID. The shift to remote work will steeply reduce demand for New York's uh, commercial real estate, much of which should be repurposed for deeply affordable housing. And if many folks are not going to be commuting to jobs anymore, it's less essential that we all live on top of each other. And before building, we must consider that within decades, all lower Manhattan will have to undergo manage, managed retreat due to climate change. Just imagine the 1818 building at 143 Spring, the oldest in Soho, that's on the Planning Commission's Opportunity Site hit list 
and which they obviously don't anticipate LPC will protect, demolished and replaced by a dark monstrous glass tower, adding no benefit for any but the super richest New Yorkers to afford. We do not need to darken our skies and trash our civic architectural and, cult and cultural heritage for private gain by creating thousands of deeply unaffordable units. It will not desegregate Soho Noho or house the unhoused. It will only enrich undeserving developers and investors and will create significant gentrification pressure, displacing tenants in adjacent working neighborhoods, Chinatown, Lower East Side and East Village as adding luxury housing and luxury retail always does. Affordable housing is essential, but, but please vote no and start over. Thank you kindly. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Tina Roberts, who will be followed by Zach Weinstein, who will be followed by Madeline Ginkle. Nina Roberts. Time starts now. Okay, hi, I'm Nina Roberts. Thanks everyone for staying and listening. Um, I'm just gonna try and squish everything into two minutes. Um, I've lived in the neighborhood just east of Soho since about 1991. I live on the edge of the rezoning area in a rent stabilized apartment, which I'm truly grateful for. I'm against the rezoning and I urge you to vote no. Over the 30 years I've lived in this neighborhood, I've watched it change radically. It's gone from a livable, affordable, diverse neighborhood with many independently owned shops, restaurants, cafes, diners, and galleries to a neighborhood that is only geared for the wealthy. I am not against development, but this scale, this like uh, square footage is so vast and it encompasses many different neighborhoods. Uh, with different issues, I think rezoning should be done at a much smaller scale. This massive scale is completely reckless, irresponsible, and benefits wealthy developers and those who can invest in high-end real estate. This has been a, a very stressful year because of the pandemic. Most residents have been focusing on just how to deal with living, not about the rezoning. Um, I'm just going to skip over some parts because uh, I want to get to the important bits. <laughs> Um, to use the argument that the rezoning will produce affordable housing is simply not true. There are no guarantees it will produce one unit of affordable housing. The rezoning is carte blanche for developers to build towers willy-nilly in this massive zone and sell luxury real estate to the wealthy. The one neighborhood that would be hit the hardest by development is the corner of Chinatown in the corner of the redevelopment zone. Um, I've done some research. It's really unbelievable what's happening in that little area of uh, Canal and Center Street. I'm all in favor of affordable housing, but 100% affordable housing under the current zoning laws that we have now and at the scale we have now. I am not in favor of a vague promise of perhaps affordable oh, housing um, as a percentage of a luxury tower. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Zach, Zach Weinstein, who will be followed by Madeline Gingold. Time starts now. Hello, is my microphone working? It's working. Great, thank you. Uh, Chair Moya and other council members, thank you for your patience in sitting through and listening through this marathon hearing. My name is Zach Weinstein. I'm co-chair of the Greenwich Village Community Task Force. There's a lot of talk earlier in this hearing about the need for a more just and more equitable city. God knows that's something that we need. And if this plan would do anything to contribute towards moving towards that goal, I would be jumping up and down in support of it. But let's get real. This is a plan that was spearheaded by that famously militant social justice organization, the Real Estate Board of New York. Um, this, is a real estate, this, is, this plan is a real estate developer's wet dream. Far from creating more affordable housing, this plan would enrich developers at the expense of residents and small businesses. This plan would reduce neighborhood diversity while encouraging the construction of giant commercial buildings, hotels, and luxury condos. I urge you to vote no on this developer-driven monstrosity. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. The next speaker will be Madeline Gingold. Madeline Gingold, if you can, thank you. Time starts now.
Madeline Gingold, I could see that you are unmuted. You are clear to begin your testimony. Okay, why don't we move to the speaker and then come back to her. Okay, we'll try again, Sante Scardillo. Sante Scardillo, if you can hear me, I need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony, which you can do by phone by pressing star six. Okay, we can come back to uh, both King Gold and Scardillo. Uh, we have completed this panel. Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. So it's okay with you. We will bring up the next panel. That will include Adam Brodheim, Daniel Cohen, Sam Zimmerman, and Kyle Danto. We'll begin with Adam Brodheim to be followed by Daniel Cohen. Time starts now. Adam Brodheim, we just. Thank you, city council members and staff for hearing from the community today. My name is Adam and I'm a historic preservationist studying at Columbia University. Soho is one of the most special and unique places in New York City. It has the best collection of cast iron buildings in the world. It is a tourist attraction that sees millions of visitors every year. It is an also an unbelievably expensive neighborhood that has zoning completely incompatible with its current uses. It is a regulatory nightmare to do business in. The area is significantly whiter and wealthier than the rest of the city. I love Soho dearly. I mean, where else in the world can you find cast iron buildings made to look like stone, buildings that are so well disguised it can take a magnet to tell what they truly are. But unlike some of the commenters today, I do not think this rezoning is a threat to Soho. The vast majority of the rezoning area is covered by the LPC, who will take the same critical eye they always do to make sure that this new development is fitting with the neighborhood. The only threat to Soho is to think that 200 years of development was somehow the perfect amount, that somehow we have found the precise and perfect moment to stop the clock and keep Soho preserved in amber forever. That in the midst of a historic housing crisis, this neighborhood filled statistically with whiter and wealthier residents should stagnate and not do its part to help. I'm a preservationist who believes that in New York, preservation and development work best together. I look forward to seeing a Soho with affordable housing and the diversity of residents that come with that. I know that this rezoning plan will make Soho a better reflection of the equitable world that we all seek to live in. I can't wait to walk through a Soho with new buildings that pay homage to the past while looking boldly into a more egalitarian future. To make sure that happens, I have two comments. We should lower the commercial densities to encourage residential development, and we should expand community preference beyond CB2 to target a more diverse set of New Yorkers. No part of New York City is ever finished. We are always on a path of creative destruction. It is what has made New York great and what will continue to drive our progress going forward. Thank you for your time and I urge you to approve this rezoning. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Daniel, Daniel Cohen to be followed by Sam Zimmerman. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, my name is Daniel Cohen. In the 1950s, my great uncle Arthur Cohn invested in Manhattan real estate. Particularly relevant to the Soho rezoning are buildings he invested in at 256 East 10th Street and 256 West 22nd Street, both of which are within walking distance of Soho. My family still receives rent money from these investments, and up until now, the zoning code has protected speculators like ourselves from competition, thus allowing us to charge extremely high rents to hardworking New Yorkers. Unlike most New Yorkers, we haven't had to contribute anything of value in order to profit off of this city, and we like it that way. In fact, most of my family doesn't even live in New York anymore. All thanks to New York City's wonderful zoning code, which has blocked new buildings from competing with us. However, if you were to legalize more housing in Soho, then in order to compete with the newer, fancier buildings that would go up, we might have to lower our rent slightly. Wouldn't that be terrible? I'm grateful that in the past, the city has sided with speculators like my great uncle Arthur by perpetuating bans on new housing. Please don't stop now. Please don't rezone Soho. Let us speculators make more money off of tenants by protecting us from competition. We want to continue charging as high rents as possible to hardworking New Yorkers and allowing more competition would go against that. Please vote no on the rezoning so that nearby older buildings like the one my family profits from at 256 East 10th Street will continue to command high rents. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Sam Zimmerman to be followed by Kyle Danto. 
Time starts now. Hi, this is Sam Zimmerman. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I live on East Broadway and I'm a resident of CD1 and I'm here to give my support to the SoHo rezoning. First, I just want to briefly comment on the format here. I know that this meeting started at 10 a.m. this morning and was scheduled to go to 7 p.m. tonight. The participants were not given numbers or any other indication of when they'd be able to testify. I myself was only able to testify because a friend has been watching the whole day and texted me when I was up. Uh, but even then, I'm only able to testify because I work a white collar professional services job in front of a computer and am able to take a few minutes to log on to Zoom and talk to you. This process excludes a huge percentage of city residents from participating and discourages many more who can testify but aren't willing to go through the hassle of this process. And this is important for issues like this rezoning because it means that you end up receiving a biased view presented by people with the time and motivation to stick it out. And overwhelmingly, those people are going to be opposed. And it isn't true just for this proposal. Uh, it'll be the same for any agenda item that you disproportionately get testimony from people who are opposed and supporters will be underrepresented. But on the merits of the rezoning, this is a good and necessary step for the city. The city desperately needs new housing. For decades, the city has built less housing than was needed to accommodate the new people who have moved here. And as a result, it's gotten more expensive. Uh, for a long time, we've pushed the burden of development out into neighborhoods like East New York, Williamsburg, Greenpoint, Long Island City. And the lack of new housing for new residents in central desirable neighborhoods like Soho has led people to settle in other neighborhoods like Crown Heights or Bed-Stuy, where longtime residents are being displaced and forcing those neighborhoods to bear the brunt of gentrification. Uh, it's long since time that wealthy, transit-rich neighborhoods with good jobs like Soho created their share of new housing. So this is why I support the Soho rezoning and implore you to approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Kyle Danto. Time starts now. Good, af uh, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I don't have much to add that I think hasn't been said by anyone else, uh, but I would just like to really reiterate that the present state of affairs in Soho, Noho, uh, and New York City at large is inequitable unaffordable and unsustainable. Uh, we need new affordable housing and market rate housing uh, and high, wealthy high opportunity neighborhoods like Soho and Noho, which I would note, as I have said before, uh, in previous meetings is 77% white compared to 32% with like the city as uh, for the city at large. Uh, medium, house medium household income in this neighborhood is uh, $140,000, which is more than twice the median of the city uh, wide uh, median. Uh, this rezoning, meanwhile, will provide uh, up to uh, 900 new affordable units in this area. And this is a really critical measure we need to do and need to implement in order to stem segregation in the city, which has reached crisis levels. Uh, I would, and I would note that there are those uh, who are saying things and we should reject calls uh, to, uh, for say 100% affordability or uh, unfunded mandates as a hollow diversionary tactic that everyone here I, tonight knows is financially impossible. I would, however, strongly encourage the city to incentivize more affordable housing in this plan uh, by lowering commercial densities and providing uh, community uh, access affordability. Uh, there are some people here who are is in effect opposing the Manhattanization of Manhattan. Uh, but I would encourage our council members and everyone here tonight to understand and to grasp this, the depth and the profundity of our housing crisis in New York. And I encourage you very strongly to vote yes on this important proposal. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Sure, that was the last speaker on this panel. And I see no members questions for this panel. So I will announce the next panel. That will include Rainer Judge, Judd, excuse me, Judith Stonehill, Raymond Klein, Jeffrey Pressler, and Michael McKee. We'll begin with Rainer Judd, to be followed by Judith Stonehill. Time starts now. Hi, thank you, Chairman Moya and members of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Rainer Judd, and I appreciate you taking the time to hear from residents and stakeholders from the community. I was born on the corner of Spring and Mercer, 
and I really love the buildings of Soho. And I know there are a lot of different issues at play, but um, having grown up there, I wanna speak out about the neighborhood that I grew up in and love. My play, play group was on Prince and Wooster. Um, I played in both the House and Street Playground and Thompson Street Vesuvio Playground. I clubbed at Danceteria <laughs> for the music theme in this conversation. And um, we bought bread from the community leader, Tony Dapolito. My parents, along with the immigrant families and greats like Jane Jacobs, fought the Lower Manhattan Brim Street Expressway. It is thanks to their hard work and foresight, as well as elected officials of that time, that the neighborhood did not get raised. I hope it doesn't get raised and demolished soon. Today, I'm president of Judd Foundation, and we are the artist foundation of the artist Donald Judd. We own a five-story cast iron building that was bought in 1968 and restored in 2010. We recast more than a thousand pieces of cast iron in the process. Um, not going to go through all my comments, but I want to recommend one of my favorite letters that I've read on this topic. Uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation last March wrote a very eloquent letter opposing this plan. And as members who need to think long and hard about this vote you're going to take, I would recommend the reading of that. And I would also um, consider very seriously what it means when the National Trust for Historic Preservation opposes a zoning plan. Uh, affordable housing in the neighborhood is possible without the requirement of new construction and new construction means destruction of the historic district. And I'll wrap it up there and um, say thank you again for a long day and thinking uh, hard and reading more before you vote. Thank you so much. Brandon, thank you for bringing me back to the days of Danceteria. Yeah, limelight area. Tunnel. Tell me about it. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for your testimony today. Uh, next speaker, please. Thank you. Judith Stonehill, who will be followed by Raymond Klein. Time starts now. Okay. Hello, I'm Judith Stonehill, a resident of Soho, and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. I strongly urge the City Council to vote no on the disastrous Soho NoHo Chinatown upzoning plan. It would fulfill none of the affordable housing promises as it would actually make it more profitable to build without affordable housing than with. It will create huge incentives for destroying the hundreds of existing units of rent regulated and loft law affordable housing in the neighborhood currently occupied by lower income residents and seniors and artists and Asian Americans. It will push out many small businesses with its allowance for big box retail of unlimited size. It will encourage grossly oversized development up to two and a half times the size allowed by current rules. It will encourage the destruction of historic buildings and allow developers to add luxury, build luxury apartments with no affordable housing by limiting the size uh, to 25,000 square feet per zoning lot. This proposal would make the neighborhood less diverse and more wealthy and even more expensive. The city has consistently not told the truth about the impact that rezoning would have and who would be hurt by it. It's the lower income tenant renters, the artists, the seniors, and the Chinatown residents who will be the most hurt. My neighbors and I support an alternative plan for real affordable housing without displacement or oversized development or big box chain stores. We need real affordable housing. I urge you to vote no on this plan. I'm expired. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Raymond Klein will be the next speaker, followed by Jeff Kressler, followed by Michael Murphy. Time starts now. Good afternoon, council members. I am Raymond Klein. I'm the president of the Village Reform Democrat Club. I deny the uh, Soho Noho plan. The proposed plan provides for many incentives for offices, retail, community facilities, and luxury housing 
What it does not provide is any guarantee for true affordable housing. The RDC has since it first came out. These, and we have done a lot of work with communities, people who have uh, limited affordability. These are tenants or loft tenants, Mitchell Lama tenants. Uh, and is playing or destroying the quality of life for existing income challenged residents and seniors. Great community work that plan does not represent uh, the facts as they truly are. Uh, the Soho the whole plan must be replaced with a new plan that creates truly affordable housing. The new plan not then be added to all the affected, including those adjacent to these to the Soho area, no area. Uh, and they must have uh, enough time to be able to uh, read this and not be rushed into making a decision like many people think the entire plan rushed to. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, you, you're breaking up a little bit, but uh, hopefully you submitted your testimony so that we can have a copy of that uh, as well. Uh, next speaker, please. Jeffrey Kressler who will be followed by Michael McKean. Time starts now. Good evening, my name is Jeffrey Kressler. I am the president of the City Club of New York. The City Club of New York is virulently opposed to the rezoning proposed. The plan upzones part of the area to the maximum allowable under New York state law, and the result will make billionaires row seem modest. Robert Moses famously remarked, when you're on the side of parks, you're on the side of the angels. In this scandalous moment, we must update this to, when you're on the side of affordable housing, you're on the side of the angels. Except this plan does not lead us to paradise, but to Hades. In reality, not one unit of affordable housing would have to be built under this plan. It is the work of devils, not angels. We must ask, if we are not actually building any housing that the man on the street would recognize as affordable, what actually is the purpose of this proposed rezoning? If the residents of this part of the city do not support the plan, then we must ask, for whose benefit is it being pushed forward? New Yorkers like the fine-grained character of these blocks. They do not want super talls with multi-million dollar units for offshore capital. They do not want big box retail to replace long established businesses owned by and employing New Yorkers. Who does want that? The most insidious part of this plan is that it will be the first upzoning of a historic district. Now those, built are built those blocks are built close to the zoning envelope. Under this plan, the sanctity of the historic district would be shattered. Again, who benefits from the erasure of protections for our historic districts? In sum, this plan is a lie and a fraud. The City Club of New York urges you to vote this ugly thing down. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Michael McKee will be the next and last speaker on this panel. Uh, time starts now. Michael McKee, we need you to thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chairman Moya, and thank you for sticking this out. And uh, I want to also compliment Council Members Chen and Rivera for sticking it out uh, for this very important issue. I know it's been a very long day. Um, I've submitted a written statement, which is much longer than what I'm going to be able to say in two minutes. Um, but um, the thing I want to concentrate on is the threat to the existing rental housing, the rent controlled, rent stabilized loft units uh, in the district, which we think are at least are a thousand. Um, we believe that this plan would open the floodgates to displacement through demolition. Uh, now demolition is something I know a lot about. Uh, I've been doing this work for 51 years. Uh, I have worked with, to my memory, uh, more than a half dozen groups of tenants facing demolition 
who were rent controlled and or rent stabilized. And I have to tell you that in every single one of those cases, the demolition actually was achieved and the tenants were evicted. Uh, the increase in FAR contained in this plan will be an irresistible uh, temptation to predatory speculators. And I encourage you to vote no. The city has poo-pooed this entire issue. Uh, I'm telling you from my own experience, the 2019 rent reforms will not protect people from eviction. The Landlords Preservation Commission will not. And while it would be good to have the a certificate of no harassment extended to Soho and NoHo, it's not going to be enough. Uh, this, this neighborhood needs updated rezoning. The, the current zoning is obviously obsolete and it needs affordable housing, but this plan is not the right plan. So I'm urging you to vote no. I don't see how you're gonna be able to fix this uh, between now and the end of the year when uh, some of you are gonna be gone and there's gonna be a brand new council. So I'm urging you to, lay this over and deal with this next year. Time expired. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, I just wanna make a, a quick announcement. Uh, if anyone would like to submit their testimony, uh, you can do so by emailing us at landusetestimony at uh, council.nyc.gov. That's uh, landusetestimony at council.nyc. Gov. Uh, and with that, um, Council, do we have uh, any other uh, speakers for this panel? No, Chair, that was the uh, last speaker of this panel. I see no members with questions for this panel, so I will announce the next panel, which will include Eddie Panta, Fred Donor, Yuki Ota, Stephen Wanta. First speaker will be Eddie Panta, followed by Fred Donor. Time starts. Who do we have, Arthur? I'm sorry, Chair. Uh, I think the next panel, I misspoke. The next panel will include Christabel Goff, Bo Riccobono, Catherine Paplin, and Jason Zakai. The first speaker will be Chris Belgoff to be followed by Bo Riccobono. Time starts. Sorry, Bo Rico Bono. Yes. Hello, am I sufficiently, I mean, uh, I'm assuming I'm uh, unmuted. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, allowing me to testify. I, you know, I just was able to watch most of the uh, hearing, so I'm not sure if this point was raised, but recently, just a couple of days ago, Cranes New York had a, uh, um, a very interesting article against the proposed rezoning of Soho. And to me, you know, it's just, it's just a no brainer. You know, one of, one of the jewels of, of New York City is Soho. One of the reasons so many tourists come to New York City is to go to Soho. The, as you all know, the, the, um, the, the uh, tourists have from, from Europe have recently, just two days ago, been allowed to return and, and they're coming back and they, believe me, they're heading to Soho. They, they would not head to the reimagined Soho that for some reason members of, of, of the city council uh, and city planning think is uh, necessary. 
the it, Soho is an iconic neighborhood. It is unique. It is seen in in movies and pictures all over the world. It's it's. I understand the need to have affordable housing. I don't think this plan does address that issue. I think there are areas of the city uh, in the, in the financial district and Midtown that could easily be converted to much more residential and would be very helpful for many uh, for many reasons to have that kind of economic development there. Soho works the way it does and the way it is con currently con uh, configured and zoned and to destroy that would be foolish and it's it's it, to quote the 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 articles um the article in Cranes, you know, you would be the city would be cutting off its nose to spite its face. It makes a, a, absolutely no sense uh, to to go forward with this plan. And I do think efforts should be made to increase affordable housing in other areas of Manhattan, even adjacent areas of Manhattan, but uh, not Soho, because you really it's it's it just makes makes no sense. And I urge the commissioners to actually think about this and, time and uh, vote the plan down. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Will. Next speaker. Speaker will be Catherine Paplin, followed by Hetty Hanta. Time starts. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> thanks to the City Council for allowing me to give testimony on the rezoning plan. My name is Catherine Paplin. I'm testifying as a New York City native and resident, as a registered architect, and as co-chair of the Historic Buildings Committee in the American Institute of Architects, New York. I urge rejection of the plan in its current form. Promoting affordable residence is a public good that ought to be supported everywhere in the city. Encouraging high-rise construction in and around historic districts, however, will destroy already existing affordable housing for the remaining low moderate income residents in Chinatown and Soho, NoHo, with no guarantee of providing more of the, for the many in need. A diverse economy and people can be injected into an area like gasoline and a car engine. Any serious intent to support a diverse and equitable neighborhood requires a holistic approach where many layers of infrastructure and services are woven into the fabric of the city and community. This plan will set a long precedent for future rezoning efforts in the city's historic centers. Historic districts are steeply undervalued by both city government and the real estate industry. Not only as the foundation of New York City's individual character and sense of place, but also as an overwhelming generator of tourist and commercial revenue. Further, we now see that our existing buildings have an enormous embodied carbon value, saving and reusing buildings may be our greatest immediate tool for slowing and reversing climate change. City planning should partner with the local community and landmarks commission to evaluate the impact of rezoning on all landmark historic districts throughout the city. The zoning block method that has been used for decades is a blunt instrument whose main intent is to maximize short-term profit and, who, and, the essential, and whose essential method is divisive segregating the city into zones. We should do the opposite and create an integrative, nuanced and fine-grained approach to city planning, one that takes these districts full value and potential into account, as well as the human value inside them. Thank you I'm... very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Next, we'll hear from Jason Zakai to be followed by Christabel Goff. Jason Zakai. Time starts. Jason Zakai, we need you to accept the unmute room. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Zakai. I am an attorney from the law firm Hiller PC, which specializes in land use preservation and zoning law in New York. We represent individual residents of Soho and NoHo, Broadway Residents Coalition. I am speaking today to voice our client's strong opposition to the misguided Soho NoHo neighborhood upzoning plan. As an initial matter, the plan should be rejected on procedural grounds because it did not apply, comply with the Euler process under the city charter. Specifically, the Department of City Planning failed to provide both Community Board 2 and the general public with a requisite pre-certification notice as required by the recently adopted city charter amendments. As a result, the entire Euler process has been tainted 
with illegality from the start. And we brought a lawsuit to address this problem. And we still have a motion on this issue that is pending in the court. The upzoning plan should also be rejected on its merits because it is simply a bad proposal for multiple reasons. For example, the plan will not bring affordable housing to the area despite being marketed to the contrary. Do not be fooled by the false promises. On most of the development sites, the plan does not require affordable housing, but instead allows for luxury condos or office, hotel, and commercial retail space. The plan is also filled with loopholes, which can be easily used to avoid building any affordable housing in the area. Although several community groups have put forth an alternative proposal, which would allow for affordable housing, it has been ignored and is not part of the upzoning plan before you today. On top of this, the plan would hurt small business in the area. It would legalize destination big box retail stores and displace the small independent creative businesses and local shops. The plan would also displace different groups of people who live in these neighborhoods, such as artists who have been living and working there for decades, imposing a punitive flip tax upon them, which will push them out of the area. The plan also fails to protect the many designated landmarks in the area and would encourage the demolition of many historic buildings. It is telling that the LP, finishing up the LPC has not been present on any of the public hearings. For these reasons and many others discussed today, we urge the council to vote no on the Soho No Hood Neighborhood Plan. Thank, Thank you. you. Your testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> Next speaker, please. Christabella Goff. Time starts. Christabel Goff, if you can hear me, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. Okay, seem to not be getting through to Christabel Goff. Um, that concludes uh, this panel, Mr. Chair. So okay. I don't see any members with questions. With your permission, I'll announce the next panel, which will include Fred Donor, Yuki Ota, Stephen Wanta, and Rob Kuchenbos. Fred Donor first to be followed by Yuki Ota. I'm starting. Hello, this is Fred Donor. I am a longtime resident of Soho and a board member of our five building co-op, which maintains an excellent balance between and respect for our residential and commercial co-op owners. In the late 50s, early 60s, a New York developer promised Mayor Wagner that he could prove Greenwich Village was a slump in order to qualify for 80% federal funding grant for, quote, urban renewal. He would have knocked down most of the historic residences and stores we now know as Greenwich Village today. The visionary, Jane Jacobs, sent a photographer to the city hall. He took a picture of the letter from the developer to the mayor making his promise. Jane then released the letter to the press and the plan died. There would be no Greenwich Village as we know it today if it weren't for Jane exposing this lie. I tell you this story because the current rezoning of Soho and Noho in Chinatown is also based on a huge lie. That lie has been well defined by many articulate speakers today. I'm not going to review the obvious problems. It is a land grab by the development community and is supported by organizations and individuals that are backed by large development money who have recruited many of the people who have joined us today. I'm sure that they are well-meaning, but you can notice the scripts they are given or that they write are very similar. I know because one of my close relatives received a call from a PR firm asking for this kind of support for developers in Soho. If you want council members to confirm this line, Vote for it. On the other hand, there's good news if you don't want to. This year, the Pritzker Prize in Architecture was given to an, a firm that excels in creating affordable housing out of existing office, industrial, and retail buildings. Send this plan back today and invite many architects who specialize in this practice 
to compete for this prize. Please Time. vote no. Please vote no and send this plan back for one based on truth. Thank you. Testimony today. Next speaker, please. It will be Yuki Ocha, who will be followed by Stephen Wanta. Time starts. Good evening. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. As a lifelong resident of Soho and founder of Soho Memory Project, a nonprofit organization that celebrates and preserves the history of Soho, I urge you to reject the Soho NoHo rezoning plan. Contrary to what developers and commercial property owners assert, Soho is still a neighborhood populated by working artists who contribute greatly to our city's cultural life. Tourists and businesses alike are drawn to Soho by its reputation as a creative hub and by its historic cast iron architecture. This plan will help push out longtime artist residents of Soho and NoHo, as well as arts groups and businesses. And it will encourage the demolition of historic buildings recognized as city, city, state, and national landmarks. Furthermore, this plan does not guarantee any affordable housing. The plan is opposed by leading citywide housing and tenant groups and city, state, and national preservation organizations. Over a dozen community and tenant groups have offered a community alternative rezoning plan, which would allow construction of true affordable housing without tenant displacement, out of scale development, and without big box chain stores forcing out local businesses. Approving the sweeping proposal would not only greatly impair our city, our community's quality of life while providing no community benefits, it would provide little if any affordable housing and it would, it would also destroy the qualities that draw people to Soho to the detriment of all stakeholders. I urge you to say yes to our communities by voting no on the Soho NoHo rezoning plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Stephen Wanta, who will be followed by Rob Hukenbos. Time starts. Good morning, good afternoon, and now good evening to Chairperson Moya and the rest of the subcommittee and the many people who have stuck with the hearing. I'm a Soho resident at 66 Crosby Street for almost 40 years, a board member of my 36 unit co-op and a practicing architect. I was married in this loft as a young man and has raised my family here. My older daughter went to elementary school at PS 124 Young Wing School and both daughters continued through the New York City public school system. I've been able to stay on the Zoom meeting because I and my staff work for my Soho loft. If there is a desire to build affordable housing, then the city needs to actually determine how to promote and build affordable housing instead of a plan riddled with loopholes that may result in none. The plan as it stands will result in luxury units where non-primary residents who have other homes park capital or result in bulky office buildings, or result in more unrestricted NYU dorm construction, or result in more hotels. This is what your yes vote will support, not affordable housing. That this plan has been proposed after effectively abandoning what had been indeed a robust stakeholder engagement is insulting to the many residents who here participated in the many envisioned meetings. Based on the proposed rezoning, the supporting stakeholders referred to by city planning appear to be over leveraged developers and commercial landlords that do not live in this neighborhood. Add to that an upzoning in a historic district is in itself a terrible precedent that should be the result of a not be the result of a plan railroaded through this process. Equally, if there is a desire to resolve the JLWQA issue, then spend the time with real stakeholders to create a plan that fully addresses this quite difficult issue. If you are indeed letting the community speak, we just have in the form of the new officials we have elected, in particular, Chris Marte. Please vote no on this proposal and work on this in the next term in a more considered way instead of ruining this iconic neighborhood just so the mayor has a nice parting gift to real estate interests. Time. Next speaker will be Rob Hukenbos, who will be followed by Christabel Roth. Time Rob starts. Hukenbos. My wife will take over here. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, Thanks for staying. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for staying. Thanks for staying on so long. 
Um, I want to thank our elected officials in particular for a lot of their wonderful testimony. Deborah Glick, Brad Holyman, Carolina Rivera, and also, I'm sorry, um, Christopher Marte. Pretty excited to have you with us. Um, I also want to thank a lot of the people's testimony. I'm really proud to be part of this whole group. Also advocating to vote no. Um, I've been, I've spent at least 30 hours on all the Envision meetings up until this point. I think this meeting is the best meeting yet. I think it's been run excellent. Really, it's just been an amazing meeting. Um, I think it's been worth listening. It's not because I have no time, it's because I care. And just my personal situation, I care about the whole neighborhood. I am someone who puts my best foot forward in life and politically for diversity, for equal rights, for, um, for underprivileged. Um, I think something we're talking about, which is um, affordable housing, I don't think anyone has really spelled out on this meeting what quote affordable housing is. I think it has a very different meaning in this day and age. And I also think that we should have really planned if we're so concerned about artists and the texture of this neighborhood. I personally live here 44 years, started on Crosby Street in 1977, have never left the neighborhood, had an office, have raised a family, have been in a rent controlled artist loft with my ex-husband and live in a purchased condominium with no CFO because we have no AIR status. And I think one complaint is that in this whole process, I think that the caveat of we who live in these AR, AIR buildings yet are not artists, are not addressed in these meetings. Thank Time. you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Next, we will try it again to hear from Christabel Goff. Christabel Goff will be the next speaker. Time starts. If you can hear us, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. We can see you, you just gotta unmute. There you go. Oh, good, hey. something was wrong, no. <laughs> sorry. Okay, we got you now. It's Christabel Goff, I'm speaking for the Society for the Architecture of the City. Some New Yorkers have a visceral dislike of history and the past, and they will unite behind an upzoning that creates financial incentives for destruction of old landmark architecture and calls for transformation of places that remind us of our history. Optimists imagine that the Soho Noho rezoning, which targets a st staggering number of local, state, and federal historic districts and individual landmarks will not be a problem because the landmarks are fully protected, but this is not true. State and federal designations are honorific. They provide tax benefits. They do not prevent demolition or alteration. Our local NYC landmarks law worked quite well for 50 years when government leaders still saw value in the checks and balances provided by the agency's regulatory policies. But our local landmarks law was born of compromise. It does not necessarily prevent the landmarks chair, a political appointee, from steering the commission to discretionary decisions that are in fact destructive of the landmarks law's original objectives. As a longtime monitor of that commission, it is my observation that the agency is slipping away from its original mission. Instead, it is leaning towards facilitating real estate development without adequate consideration, in the words of the law, of the irreplaceable loss to the people of the city of the aesthetic, cultural, and historic values represented by landmarks. Now, with this rezoning, landmarks and historic districts that people believed would be protected treasures of the city forever are in danger. Time. Testimony, next speaker, please. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. I see no members with questions for this panel, so we'll announce the be next before panel. You, before you announce the next panel, um, I just want to... <laughs> 
turn it over to uh, Council Member Chin uh, to take over um, for the remaining part of the hearing. Uh, thank you, Council Member uh, Rivera, and thank you, Council Member Chin, um, for stepping in here. Uh, I have to step away for the, for the moment, and uh, we will continue on with the hearing. Thank you so much. The next panel will include Robert Piatowski, Billy, <laughs> Billy Cohen, Sherida Pawson, and Michael Henry Adams. Robert Piatkowski will speak first, followed by Billy Cohen. Time starts now. Hi, uh, my name is Rob Piatkowski. I am an urban planner and designer, a lover of New York City, who happens to not be able to support live in Manhattan. Um, the city's historic districts, including Soho Noho, are some of the most beautiful and desirable places to live in New York City, and also some of the most expensive. As someone who has devoted themselves to the study of cities, worked with dozens and dozens of communities across the country, and believes New York City to be one of the best cities in the world, I encourage you to vote against this rezoning unless the historic protections are enhanced and the provision of affordable housing strengthened. Uh, the zoning is spearheaded by the administration and pro-development groups uh, that advocate that neighborhoods and communities should not have a say in their own evolution. And it presents a false dichotomy between demolition and redevelopment of historic neighborhoods uh, versus uh, providing affordable housing, but there's a huge middle ground to work with. Uh, Vienna, Austria is an example of an inclusive city and consistently ranks as one of the most livable cities on earth. You do not find them demolishing their historic buildings and city center. They recognize the importance of these places to the cultural, physical, and economic well-being of the city, and instead they invest in housing in these areas, purchasing historic buildings for public housing that is truly affordable and deeply affordable. They also create new neighborhoods of choice, not desirable, uh, new desirable places to live, um, not just ever taller in one location. Um, so the neighborhood has a population density that is really quite high, almost the same as Paris and almost double that of New York City's overall density. So to say that it doesn't provide housing is disingenuous. It still needs to provide additional housing, especially affordable housing, but this plan takes a blunt tool approach to something that should be more nuanced. And there's a lot of middle ground here and Mr. Piatkowski, you have been muted. Robert Piatkowski, we missed uh, the last few seconds of your testimony. You seem to have been inadvertently muted. All right, that's right. Um, I would like the city council and the planning uh, from the planning to uh, take the time to re-envision and re-look at this plan and come up with a better balance that adds truly affordable and deeply affordable housing while maintains and protects historic attributes of this place that's a uh, world-renowned district. Uh, thank you for your time this, this evening. Yeah, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker will be Billy Cohen to be followed by Sherida Paulson. Hi, can you hear me? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I just this is obviously another giveaway to the developers and a continuing agenda of displacement by the city under the guise of the affordable housing uh, washing language that the, the developers are using and um, and there's been so much testimony over the whole de Blasio administration and the city council is usually deaf to the community voices. I'm glad you're still here listening to us, but we've been through a lot in the last years. And it just seems like the community voices, the community boards have really had their power um, diminished greatly. Um, and this plan will definitely destroy the culture, the character, the creativity and devastate the community and the small businesses. The, the, the affordable housing has to come out of the hands of the developer. Right now they're in control of what they're calling affordable housing. If the city was serious about taking care of this problem and the homelessness, they would be comprehensive planning done with real city planners, not under the pocket of developers. And for example, Hudson Yards became a giant, perfect example. Here was a huge open space that would, could have been a most beautiful mixed community, shopping, small businesses. Instead, it's, a, it's homogenized the rest of the city, like just, um, you know, shopping malls, like a homogenized shopping mall for the wealthy. Where's the affordable housing in the beautiful open spaces of Hudson Yards? It's it's over and over and over throughout the city that you're just 
taking away the heart and soul and the character that makes New York what it is over and over and over. The developers have got to stop being in control of what happens in the city. And shame on the city for not helping the small businesses that are the heart and the backbone of New York City and one of the biggest employers. Nobody helped them after they got the riots came through the, the, um, in the summer and they were all boarded up and they got robbed. There was no help for them. There was no help for them during COVID. It's just like the cab drivers, like the, the heart and soul and the workers of New York are not being supported by the city. And it's just making life unbearable for everybody. And also to start I'm putting five by Oh, but green spaces are supposed to be in our community, air spaces. You can't put tall buildings. The infrastructure can't take it. Where, where are all these flushing? The sewer systems can't take all these toilets either. You're just covering everybody in poop. I'm sorry. Please, city council, please listen to us. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next speaker, please. Next speaker will be Sherida Paulson, who will be followed by Michael Henry Adams. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Sherida Paulson. I'm an architect, past president of the AIA New York chapter and former chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. I testify today, however, as a design professional working on individual landmarks and within historic districts with decades of experience dealing with the cumbersome approvals required in SOHO and NOHO to allow for retail and residential uses. That said, I am here today to speak in opposition to this proposed zoning text. The current zoning adopted many years ago has many, many flaws, but it achieved its goal of preserving these special buildings and allowing for adaptive reuse for residential and retail when the applicant did repair and restoration work. The community, the council members, and many elected officials spent much time and effort to reach common goals to allow for retail, commercial, and residential uses to coexist in a balanced manner, retain the special character of the historic districts, and provide reasonable flexibility for future adaptive reuse without requiring multiple lengthy reviews. This zoning proposal does not address these goals. It penalizes the residents and building owners who invested in this area by adding a flip tax, creates confusion regarding allowable development, but provides no regulatory relief to code requirements that can be onerous in doing conversions and additions to historic buildings, especially for residential use. I urge the council to reject the proposal as presented or address the multiple critical comments from elected appointed officials and many members of the public by reducing the FAR allowable, eliminating the flip tax, constraining the uses allowed below, above the second floor, and directing the Department of Buildings to analyze our current codes for possible conflicts and develop code modifications that can address adaptive reuse in these neighborhoods. Again, I urge you it's to hard. reject. Thank you. Thank you for your ah. testimony. Next speaker. Next speaker will be Michael Henry Adams. <laughs> Time starts now. Michael Henry Adams, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. Michael Henry Adams. Yes, hello? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great, I'm so sorry. Our beauty or heritage and history are only the purview of people who are rich or white. Does no one else have a right to live in a city as beautiful or historic or meaningful and livable as our forebearers? Landmarking is demonized by some as elitist. And in terms of current implementation, it is. Now it disproportionately protects rich white neighborhoods as opposed to communities of color. Yet, where landmarking exists in marginalized neighborhoods, it has been utilized as a tool both to preserve rent-regulated housing and also to increase such housing through application of the National Historic Preservation Investment Tax Credit. As to sustainability, how densely built a city is sustainable? Are we not? Um, 
more sensible to create housing units in the least dense areas of our city instead of those which are the most dense? In a nation where most of us are segregated by social class, a rezoning of this type incentivizing destruction of historic and rent regulated housing is no solution for inequality. Rent control is, and rent control is the only answer. And no one has mentioned that during all of the testimony. Franklin Roosevelt identified this in 1936 during the New Deal as the answer to the problems which people talk about of overcrowding and of a shortage of housing. That exists now worse than before, everyone says, and yet no one is going to the real answer, rent control. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Uh, Madam Chair, that was the last speaker for this panel. So if it's okay with you, seeing no members with questions, I'll announce the next panel. Yes. The next panel will include Margaret Baisley. Margaret Baisley. Time starts now. Margaret Baisley, if you can hear me. Yes, hi. Okay. My name is Margaret Baisley. I've advocated rezoning for over 20 years here, and I'm here to support the plan to rezone this historic district to make downstairs residential, upstairs residential occupancy legal and downstairs retail legal occupancy legal as well. What I don't support with respect to this program and this proposal is to charge residents a penalty of up to $100 a square foot to legalize their lofts. We are mindful of artists in our area who need our support. We're happy to provide it, but this tax is onerous, it's punitive, it doesn't serve the purpose for which it was intended and it really should be removed. Funding the arts is important. So is the preservation of our historic cast iron buildings. And the people of Soho and Noah are the ones who have done so. For the past 40 years, we're the ones who paid outrageous tax assessments here. We're the ones who pay the millions of dollars that it costs to fix these roofs, to preserve the facades, to redo the sidewalks, to keep these buildings beautiful so that New York City can keep collecting all the tax revenues it collects from retail, from tourists, from residents that Soho and NoHo generate. We have already paid $100 a square foot and we have already paid these taxes and these amounts, and it is uncalled for to make us pay it again. We think that the proposed legislation, the represent that was proposed by Margaret Chin, the penalties of $15,000 for a first offense for occupying a loft without joint live work order certification, and 25,000 for a second offense is even more galling you know that 99% of people who live here could never be certified as certified artists. And 99% of certified artists can never afford to keep these buildings maintained the way that we do. In light of this, we think that we should have a compromise. We are willing to trade an upzoning for increased construction for new housing, for inclusionary housing, to support artists, but paying for the right to live here when people have already lived here and already paid dearly to do so is just simply unacceptable. I came here in 1977. Many people who bought lofts here are older. Their lofts are really their nest eggs. Their retirement investments don't make seniors pay $250,000 for the privilege of living in their lofts that they've owned for 30 years or for the privilege of selling their lofts in retirement. Compromise on the upzoning. We're willing to see upzoning in return for benefits for all community members. Residents here don't wanna see 225 foot high new buildings on Broadway. So agree on new height restrictions that are a bit lower. Agree on bulk density requirements that are a little bit lessened. Compromise on these issues provide protections for tenants, but get rid of this $100 a square foot penalty tax. Give us a rezoning plan that makes sense and that meets the needs of all stakeholders here. Thank you very much. 
thank you for your testimony. And I hope that you will uh, support your, I mean, submit your recommendation and we'll definitely, you know, take a look and work on it. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, Madam Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. Um, and with your permission, then I will announce the next panel. That will include Susan Stoltz, Michelle Campo, Vincent Cow, and Todd Fine. First speaker will be Susan Stoltz to be followed by Michelle Campo. Time starts now. Okay, um, can you hear me? Oh, please. Let me hear you. Okay. Um, I, I'm, um, I, uh, today I just li listened to the plan and I've gone to almost all of the uh, public meetings and, uh, and all I thought in my head was chaos because I'm, I'm a, a law tenant. Uh, I moved here in 1949, an artist law tenant and um, a senior. And one, one of the things that came up at one of the meetings, I, I want an alert across the whole five boroughs about being a senior citizen and trying to fit under these laws that are completely open-ended and they're not defined. That's one thing you cannot have like this, uh, the, the law for um, paying this tax fee. And I don't know whether law tenants do, we already are up have been working on that for years, but at the same time, it's so chaotic. There's no definitions. And one of the things I don't want to do that I did for years was have to go uh, fight this over and over because right now my concentration and for many seniors, and I know those that are artists, I have all my, I have in the state of my spouse's work. I have all my work. I have two organizations. I worked in all the boroughs with children and young people in films. I have all this work that has to be dispersed and I cannot have my mind go focusing and everything have to do with legal issues because this is what's gonna, the, the mayor's plan right now is so open-ended. It just allows for all kinds of problems and harassment and things like that. I, I've been through this before. I had someone kick the door in on me and think this, this is, that was younger. And at this point, I need my focus on really getting the work out and getting this done while I I'm have this. But I want you to think about and reject it as is. It just doesn't work. It just causes chaos for seniors, which also in one, I just want to say one thing about that. They were told, even if someone, a family wanted to put uh, when an artist needed to go to a, a residence in a senior residence, they'd still have the family would have to pay the, the fee, whatever the hell it is. So this is important across the city, something that can be used. It's not great for senior citizens and for artists. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker will be Vincent Cow be followed by Todd Fine. Time starts now. Hello? It's Todd or Vincent? Todd, Todd Fine. Oh, okay. Yes, hi, my name is Todd Fine. I'm the president of the Washington Street Advocacy Group, which supports um, Affordable, uh, affordable housing and also pre historic preservation in the little Syria neighborhood of Lower Manhattan. And a, a lot of people say that people in Lower Manhattan don't support affordable housing or being selfish, but people in Lower Manhattan have been fighting desperately for the last year to maximize affordable housing at the five World Trade Center site, which was a Cuomo initiative that gave Larry Silverstein the ability to build a luxury tower on government land at the World Trade Center. The city, the mayor's office, 
has half the seats on the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation Board. It can work to maximize affordable housing. It can work with the city council. It can work with the federal government. It can work with all the state and local legislators who want this to happen, but it's not doing it. And it shows that the mayor's office in one move could get more affordable housing than this entire rezoning. And we need the city council to embrace this along with two Howard Street. Additionally, council member Moya made an extraordinary remark about how, and Carlina Rivera, where is the, the, the Landmarks Preservation Commission? I've gone to every meeting this entire year. We've never seen landmarks deal with an initiative, talk about an initiative that affects six historic districts, that had the environmental impact statement will says will have adverse impacts on dozens of national register monuments. It will build luxury penthouses, not just on the projected development sites, but on dozens and dozens, hundreds of, of historic buildings will be filled with luxury penthouses. It will be a nightmare for one of the jewels of the world and landmarks has done nothing and it cannot be, it cannot be assumed to protect this historic district under the political controls and the weakening and the corporate capture of landmarks. We need a strong LPC and we, can, we, we need their involvement to deal with this. Otherwise, this plan will destroy world heritage and be a nightmare for the world, essentially. Next speaker, please. Thank you for your the testimony, next, Todd. The next speaker will be Vincent Cow, to be followed by Michelle Campo. Vincent Cow. Time starts now. 大家好,我是Vincent 只是帮助一些地产开发商真的发出所有的声音这些地产开发商他们只是想着赚钱马上停止这个收红的虎的图改计划 do we have uh, Li Guang Wen? Are, are you available to provide a translation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me Thank now? You. Yes. Okay, I represent 80, 83, 85 and the local residents. Um, we consider that uh, the Soho uh, NoHo plan is actually help the um, realty developer to um, to earn money and it's a nightmare for the local residents, particularly for the low rent um, tenants. If the, this plan is carried on, then a lot of um, local tenants have to move out and the developer will bring them into a court issue. 
they are all low income tenants. How can they afford to um, to face this um, issue? So we urge council to stop this so hold no hold plan. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, Madam Chair, I believe that was the last. Oh, sorry, Michelle Campo. Do we have Michelle Campo? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you? You can hear me. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Good evening. I am Michelle. What? Hello. Okay, I'm just forging yeah, ahead go here. Ahead. Go ahead. I... Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. We hear you, Michelle. I am Michelle Campo. Okay. Thanks, Margaret. Vice President of uh, Bowery Alliance of Neighbors. I attended all the Envision Soho NoHo sessions, beginning with what I call the chaos in the cafeteria. I have seen many changes as a native New Yorker who has lived in my loft since 1971. But I must say that the current fast paced rush to rezone by a mayor, by a mayor about to leave office does not pass the smell test. Some decades ago, there was an attempt by by a since discredited public official, Robert Moses, to destroy Lower Manhattan and Washington Square Park for the misguided purpose of easing vehicular traffic flow. This ill-conceived attempt was thwarted by a coalition of community activists, including Jane Jacobs and a dear friend of many, the exalted, recently departed Doris Dether. Result of this community activism has been beneficial to many, including those who would have been summarily displaced. These plans have been historically conducted to, the current plans have been historically conducted to disrupt and tear apart lower income areas. Sorry, the first one is better. <laughs> These plans have been historically conducted to disrupt and tear apart lower income areas. This practice unfortunately continues across the country to this day. These current plans apparently now include destruction of cultural and architectural historic districts. I am 100% in favor of affordable housing. This plan does not provide any. This plan, which will lead to the ultimate destruction of Soho Noho Chinatown is another such ill-conceived plan. This is a false narrative pushed by developers for their own interests. It Time will expired. not increase affordable housing I missed a couple of minutes at the beginning. Can I continue? It will lead to displacement of many affordable housing units. This unfortunate plan is worthy of Robert Moses, that discredited public official of years past. The current New York mayor will join the list of those discredited individuals. I ask the council members to please reject this ultimately non-affordable housing plan. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Uh, Madam Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. Uh, we will, unless, there are, unless you have other questions, I see no members with questions, so we can announce the next panel. That will include Zishan Ning and Cynthia Chapin. Zishan Ning. Time uh, starts now. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, this is Jishen uh, speaking from uh, Chinese Staff and Workers Association, uh, which is a member of Chinatown Working Group. And uh, I'm here speaking uh, in opposition to the Soho Noho uh, rezoning. The Department of City Planning brushed off the criticism on the rezoning's impact on Chinatown, thinking the Chinese are so cheap that a vague promise of affordable housing can shut them up. This is an insult to the community fighting for years for the Chinatown Working Group rezoning plan, which will limit real estate speculation and create more truly affordable housing, and which was rejected by the same agency and the mayor. It is as if to say Chinatown will be displaced, but at least we could give so-called affordable housing to a few lucky ones in an area we don't even think of as part of Chinatown. So what it is, if not an intentional divide and destruction of Chinatown, Chinatown and the Lower East Side have fought against racism, not for equal suffering, that white people should be displaced like people of color, but for equal protection, like what the East Village had in 2008, 
so that everyone, Chinese, Black, White, and Latino, can live, work, and thrive in our communities. Mayor de Blasio wants to see us divided. He promotes racism in the name of racial equality. He promotes displacement in the name of creating so-called affordable housing. Our current council member of District 1 has been too happy to follow his lead. He has left a legacy of racism and displacement. We urge the city council to stop being the pawn for his shameful act. Vote no on the Soho NoHo rezoning and pass community plans like the Chinatown Working Group plan and the Soho NoHo neighborhood plan. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Next speaker will be Cynthia Chapin. Cynthia Chapin. Time starts now. Cynthia Chapin, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony, which you should be able to do on a phone by pressing star six. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. I wasn't planning on speaking. Uh, and I think everybody has already, I'm ag against the zoning plan and everyone else has you know, stated the reasons um, many times over that, you know, that I would um, give. But one thing that I think hasn't been pointed out is that I haven't heard anyone point out is that they're, they're, our streets are too narrow, our sidewalks are too narrow. There's no room for the amount of people that this, that this plan could potentially bring. And I remind you of when we had to um, shut down fashion night because, we, because, because of crowds and because people couldn't even drive in the streets. And I, I just can't see how you can have nightclubs and big theatrical venues and hotels and office buildings and more people on the subways. I just don't think that there's room for this. So that's all I wanted to say, thank you. And I'm sorry that I didn't prepare anything to say. No, thank you, Cynthia, for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Madam Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. And I am now on the very bottom of page 34 and we will Try to see if there are any last remaining witnesses. If there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the Soho NoHo neighborhood plan and related legislation, please press the raise hand button now. We will uh, at the meeting briefly stand at ease while we check for any additional members of the public who wish to testify. Uh, Chair Chin, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Uh, none who have not already testified. Okay, thank you. Uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-consider LU item for the Soho NoHo neighborhood plan on the ULERP number C210422, ZMM and N210423 CRM and related proposed legislation. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. I just wanted to thank everyone uh, who came to testify today. And we really appreciate uh, all the comments and, and recommendation. Is there someone else that hasn't been called? I just. No one who has not already testified. Sure. Oh, okay. Council Member Rivera, do you want to say something before I, I close the chair remarks? No? Okay. Well, 
I just wanted I just want to thank everyone at the council and everyone who participated for making this happen. And of course, the committee council, Arthur, especially, you've been amazing. And thank you, Council Member Chin, uh, for being someone great to work with and for being here the whole time. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you again to everyone who stayed for this long hearing. That concludes today's business. I will remind the viewing public that for anyone wishing to submit testimony for items that were heard today, please send it by email to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. And I once again thank the members of the public, uh, thanks my colleague on the subcommittee and uh, also the subcommittee council, land use and other council staff, and the sergeants at arms for participating in today's meeting. So this meeting is hereby adjourned.